to a'udhu billah. This is the big one. Fakhar and kibr. Kibrun, fakhar. Fakhar is, it's, it's pretty basic, boasting. Boasting is a disease of the heart. Now, fakhar is, is different from, fakhar is different from, say, mubaha or something like that, in that, Fakhar is generally understood here to be boasting about something that you have not earned. So it's when you boast about uh, nasab, like your that you know, oh, I'm a sharif, or my fathers, or my father. You know, one of the things that they did. I, it's so beautiful uh, on the Battle of Uhud. That, that's what the Arabs used to do. They'd shout out Ana ibn Fulan as a way, and the Prophet <laughs> would say, Ana ibn al-Awatik. <laughs> Which means, I'm the son of the, the, the women named Atika. And the Arabs didn't boast with their mothers. <laughs> so he, <laughs> it's like doing the opposite of, of, you know, what their intention is. I'm the son of so and so and I'm, and he said, Ana ibn al-Awatik. I'm the son of Atika, all those Atikas, because many of his grandparents were named Atika. Right? So, the, boasting about the parents, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahumma Salli Alaihi Boasting about uh, parents, uh, boasting about these things, uh, Wild Khudaym mentions uh, in there, he said, uh, that, yeah, he said, لَإِنْ فَخَرْتُ بِأَبَاءٍ ذُوِي شَرَفٍ لَقَدْ صَدَقْتَ وَلَكِنْ بِئْسَ مَا وَلَدُ If you boast about your parents or your ancestors that have honor, it's true, if it's true, like if they were Bani Hashim, that's, it's true what you're saying. But he said, but, it's, yeah, بِئْسَ مَا وَلَدُ It's, they left behind really lousy children, right? If, if, if you're boasting about your parents and you haven't done anything. And that's what the Arabs say, you know, لَيْسَ الْفَتَى مَنْ قَارَ كَانَ أَبِي إِنَّمَا الْفَتَى مَنْ قَارَ هَا أَنَا The man is not the one who says, my father was. It's the one who said, here I am. In other words, you do something. And uh, Jalal al-Din al-Rumi has a poem where he's mentioning all these great people that went before. And then he said, but don't be content with stories of those who went before you. Go out and create your own story. In other words, be one of those people that people after you, they'll talk about you. Right? And, and this is something that's part of our teaching. You know, the idea of, of really being significant people. You know, it's not wanting it for dunya, but it's, it's wanting to be uh, somebody who does something. Right? Isn't it part of the way they to sort of speak well of them? Sort of like no, absolutely. That, this is boasting. This is saying, my father did this. It's what little kids do. I, really, right? Little kids do this. Little kids say, my dad's a fireman. Well, my dad's a spaceman. You know? <laughs> and it's, it's this type of... Right? I mean, this, it's a childish thing to do. But to mention the parents, what, you know, Ahsani Yidaya, something like that, that's a different thing. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. This is boasting. I mean, we all recognize boasting. And, and now, here he says, the mountain, right? The, 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 the mountain of this, Pawdu Hashamikh, this high mountain, uh, he said, I mean, of course, Kibrun, its arrogance, right? Deem that mountain insignificant if you desire to sink it to the ground. So, uh, Kibrun, in Arabic, you have Kibr, Kibar, if it's Maftuah, it's old age. And kibrun, if it has a sukun over the ba, it's arrogance. And the root of it is kabura, or kabira, there's two, two roots. So kibrun is arrogance. And the root kabura is to, to grow, to be big, kabira, to grow old, right? And, and the idea is, kabir is to be great. Like the Arabs, kabirahum. You know, Ibrahim alayhi salam said, fa'aluhu kabirahum. You know, the, the great one did it. So kabir is great. Kibrun 
is to have something in your heart. When it manifests on the limbs, you call it tekabur. Tekabur. So kibrun and tekabur are really the same thing, only tekabur is the action. Tekabbara aliyya. He was arrogant towards me. In other words, he did something that showed me that. And there are many signs of kibr. There's a lot of signs of kibr. And I guarantee you, unfortunately, this is the... Of all these, I find this the most frightening one. Because, it, you know, you have some degree of it. All of us have some degree of it. And it just gets... It's a continuum. It can be really bad. It can be less. And you'll rarely meet somebody that doesn't have any. And when you do, you really feel it, right? When, when people don't have it. But everybody has... And, and the most frightening thing about this is the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبرن. No one will enter paradise. Oh, come on, No one will enter paradise who has even uh, like an uh, oh, the weight of an atom in his uh, in his heart of kibr, of arrogance. So arrogance actually prevents people from getting into paradise. And this is based also on the ayah, سَأَصْرِفُ عَنْ آيَاتِيَ الَّذِينَ يَتَكَبَّرُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ I will divert my signs from those who show arrogance in the earth without right. And بِغَيْرِ and الْحَقِّ indicates, the ulama say, that there are times when takabbur is actually the proper thing to do. And this was the idea of Abu Dujana when he was doing his tabakhtur. It was with a haq. He was doing it with a haq. Uh, and, and, and that's why in normal circumstances that would be detestable. But in that circumstance it was praiseworthy. So, now, uh, a couple of things. Mm-hmm. That Allah will divert His signs. Allah says, I will divert my signs from those who are arrogant in the earth without justification. They don't have a haq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, كَذَلِكَ يَطْبَعُ اللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ قَلْبِ مُتَكَبِّرٍ جَبَّارٍ Allah will seal the heart of every arrogant tyrant. He'll seal his heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبِّ الْمُسْتَكْبِرِينَ Allah doesn't love those who have istikbar. And istikbar is really the same as kibar, uh, only it has the idea of deeming oneself great. Yastakbiru. He thinks he's great. And, and it comes, the root of it is ujub, which he went through, of having this ujub. Mu'jab bi nafsihi. He's very impressed with himself. And another is the hadith in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to the hadith, uh, the Prophet sallallahu says, يَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى الْكِبْرِيَاءُ رِدَائِي وَالْعَظَمَةُ إِزَارِي فَمَنْ نَازَعَنِي فِيهِمَا قَصَمْتُهُ Kibriya, greatness, is my uh, izar, my uh, rida, my cloak. And alama is my uh, cloth for the lower part. And whoever tries to challenge me in one or the other, I'll break his back. So these are two attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left for himself. And he does not want people uh, to uh, claim these uh, attributes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just wondering, is it all right to name a child Akbar? Because I think that's only another... Yeah, you know, that's something in, uh, in the subcontinent. There are certain names that are given um, that are probably better not given. Um, Ibn al-Hajj said that shaitan got into this ummah two ways. He said with the eastern Muslims, he got in by giving them names of grandiosity. And he said with the western Muslims, he got in by causing them to, uh, to, 
to actually pronounce good names uh, improperly. So, for instance, in in uh, in some countries, they like in West uh, West Africa, Abdul Kabir, they call him Kabir, Kabir, or they'll call Abdul Qadir, they'll call him uh, Al Qadir, you know, something like that. And so, or like in Sudan, they say Abdul Qadir, right? Which is, I mean. <laughs> al Ghadir means the slave of the treacherous one. Right? Ghadir is from Ghadar. And Allah's name is Al-Qadir. Right? So, so it's, it's, that's one of the things that he said. Ibn al-Had said, Shaitan does that. Or he said, with the Eastern Arabs, you got me to name their children things like Fakhruddin, Shamsuddin, Jamaluddin. That's why Imam Yahya, the Nawawi, his name was Muhyiddin. His father named him Muhyiddin. He refused that name. And he demanded that he be called Yahya. He, he completely refused that name. So those names are pro, like Akbar, uh, you know, Azim, Azim, right, Uzma, those type names. <laughs> what? No, one of the, yeah, no, that's a name. The, the Easterners use that. If you name him after Salah, well, the problem is it's a Tazkiyah. The Prophet had a wife named uh, uh, Birra, and he, he named her Zainab. And he said, "Let us equal fusukum." He said, "Astaqul asma Harith wa Humam." Those are the truest names, Harith wa Humam, because all of you will yahrith. You know, he'll he'll uh, sow, and all of you have concern. So those are the truest names, and the best names are names that have Abdullah, Abdurrahman, or have uh, Ahmed and yeah. So, I mean, if your name is one of those names, I, you know, that's your name. That's what your parents gave you. So be that name. Right? I mean, I told somebody, we, you know, the problem is you have people like Asadullah and they're Mil'aqatuddin. <laughs> uh, spoon of the Deen. Right? Just eat all the time. <laughs> Now, this is amazing, and I need to confirm this uh, hadith. Because if it's true, Allahu Akbar. I mean, the transmission is true, but I just, it just amazed me. Uh, الصغار ثم يساقون إلى السجن في جهنم يقال له بولس. I just thought that was so amazing. It said that the people of it's in Tirmidhi. The people of arrogance are raised up on Yom Qiyamah and they're turned into atoms. And then everybody walks on them. Subhanallah. But, and then it said that after that they're taken to a prison in Jahannam called Bolas. And it sounds like bolis, you know, the, the Arab, they say, khudu ilal bolis, you know. That's what they say, right? Jabbarun, khudu ilal bolis. You know, and if there's a place in Jahannam, I have to find, make sure that's a correct, uh, I'm going to check in the term. If it is, that just amazes me. Hmm? Yeah, well, Azar is an ant, yeah. It can be an atom or an ant, yeah. Yeah. You've heard that with bolus? No, I know that hadith is mashhur, but this, this, I never heard that bolus. Huh? Yeah. Bolus, besin. Bolis, it's almost exact. That's what they say, bolis, huh? No, that's what I need to check. Yeah, I want to find out. It's in uh, Tirmidhi. It's not in there. Now, a couple of things uh, here just about istikbar. There are two types of istikbar. Alright? Istikbar, the worst takabur 
is takabur of a refusal to accept truth and worship Allah. That's the worst takabur. And then there's degrees under that. So the worst, a'zam al-takabur, imtina' qabul al-haq. Right? Wa'idha'an lil-ibadah. And to submit to ibadah. And that's why one of the sahaba came to the Prophet, radiallahu anhu, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, inni imra'un uhibbu al-jamal. Right? And he said, so I'm a man who loves beauty. And he said, uh, so I wear good shoes and I wear nice shirt. He said, ahadha min al-kibr. Is this from kibr? And the Prophet وسلم, said, la. Inna Allah jameerun yuhibbu al-jamal. Wa innama al-kibr batar al-haq wa ghamsu al-nas. In other words, he said, and this is an important hadith, because the man, first of all, he explained why he wore them. He said, I love beautiful things. The ulama say what that means is, if you wear something because you want to takabr ala nas, to show that you're better. And this is very famous, like in this culture, people try to outdo other people. I'm in this culture, right? Go to uh, some Muslim weddings, right? And where people are obsessed without doing the other. And then if one wedding is, everybody talks about it, then the next people that are getting it, we have to outdo, you know, uh, so-and-so, right? Uh, Abdullah and Khadija, we'll really show them what a wedding is. And this type of, that is, you know, that is, that's a type of kibr, because you're trying to, to takabr alayhim, right? That's what it is. And it comes from kibr, Right? So this idea of istikbar is that you, on the one hand, there's two faces of it. One face is that you want to do things, uh, you want to be great. And, and what uh, Imam Raghub Isbahani says, if it's for something that's great, in the time that it's appropriate, for the reasons that are appropriate, then it's a good thing. So istikbar is not a negative thing. And this is the idea again of turning these diseases into things that are beneficial. So a desire to be uh, great for the sake of Allah is a good thing. A desire to, uh, to do great things is a good thing. The Sahaba, their, their himma was high. You know, their himma was high. The Prophet ﷺ's himma was the highest... And he pulled them all up to... They, ha, they saw Thuraya, Pleiades, right? I mean, they were looking at the heights when they did things. And Allah made them great people. So that is a good praiseworthy. But the, the one which is blameworthy is that you uh, try to show people, yulhir min nafsihi annuhu afdaru min ghayrihi that he tries to show people that he's better than they are. And that is what is blameworthy. Unless you want to show the non-Muslims that Muslims are better. Because Allah commands us to do that. Allah commands us to do that. Allah commands us to show them. And in fact, you know, I was, somebody asked me about this last night. About the Christians. The Christian answer to the, the, the world's problem is very simple. And unfortunately... Uh, because of the Muslims' uh, capitulation, it, th- there, there's, a, there's a ring of truth to a lot of people in it. And that is, what they say that the reason people are the way they are is because they're incorrigible. They're corrupt from original sin. There's nothing you can do about it. They're horrible, and that's it. What Allah says is, show them that that's not true. كَذَلِكَ جَعَنَّكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا we made you a, a, a just people لِتَكُنُوا شُهَدَاء عَلَى النَّاسِ So that you can be witnesses to mankind that all their other ways are wrong. وَيَكُنَ الرَّسُولَ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا Now the thing about that is the Prophet شهيد علينا He showed us that it was true. And his Sahaba are شُهَدَاء علينا because they showed us that it was true. And the Tabi'een were شهداء علينا And each generation gets more and more watered down. And then in the end of it, there's no more shuhada. Right? Which is why so many people in the end of time become kuffar. Because they don't, they don't see truth anymore. So they lose it. And one of the signs of the end of time is that Allah 
will give the dunya to all of the kuffar and the Muslims will leave Islam because they want the, the dunya of the kuffar. That's a sign of the end of time according to Imam al-Biqa'i. He said that's the meaning of the eyes in Surah Al-Zukhraf that had a lawla ummatan wahida. Yeah, had it not been that Allah did not want everybody to be kuffar, then he says he would have made their houses from silver and he would have given them staircases that they could just go up on. Right? <laughs> now you look all their... It's amazing. You know, they have... That's what they have now. All their houses outwardly look amazing and people watch them on television in Mali and in Niger and, and they want to have those things. Right? All this stuff. So it's a real problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you penetrate that? Yes, because Allah says that even the heart, the the rock, can be penetrated and water can flow from it. So seals can be broken. And the way the ulama say that they're broken is by the path of the wadid. And so, in other words, uh, a prophet, can, by the pure strength of him, he can penetrate that... that, that uh, it's by the permission of Allah. But that ran that's over the heart can be penetrated. And what Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says is that people who have these seals over their heart, he said, if they hear the truth, depending on the source that it comes from, and how powerful the source is, depending on the strength of the truth itself, and depending on uh, the, the, the power with which it reaches the heart, it can penetrate the seal. And he said it can shake the heart up and cause a crack in the seal. But if something is not done in order to break it, in other words, toba, then it can seal back up again. And so they lose it. And this is what happens. Some people they'll go to a, a khutbah, for instance, and they'll and they'll something will happen to the heart, but then they go out and they go back to what they were doing, and it seals up again. So there's a closure. Now let me just quickly before we're done here. Uh, go over there are different types uh, of kibar and each one of them has qualities and characteristics now the first quality is that kibar is in the heart mustaqar it's fixed in the heart and the person sees that he's better than other people. That's how he considers himself better than other people. Now there's a hadith uh, in which a man was mentioned as being a good man in the presence of the Prophet and and then he came into the gathering and the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, karnahu lak. This is the man we mentioned to you. And the Prophet said, Inni arafi wajihi safatan min shaitan. I see in his face some traces of shaitan. And so he, the man said salam and sat down. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, "As'aruka billah, haddathatka nafsuka alaysa fil qawmi afdaru minka." I'm asking you by Allah. Did your nafs tell you when you came into this gathering that nobody in here is better than you? And he said yes. So they saw him outwardly that he was like really good, but the Prophet saw the kibra in his heart, and so he wanted to show the Sahaba that you have to be careful because kibra is very subtle. And there are many stories of uh, the ulama and fighting kibr. Because Imam al-Ghazali anhu says, of all people, people of, of, of ilm have more danger for kibr than anyone else. That, that is the biggest danger of people and students of knowledge as well. People who are studying knowledge, like ourselves. That's a major uh, danger of, uh, of studying knowledge, sacred knowledge. So... That, that now, if you fight it and force yourself, even though you see that, then what you're doing is you're preventing the bitter fruits of that from... The tree is there and it has roots. 
but you're preventing the fruits of that tree from emerging, right? And the next is where you begin to actually manifest it in your actions. So the first one, there's kibar, but he's, he's fighting it. The next one is you actually show it in your manifest, you manifest it to other people, and so you uh, look down on people, you turn your cheek away from them, uh, you, uh, like if he's a worshiper, he looks uh, down on other people that are doing worship, they frown in people's faces, that's a sign of kibbutz to frown in somebody's face, not to give the person the time of day. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ never did that. And it's one of the signs, Adi ibn Hatim said that he knew that he wasn't a king because the old woman came and she was talking to him and he just stopped on the street and started talking to her. You know, and, and, and that was how he, he did that. So, and then, so that, that one who becomes mutakabr because of his worship, the abid, and he's uh, showing off uh, that way, and yatakabr an nas because he has worship. The third is takabr because of hasab and nasab. Hasab is uh, your qualities that you have, and nasab is your lineage. And traditionally, they often went together. Uh, in Western culture, they have the idea of noblesse oblige, right? That if you're, uh, if you're somebody from the nobility, you're obliged to behave nobly. And, and that, that you find that in most traditional cultures. The Arabs definitely had that. If you were a Sharif of Nesab, like if you were from Pa'i clan, you had to be generous. Pa'i, you had to be generous. As a Pa'i, they had a reputation of being generous. If you were a Qurayshi, you had to uh, have dignity. You had to be Za'im. If you were uh, a Yemeni, right, you had to do this. So each one of them had their qualities and because of their nesab, they felt uh, necessary to do that. Now, because of hasab and nesab, people become arrogant. So somebody has good uh, lineage, they become arrogant and they see themselves as better than other people. So they say, like for Arabs, because they're Arab, they'll see themselves as better as an Indian. Very common. There's a lot of Arabs that think Mujarrad an Arabi. I had an Arab come to me once. He said, I never thought a non Arab could ever be a real Muslim. He told me that. He said that to me. He said, I never thought a non Arab could be a real Muslim. You're a uh, in Pakistan, the 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 Indians, right? Because they didn't make hijrah or whatever. I don't know. I mean, they see them as less, right? If you're from Hyderabad, right? I am a Hyderabadi, you know. And so I, that's, there are some Hyderabadis. They think because they're from Hyderabad, they're automatically better than the rest of the Indians just by being from Hyderabad, right? So this is like nesab and hasab and things like that. Americans, very common, we're number one. Because they're from America, they're number one. If you go into Hausa land, houses are convinced that they're a superior race. Right? Many Hausa people feel that they're better than, uh, certainly better than Yoruba and Igbo. And probably better than the Fulani. But the Fulani will see themselves as better than the Hausa. If you go to Mauritania, the Kunta will see themselves as better than the Masuma. Or, you know, if you're from Tejikanit, you're naturally better than... And this is a disease. It's a human disease, widespread affliction. The Damascans deem themselves better than the Halabis. Right? And a Shami. They even call Damascus Sham. They won't even let anybody else be a Shami. <laughs> right? So... This is a problem. This is a disease in the heart. Deeming yourself better simply because of some quality that you have. Like the quality of being from Damascus. Or the quality of being a Nejdi. Right? The Nejdis will deem themselves better than the Hijazis. Right? They call them Akhlaf al-Hujjaj. And often in their language you'll, you'll see all this type of uh, arrogance. Right? Um, 
In, in this culture, they have a lot of these type terms. A lot of racist terminology. But you'll find them in all cultures. You'll find them in all cultures. And these are all, this is takabbur. Because Allah says, Inna akramukum and Allah atqaakum. The best of you with Allah are the people of taqwa. And what this does is deludes you into thinking that somebody uh, doesn't have taqwa simply because he can't. How could he have taqwa? You know, he's a Hindi or he's a, uh, you know, he's a Nigiri or he's whatever. Mm-hmm. What about the people, I know the modern phenomenon, who have takabbur because they're from Ahlul Bayt? No, that's not a modern phenomenon. That's, that goes way back. Yeah, I mean, there's people who, who are sada and, and they have takabbur. They're human beings, you know. They're human beings. People who are from the family of the Prophet Wasallam. I mean, of all things to have takabbur for, that, that's a pretty good one. <laughs> I mean, I'd put that up there with... <laughs> in nasab, that's number one. Do you know what I mean? And that's the danger, because sometimes these things do have validity. And this is the danger of it. Right? In other words, there is something to be said about being from the family of the Prophet. It's a great honor. But there are many hadiths that caught, put fear in your heart. The Prophet ﷺ, there's a hadith that says his nasab benefit. But there's a hadith that says, uh, you know, nasab. If your actions hold you back, your, your nasab, your lineage won't speed you up. Right? In other words, if you have nesab, if you don't have action to go with it, it's not going to get you anywhere. No fuel. Good car, no gas. <laughs> right? So if you're a Sharif, it's a Mercedes, but the action is still gasoline. You're not going anywhere. Right? You have to, you, you have to put something in there. So that, that's a real serious one. And there are many hadiths warning us uh, about the danger of it. Now, how you cure yourself... One of the cures is to recognize, first of all, what are you from? And your source, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right, that you are from ma'in maheen, a vile fluid. Your source is a vile fluid. One of them said that, uh, that you, he, somebody, can yatakabburu, and one of the salaf, he said, subhanallah. يَحْمِلُ بَيْنَ جَنْبَيْهِ الْعَذِرَ You know, he's carrying between his two sides a bunch of feces. Right? I mean, in other words, where, why is, where's the takabbur? Where's the source of the takabbur? That he's just a bag of blood like everybody else. Right? And, you know, they have crude colloquials in this culture that I won't go into. But, I mean, people do have, in every culture, they recognize. Nobody likes takabbur. Right? The problem is the mutakabbir does not see his kabbur, takabbur. And he, that's why he hates even to somebody to be mutakabbir alayh. Which is why takabbur under mutakabbir ibadah. At takabbur fi wajhir mutakabbir ibadah. It's a hadith that to be arrogant with somebody who's arrogant is a type of ibadah. So, in, and this is what we call throwing it back in their face. You know, you, you give them a little taste of it. Just, and as a cure, it should be done as a doa, just to let them see how it feels. Mm-hmm. What if you're, um, let's say you've done a whole lot of righteous things and you feel that you're a righteous person, so therefore when you just get rewards for your righteousness, you feel you want to draw other people's attention to that so that they yeah. understand that. That's Kibron. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's a big problem. And, and this is what, if you, uh, if you feel you're a righteous person, that's kibar. Right away, off the bat. If you feel you're righteous, you're in a state of kibar. And that's why if you look at the early people, they were people who really, uh, one of the commands of Abu Hanifa, somebody was sitting with him and he... Uh, he moved his foot, and the man moved his foot away out of respect, out of deference. He said, why did you do that? He said, out of deference. He said, Limithli? You know, for, for somebody like me? And he said, Wallahi la ara ahad huna ashar minni. I don't see anybody in this gathering worse than me. And that's the way those people were. You know, the, it wasn't a joke. They really did see themselves as... Uh, and that's why, look at Sayyidina Ali. It's a sound hadith. 
Sayyidina Ali, a man asked him, Who, who's better, you or Abu Bakr? He said, Abu Bakr. He said, then, who, what about you and Umar? He said, Umar. And then he said, he, then he said I didn't want to say Uthman. Because I was worried he'd say Uthman, so I just said, what about you? He said, Ma ana idda rajul min al-Muslimin. I'm just a Muslim man. No, no claim, no maqam. And, that, and that's not, you can say that's humble. For us, it's humility looking at it. But for the imam, it's, he's not thinking, oh, it's, I better say in order for me to be humble. Right? No, seriously, that's a disease in itself. Ibn Atayla says, if you're aware of your humility, you're mutakabbir. And that's why right, Uriah Heep. You know that character? Dickens? He's an amazing character. In uh, David Copperfield. Right? David Copperfield? Uriah Heep. Oh, in my very humble opinion, sir. You know, he's always, he's a complete hypocrite. But he's always, in my humble opinion, sir. You know, and he's always doing this thing of being, you know, Uriah Heep. <laughs> I know I'm nothing in society, sir, but in my humble opinion, you know. And meanwhile, he's stealing all their money and he's doing all these, you know. So it's a character. Uh-huh. In other words, if you think that you're humble, <laughs> you're mutakabdir. Because you're looking at your humility from a place of height. <laughs> I mean, humility means to be low. So if you can see how low you are, you can only see it from some, <laughs> from some higher place. <laughs> It's the kabbal. We're diseased. We just have to deal. With <laughs> and this is why our scholars, Jazamullah Khair, and they said, you know, if you if you're not like the real people, at least pretend to be like them. <laughs> you know, seriously, because there's even some benefit in faking it, and even the imam says that that, you know, just. It's better to fake humility than, than to be an outright mutakabbir. And, and that's very clear. One of the things that Imam al-Ghazali radiallahu says is that if you want to learn how to master calligraphy, you go to the master calligrapher and you repeat what he does over and over again. And it's totally unnatural for you, but eventually you will become a master calligrapher. And it's interesting, my sister went to a brain... Uh, uh, this neurosurgeon in Stanford, and one of the things he said is that the brain learns by repetition. And those things that you do most consistently with repetition become completely embedded in the brain, like driving. He, what he said is that most people drive in a completely subconscious state. They're unaware of their driving. And this is the idea of being unaware of your humility that it's, it's just part of your nature. It's not something you're faking. If you're faking it, you're aware of it. Whereas when it's, it, when it's genuine, there's no, the brain is not conscious of it. So when you drive, because you've done it, when you first start out driving, the best drivers, right, are often people that haven't become good drivers because they're so nervous. These, you know, these poor people that learn with the thing on the top of the car, they're, they're like blinker and they're, they're looking around, they're really fearful. But then there's people driving down, listening to the singing and, and doing all this stuff, thinking about all these things, talking on the cellular phone, and they're the ones that get into the accident, right? Because it's become, the driving is completely, uh, they're doing it. Now, what this neurologist said, that the interesting thing about stroke people that lose uh, the, the, their brains and people that go into dementia, often they will retain things that they did most repetitiously. In other words, they can still drive, even though they forgot how to, to do everything else. Because the brain has... It was so repetition, the pathways are so fixed in, in the neuro, uh, neurology of the brain that they're still able to do that. And this is the idea of repetition. In the ilmu bit ta'allum. Ta'allum, you do it bit tikrar, over and over again. You have to force yourself to be humble. Until it really does become your nature. Because most people don't have these things naturally. We're diseased. If we weren't, we wouldn't be studying any of the things we're studying, right? 
Seriously, that's why we're studying this, because we all recognize it in ourselves. All of us. So, that, uh -huh, that's the... Uh, now, the, the, um, the fourth one is At-Tafakhur Bil-Jamal. Kibr because of beauty. And one of the cures for that is one, it's the old adage, beauty is only skin deep. Beauty is an illusion, right? Uh, first of all, you don't retain your beauty. Everybody loses it uh, ultimately. Second of all, Allah gave it to you. It's not something that you uh, earned or something like that. So being have mutakabbar because of beauty is a very superficial type of takabbar and it's really a stupidity. And the other thing uh, that I find really fascinating is there was a study done on beautiful people and what they found is that beautiful people were actually average. They did all these pictures and, and looked at them and found what people were identifying as beautiful and they found actually people in this culture Beauty is, is an average. It's a mean when it's all put together in one face. So it's an average nose, average eyes, average mouth, but they're all put together on the same face. I thought that was so amazing that beautiful people are average looking. Right? It's a, it's a mean. And that's the idea, you know, I mean, there's a truth to it, right? That, 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 that median, there's something a uh, great deal to be said for it. So it's, it's just a foolish type thing to do that. And there's a, a very frightening hadith about Aisha radiallahu anhu in which the, she, a, a woman came in and the Prophet sallallahu asked who it was and she indicated the short one. And the Prophet sallallahu said, اختبتها. That's backbiting. And the ulama say the reason is is because it was takabbur. Because in other words, had she not seen her height, you know, that she was taller than she was. And so there was a type of uh, takabbur there, which is actually quite uh, frightening, because uh, it, that's an i'jab, right? Mu'jab bi qamatiha or bi qawriha, right? And then she sees the other one. So, the Prophet sallallahu uh, rebuked her for that. The fifth one is kibr bin mad. And, and this happens with kings with all their storehouses and merchants with their commodities and also people who own a lot of land or people who own a lot of clothes and horses or cars now and they look down on poor people or even rich people that are less rich than them like Helmsley, that woman who said about taxes only the little people pay taxes and I read an interview uh, it was a really fascinating interview with one of these, uh, I can't remember even who it was, one of these famous, what they call beautiful people in this culture. And they were on a uh, helicopter going up on a ski place. And they were like, the, the, the place down below was a ski lodge for less wealthy people. And they were having a private helicopter taking them up the mountain. And... Uh, this woman said she looked down and, and somebody said at that point, oh, look at all the little people down there. And right at that point, the helicopter tipped over. And they actually crashed. And, but the point is, she got the message. I mean, I, that, some people wouldn't see that. You know, that be very careful about how you look at other people. Right? Because we're all little people. <laughs> Right, it's what, what the guy, the, the homeless on the street looks up at the CEO and the CEO is looking down saying, look at all the little people and, and the homeless guy's up there, look at that little guy up there. You know? <laughs> it's all perspective, right? It's all just perspective. So we're all little people and that's why the mutakabirun are turned into ants. Because right? they looked at everybody else like they were ants that could be crushed, Right? It's a very dangerous thing. And then another one is uh, the, um, the, uh, the quwa, uh, kibar bil quwa, or batsh, somebody who's very strong, like uh, uh, Rakana, the Musari. You know, he, when he told the Prophet, ﷺ, uh, wrestle me, the Prophet threw him twice. He still didn't become Muslim. 
Right? And then there's a rewire that he did, inshallah he did, I don't know. But the point is, is that, you know, he saw nobody could throw him. He said, I've never been thrown, ever, to kabbur. Right? So this idea of somebody who's strong, have muscles, and, and the amazing thing, they're going to get old, right? It all, you right? Then they can't do it. Now, the seventh one is, تَكَبُّرْ بِالْأَتْبَاعْ وَالْأَنْصَارْ وَالْتَلَامِذَا وَالْغِلْمَانْ and by having a lot, like uh, a teacher who has a lot of students. And so he sees himself as better than another teacher who has less students. So, um, somebody who has a lot of friends. Somebody who has a lot of powerful relatives, influential people, right? Somebody who's from the royal family. He's not the king, but he's from the royal family. Mutakabir because of uh, strength, but it has to do with more like that type of jah and things like that. Very dangerous one. Now, of all of these, uh, and then also to cover because of knowledge, which really is, that is the most, uh, according to the Imam, he says it's, it's, it's one of the most uh, insidious, because again, like being a Sharif, having knowledge is so honored. And having knowledge, the nature of knowledge, is that people uh, respect knowledge. People, many people are often in awe of knowledge. So when somebody does have knowledge, especially if it's a good deal of knowledge, then people will show them deference. And so it becomes dangerous for the heart because they'll start thinking, I'm somebody, you know, I'm important. And this, and this is what shaitan will do to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُتِلِ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَ مِنْ أَيِّ شَيْءٍ خَرَقَ How man has been killed. مَا أَكْفَرَهُ What is more uh, of an ingrate than man? And then Allah says, مِنْ أَيِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَ What did we create him from? You know, let man think about what we created him from. He came from a fluid. He didn't even exist before that fluid. He wasn't even a thing that anybody had on their tongue. Uh, 50, years from, uh, for, uh, you know, 50 years ago, you weren't even an idea in your parents' mind. Right? You were nothing, non-existent. And then you came into existence. And, 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 and when you first came into existence, you know, I mean, changing diapers... Seven, eight times a day. That's all they do. They just defecate, urinate, sleep, and cry every once in a while. Right? And, and suckle at the breast. That's it. It's unbelievable. Complete. That's human being. And then they grow up and get to a point where they have strength and they become arrogant. And then they're going to go because it's curvilinear. If you live long enough, you'll end up where you started. Right? You reach that 40-year point... And that's, you know, people think, right? I'm at the top, it's all, I'm, everything's going, right? And then Allah says, مِن نُطْفَةٍ خَلَقَهُ فَقَدَّرَ He created him from a nutfa, this emanating, this uh, fluid, ejaculated fluid that Allah made. فَقَدَّرَهُ Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He, and then He measured out everything for him. Man didn't do that for himself. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الْإِنسَانِ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ مِن نُطْفَةٍ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُّبِينٌ Hasn't man thought about it? We created him from a nutfa and now he's this manifest enemy of ours. Right? Allah... <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, Allah made the human being and then he goes into rebellion against Allah. And he's nothing. Right? I mean, Allah, all, Allah can stir up a little, it's a storm in a, what do they call it? A hurricane in a teacup. Hurricane Mitch. I mean, it's nothing. Nothing, it's just nothing. A little wind in, in uh, one part of the planet, in, in our solar system, in the midst of a universe. It's nothing. And yet, for those people that were hit by it, it's completely <coughs> devastated. All these people lose their houses, their wealth, everything gone from a wind that Allah sent. 
And Allah says that in the Quran when they see the wind, they say, Hada aridun mumtiruna. Oh, this is a good wind coming to give us some rain. And it's an adab. So human beings, you know, the point of all of this is we're just fools to be in rebellion against Allah. And Allah says, Adam naja'adahu aynayn wa disana wa shafatayn wa hadaynahu najdayn. We gave him a tongue, we gave him two eyes, we gave him this ability to think, all these things. And then we guided him and showed him two roads. And we told him, at the end of this road is a painful punishment. And at the end of this road is a reward. And you choose. And people choose to go down this other way. And it's takabbur. And you can look at the seerah. I guarantee you, you look at every single one of those people that refused to submit. It was all takabbur. It's very clear. The reason people can't submit is the kabbur. And if you look at the prayer, the amazing thing about the prayer, there is, and I mentioned this before, there's a type of slavishness in the prayer that some people find very offensive. And there are Western people that have a really hard time with the concept of being a slave of God. Abdullah. They have a real problem with that concept. Because they have this idea, I'm free. But then he's a slave to his, his private parts, his stomach. Right, his 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 uh, his petty goals in life. He's a slave to all these things. He can't control them. He's a complete slave to them. But a slave to Allah? No. I'll be a slave to my genitals, but I won't be a slave to Allah. I'll be a slave to my stomach, but I won't be a slave to Allah. So it's a completely delusional state that the human being goes into. And that's that's where it is. So he he's saying that the way to get rid of this uh, disease is first knowing your Lord and knowing yourself. Now obviously that is a big task. S- some of them say the only way you can know your Lord is to know yourself. In your own selves don't you see? So Allah tells us to reflect on ourselves. If you reflect on the self what you come to realize is that you're completely bound. You are Ab. And even Messiah, even Maryam, right? He was, not, he was not arrogant to say that he was uh, Abdullah. He accepted that he was Abdullah. Right? He accepted that. So even the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ said, أَنَا سَيْدُ وَلْدِ آدَمْ وَلَا فَخْرَى I am the best of the children of Adam and I'm not boasting. وَلَا فَخْرَى So that was not takabbur. The ulama say the reason he said that is he was making sure that the Sahaba did not understand from that that he was yatakabbar alayhim bi siyadatihi. Because that's what the jahadi Arabs used to do. Ana sayyidukum. They would like make takabbar. He was doing it because he was commanded by Allah to inform them of that. And that's why he said, wala fakhra. I'm not doing this out of fakhr. But the ulama take from that another ishara that not only was he not, there was no fakhr, but his fakhr was in his ubudiyah to Allah. It wasn't in his siyada of creation, that he was the master of creation. It was that he was the most perfect slave of Allah. That was where his honor and glory was. Right? Which is why there's a hadith, some people uh, uh, don't accept it, but Mullah Ali al-Qari said it, the meaning is true. Fakri fakhri. My impoverishment before Allah is my glory. Right? So, Knowing yourself, knowing that, and feeling uh, that those, that whoever knows those two is humbled and feels insignificant. يَتَوَاضَعْ وَيَهُونَ And مَنْ تَوَاضَعْ لِلَّهِ رَفَعْهُ Allah. Whoever is, is humbled for the sake of Allah, Allah raises him up. Allah will raise him up. مَنْ تَوَاضَعْ لِلَّهِ رَفَعْهُ Allah. Right? So... That idea of, of being low for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says also another thing. Maqamahu yanfi maqam shukri. That the station of kibar negates the possibility of showing gratitude to Allah. Because the way you show gratitude to Allah is through ubudiyah. And if you're mutakabbar, you're not an abd. Because the abd by his nature can't be mutakabbar. That's why he's abd. The abd by his nature cannot be mutakabbar. And therefore, you can't be a shakur to Allah if you're mutakabbir. It's impossible. So he's saying it negates it altogether. And, and then he says, كَمَا تَوَادُعُ لَهُ ذُو جَرِّ The nature of humility is that it takes you to gratitude. 
Because when you, when you are in a state that's humbled before Allah, everything you see it in its right perspective. That Allah has been so generous to you. That Allah has given you so much. That you don't deserve it. You're undeserving of it. And that feeling of undeserving engenders in you a feeling of gratitude. Because if you feel you deserve something, like the Moroccans say, لا شكر على الواجب There's no thanks for something that you deserve. Right? If you feel that this is my wajib, then that by its nature does not engender in you a sense of gratitude towards the person. You just feel like, لا 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 أعطاني ما, ما هو حقي. He just gave me my right. You see, so you have to, once you understand that and recognize you are undeserving. And that's why he's saying, حقره. You know, this big mountain of kibar, See it for what it is. It's insignificant, meaningless. And when you do that, you'll bring it down. You'll bring that down. And Allah, we say Allahu Akbar. And that's why even the, traditionally the Muslims, anytime they saw something in somebody or somebody that, you know, Masha Allah, take it back to its source. Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater. It's a reminder constantly. Allahu Akbar minni. Allahu Akbar minkum. Allahu Akbar min ad dunya wa ma fiha. Allahu Akbar. Right? And he's Al-Kabir Al-Muta'ali. And one of the things he says to the Mutakabir Dhuq in, in, in the Ka'antar Aziz al Now you taste, you're the Aziz now. Right? You're this one. So taste the punishment. Tahakkum in Quran. So, uh, the last thing here is Dhul uh, and Ba'a. Now, uh-huh. Oh, you have to prepare for it? All right. So we'll do that next week. Um. If you're... اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم انشر علينا رحمتك وانزر علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إن شاء الله we're going to uh, actually this section that you just received is is that's to the end of this class so we're almost done and uh, in terms of the second half of the book, uh, the second half, I mentioned that last night for some people, it deals with uh, the opposite. After dealing with the diseases of the heart, it deals with ornamenting the heart with the states and stations of certainty. So, I, inshallah, I'm going to do that next, uh, after in February starting. He, uh, we looked at Fakhar and Kibrun, and these are serious illnesses of the, uh, of the heart. Um, one of the things that has been pointed out is the idea of the mean, what's called al wasiqa in Arabic. And wasyata is the mean. And one of the things, the dangers 
of virtues is that virtues are means between extremes with the acceptance of justice which is the opposite of injustice so it has an opposite but it doesn't have extremes now the next disease that he talks about is a disease that is an extreme and it's in it it's the virtue is humility ziyada leads to arrogance and naqs deficiency leads to a state of abasement or humiliation which is not uh, a virtue in islam uh some might argue i think in christianity that it is a type of virtue but in islam it's definitely not a virtue so he calls it a dhul and in in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that duribat uh, uh alayhim uh adhillat wa maskana uh dhilla was actually part of an affliction given to bani israil for their disobedience so it's actually the result of disobedience often that allah afflicts the people with uh this abasement for being arrogant he abases them right so you know the sun never sets on the british empire and then it sets and then the british empire the lion of great britain becomes the tail of america right so that's a humiliation for the anglo-saxons of britain who's who's always seen the americans as the uh you know the colonies right? i mean these are like the the low people of and now those low people are now uh, dictating for them their own foreign policies etc etc so that's what allah does uh, with people and, and it'll come to the americans as well just like it comes to everybody else it's gonna, it, their turn is coming as well it's just a matter of time and it's already a lot of signs and indications for that so uh, so you can have dhul as a social phenomenon of a people many of the muslim countries are in this status now you'll find muslims unfortunately uh you know who who will do unbelievable things just uh lie cheat steal to get a visa to a a european country or america uh inside their countries they'll they'll do things that are you know just shocking for in terms of their own human dignity and it all has to do with this uh loneliness humiliation right so you can have it afflicted with a people now despite that you can also have a people that are afflicted with great tribulations and they maintain their human dignity which is a whole other thing so al mu'minu la yudillu nafsa the mu'min never humiliates himself he never abases himself is a hadith al mu'minu لا يذل نفسه he does not abase himself so so when when we talk about humility is not humiliation you don't humiliate yourself you humble yourself and uh and so he says adhilla wa ba'ata ba'a is to be low and and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said nothing raises itself in la wa ba'ahu allah except allah will abase it That's the sunnah of Allah in his creation if you raise yourself Allah will abase you and so that's really important cuz th- these are these are wisdoms you know and uh now with Allah you should have dhul with Allah you should be dhalil but not with his creation so before Allah you should be dhul you know you should have a sense of dhul wal hawan wa ba'a before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why uh, Sayyid Abu Qadir Jilani said he he saw all of the doors to Allah uh and they were all crowded except for one uh, al-dhul wa tawada the the door of humility and and humbleness and so he said to to people halumma ila rabbikum you know come you want to get to your lord this is the door because nobody's there so it's hard on the nafs and so he he warns uh, just not to do it and then he says waqbur ala alghani almustakbiri not only that be proud in front of a rich arrogant person right somebody said you know there's the 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 the, the noble things of this world are a ghani mutawadi right a a rich man who's humble that's that's a nobility and a a, a, a sunni sharif a sharif who's a sunni is like a, that's one of the noble things there's other ones that they mention but 
الغني المستكبر is the norm rich people uh, إن الإنسان لا يطغى الرآه استغنى haven't you seen how the man when he becomes wealthy independent he deems himself independent when he becomes rich and, and that causes him to transgress so he, go, he transgresses the boundaries of Allah because he has wealth and that's why uh, like Nimrud you know because Allah gave him dominion in the earth, he, he thought he was, he was God, you know, or he argued with Ibrahim. And this is what uh, wealthy people do, right? They, they think because they have wealth, it gives them the right to have an opinion about everything, to be an expert on everything, to etc., etc. It's a big, it's a serious that. So he said, you know, التكبروا في وجه المتكبر صدقة is a hadith in رواية عبادة. A person is عبادة. The next uh, disease is karahatu them. Them is blame. Insan, it means to blame him. You know, ahummuhu. Them is to blame. The nature of the human being is he does not like to be blamed. That is part of our nature. It's, it's inherent in the human being. We don't like to be blamed. We teach it to our children early on. We, we, we praise them for things and we blame them for other things and they start seeing that the praise is nice because it goes with it. Smiles, gifts, uh, love, hugs, whatever. And the blame is painful because usually it goes with that uh, frowns, anger, raised voices, sometimes uh, physical abuse, these type things. So we teach early on uh, children about praise and blame and they learn very quickly to want praise and to, 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 to dislike blame. The problem is is that it becomes a disease. Karahiya to them. Because there's a lot to be learned uh, first of all in them but also uh, some other things which he's going to clarify here. He says karaha to them me banan ma'lufu. It's a well known disease. وَالنَّذْرُ الْعِبَادِ وَالْوُقُوفُ مَعْهُمْ حِجَابٌ عَنْ مَقَامِ الْإِحْسَانِ So what he's saying is, displeasure with blame is a well-known disease of the heart. Concern with creation's opinions and desiring their praise and displeasure with their criticism becomes a barrier between you and the station of Ihsan. Because what you start doing is you start doing your actions in order to be blamed or praised. And one of the things in the Shira class, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anhu when they bring him to do the Prophet says to the Aus will you accept because the Bani Quraitha were confederates of the Aus and because the Khazraj got Bani Nadir off the hook by uh, the intercession of Abdullah bin Ubay uh, the, the Aus want to get the same for Bani Quraitha so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Bani Quraitha was actually much worse what they did uh, than Bani Nadir, right? I mean, it's all relative, but the fact that they were joining the army. Bani Nadir were attempting to assassinate the Prophet, which is actually worse, uh, you know, in the big picture of things. But the point is, is that Sa'ad and Mu'az said a really important thing. When he came out, they were telling him, please, you know, have the Prophet forgive him, just like the, the Bani Nadir got off. And he said... I have reached a point where in, in my mawqif I have no fear for the, the la akhafu I'm not worried, he was about to die. He said, I'm not in a position to be worried about what people are going to say. See, because what else was worried about was, what are people going to say? These are our confederates and if they all get killed, they'll say the Khazraj got their confederates off, but the else didn't get their confederates off. You see? So they were thinking about what people are going to say. Sa'ad ibn Mu'az said, I'm not worried about, I'm about to meet my Lord. I'm not concerned about what people are going to say. So he said, Al-ana, you know, now, wajidtu nafsi fi maqamin la akhafu fihi lawmat al I found myself in a place which is right before death. I'm not worried about what people are going to say. The point of that is, the reality of it is, you are in that moment at every instant of your life. You know, death is 
It's just a veil to think that you... That's fool al-amal, which is another disease. It's a veil from Allah to make you think, oh, I'm going to you know, be around. A complete illusion. And you have no guarantees whatsoever. And so what this is saying is, Ihsan, is, that's where Sa'ad was. He was in Maqam al-Ihsan. All he could see was Allah. He wasn't concerned about creation. And, and, and that's the point with this karahiyat with them. You start worrying about what other people are going to think. And that will often prevent you from doing the right thing because very often the right thing is what everybody else is going to be against. And that's the nature of the world. So taking the right position often means taking the position that you will be blamed for by others for doing it. And very often courageous stances they, they, they become known later on, right? I mean, for instance, Geronimo is a good example. Geronimo was this evil, horrific uh, barbarian when he was fighting against the, uh, the U.S. Uh, cavalry. Now he's seen as a hero by both the, the whites and the Native Americans as this great freedom fighter fighting for his land. At, the, at that time, even his own people betrayed him. So he was taking a position at that time when even his own people were against it because they'd already mostly had surrendered. He kept fighting till, till he was finally betrayed by, by uh, people around him. But the point is, is that, you know, people like Malcolm X, another example. See, Malcolm X, once, once, once the, the enemy even co-ops, and this is what they'll do, see, because then the enemy will praise him because he's no longer a threat now. Enough time has passed where he's no longer a threat, so we can co-opt him now, right? And this is what uh, they'll often do. But at the time, he was taking positions in a society where everybody was against him, you see. And then later, when, when society maybe catches up or whatever, or he's no longer, then they can say, but at that time, had he worried about them, he wouldn't have been able to say the truth. And that's what people... Uh, that's what happens when people are concerned with what other people think. They're not able to take those positions that that uh, that are courageous for the very reason uh, that they're unpopular and they're ones that uh, you'll often be attacked for. And then he says, overcoming that barrier, so getting beyond that is through the realization that there's no benefit or harm. Again, this is if you notice, this is often a cure for a lot of these diseases. Is, is really recognizing Allah, two names of Allah. These are two names of Allah, an nafiq wa dar. Nafiq is the one who benefits and bar is the one that harms and those are attributes of Allah and no one else has those attributes no, no one no human being has those attributes it's only Allah that can benefit and it's only Allah that can harm so if you're worried about what people think and it's preventing you from doing what you should do for the sake of Allah then you're not seeing reality you're deluded you're in a delusional state and you're seeing things uh, in a way that's uh, it's not conducive to your iman, but it's also it's it's simply not uh, it's not in accordance with reality. It, it really isn't. So that's what you have to realize. All of us have to realize is Allah is the only one that can harm or benefit us. Which is why the Prophet ﷺ said to Ibn Abbas anhu when he told him he gave him some advice. He said, When you seek help, only seek help from Allah." And if you ask, only ask from Allah. And then later he says that you have to know that even if all of creation got together to harm you, they couldn't harm you except with what Allah decreed for you. And if they got together to benefit you, they couldn't benefit you except with Allah, what Allah has decreed for them to benefit you for. So creation can't do anything to you. They can't harm you and they can't benefit you. Now this obviously does not mean... Not recognizing the asbab and saying, oh, well, you know, and, and go, the Prophet ﷺ on the battle of Uhud wore two chain coats of armor. These are asbab. Now, he knows more than anybody else there's no harm and there's no benefit from Allah. 
except from Allah. But that doesn't negate using the intellect and recognizing we are in a world of asbab. Right? And also this means also diplomacy. Because sometimes, like the poet said, I said the truth, but not it shouldn't always be said. So that it's, it's, uh, it's, discre- it's discreet and it's intelligent not to say the truth. You have to look and see things. I mean, I know uh, a friend of mine uh, who's a Libyan with a Libyan delegation that was in Iraq and they were at this big thing. And he's, he was an Azhari graduate and, you know, and uh, they were all like toasting and one of these, uh, you know, shell thing is making a toast to the bath party, right? The, and this uh, Libyan man, he's an older man, you know, uh, he died recently, rahimahullah. But he said, لَعَنَ اللَّهِ حِزْبِكْ وَمَنْ دَعَ لَهُ And he started cursing. This is a big, there were official delegations. He said, may Allah curse your party and curse anyone that calls, that prays for it and curse. Since that were there with him, they suddenly thought, this is it, you know. And they start telling him, you know, he's, he's you know, he's a little... He's got some screws loose and we brought him along. He's a you know, good family and everything, but <laughs> don't pay any attention to him. And they, you know, nothing happened to them. But the point is, I mean, you shouldn't have gone there in the first place, right? There's no reason to be there supporting those people. But that was, that was not really a, a very sagacious thing to do. <laughs> Simple as that, you know. So you have to, uh, Allah reward the kid for the Imam Sultan and Jaya. So, Allah reward him. <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was a strong man. He was a good man. But the point is, is that, you know, you, that, that, you can do that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, uh, he said, A'lamu jihadin, the grim and the sultan is, is speaking the truth in front of an oppressive tyrant. That is the greatest jihad. And, and if you die for it, you know, you're shaheed, there's no doubt. But that, that's, not always uh, called for in certain instances. In other words, if there's benefit in long term, if there's benefit, and this is the nature of that war is strategy and things like that. So there are situations where you, you really have to do, weigh things out, measure things out. Okay. And then he says, "Tumar haramu minhu ma jarra ira muharramin kamar ghazali fasala or ghazali." And then he said, "The impermissible from this disease is what in turn leads to the prohibited." Just as Imam Ghazali has clarified. So, in other words, what is haram from karahiyat to them? Because it's a natural thing to not like to be censored or blamed. But what he's saying is haram is what will lead to the haram. So, for instance, if you if you should do Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi an al Munkar, but you're worried about oh, what are they going to say or what are they going to think or what, and so it stops you from doing an obligation out of fear of loma tilaim, right? The blame the blaming one, the one who blames you, out of fear that you don't do what the obligation, or you're in a place where you should pray, but your co-workers, you start thinking. What are my co-workers going to think if I ask to go out and pray? Because it's not a very popular thing in America, right? To pray. So you start thinking, you know, oh, what are they going to think? They might talk about me or they might say I'm... That's, that is clearly karahiyya to them where it's not appropriate. You know? And in other words, being worried about having people uh, think badly of you for doing things that are not good things, that, that is a good thing and it's a normal thing. All right, so the, 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 what is haram from this and the disease is those things that will prevent you from uh, fulfilling your obligations. Now, another thing about this disease, which is important, is, is, is the fact that real iman does not uh, get established in the heart. According to the tradition of Ibn Mas'ud, uh, until blame and praise is the same. In other words, you're doing it for Allah and you don't really care what other people think. That's, that is real iman. That when you are doing something for the sake of Allah and if somebody praises you, big deal. If somebody blames you, big deal. I did it for the sake of Allah and Allah knows that. 
And that's what you're concerned with. You're not concerned with the eyes of others. So that, that's a really important uh, uh, point. The perfection of sincerity. Of, you know, and another thing, just a little sidetrack. One of the things that I learned in West Africa, which was really good, I thought, was one of the things they never do in the desert is they never have little children do displays of, uh, like, their memorization of Quran or, you know, like, oh, come on, let's hear you say this or that, and then everybody says, ah, Santa, that. They don't ever do that. They don't display the children. And, that, and, that, and I think that's really a, a harmful thing for children to do that, personally. Because uh, it, it leads to a desire for doing these things for, for praise. And, and it, it, it begins the roots, the early roots of riya. And a desire for showing off and things like that. And obviously, I mean, there's people that want to show off their children, which is uh, natural. And I think even Sayyidina Omar radiallahu anhu, when Ibn Omar, he was in a gathering and the Prophet asked which tree is like the palm tree, uh, is like the mu'min in the desert. And so they all started mentioning all these different trees. It's amazing the obvious is often hidden from everybody because the most obvious thing was the palm tree. And nobody could get it. They're saying, you know, the Falha, the, you know, Zainab, the, all these different trees. And, and uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar was there and he was thinking it's the palm tree. But he was too embarrassed because there were big Sahaba there and he was a young boy. Abu Bakr was there, Omar and Uthman. And so he didn't want to say anything. So when he went out, he told, because nobody got it. Finally, the Prophet told him. And he told Omar, you know, I knew it was the palm tree. And he said, I would have loved for you to have said that. You know, in other words, he would have been proud for his son to have said that. Because he's Ibn al-Khattab. <laughs> <laughs> The next uh, disease is antipathy towards death. Karahiyatul maut. And he says about it, Karahatul mauti bi haythu yamfiru minhu wa ya'nafu idha ma yudkaru. Hatta ka'annuhu bi dhawqi kulli nafsin lahu alladhi ata dhu jahli. So he says, antipathy towards death, this dislike of death, having a natural... Uh, uh, Dislike when it's um, is is when one flees from it and becomes annoyed when it happens to be mentioned, as if he is completely ignorant of Allah's words. Kullu nafsin iqatul maut. Allah says every soul will taste death. So it's it's our inevitable uh, end in this world is death, and each one of us will taste it. And so a dislike of death, he's saying, is when one flees from it. قُلْ إِنَّ هَذَا الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مُنَاقِيكُمْ ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَلَمُ الْغَيْبُ وَالشَّهَادَةِ Say that this death that you're fleeing from, you're going to meet up with it. تُلَاقِي You know, you're going to meet it. And then you'll be returned to the knower of the seen and the unseen worlds, and he will tell you, inform you. So death is inevitable, and if you flee from it, or there's people like in this culture, which some people term it a death denial culture. I mean, Muslims, this is less so for Muslims than it is for non-Muslims. Non-Muslims actually will avoid mentioning death. Uh, they don't like to talk about it. They don't bring it up in conversation. It's actually considered almost a bad manners to bring up death in this... Uh, you know, I was, I was on a... I had to go get a passport and I was in the federal building and... And I was going up, and there were these two guys. I don't know who they were, but they, they looked kind of like bureaucrats. And one of them said, well, I'm just, I'm just waiting for that guy to die, you know. And anyway, he's about to drop dead anyway. And the other guy said, uh, well, he's pretty sick, isn't he? He said, yeah, he's, he, he should die any, any minute, you know, and, and I'm really looking forward to it. And then the guy said, uh, he said, uh, he said, why? And he said, well, it's just going to be nice being in a world without him. And then the other guy said, maybe we'll die before him. And he said, no, he's almost dead. He, he, you know, and that's, it's interesting. That's a real death denial where you only see death in terms of illness or, you know, and I'm healthy and I'm, you know, I'm young. Yeah, he's, he's in his deathbed. You know, what, what if we're in Los Angeles and we get an earthquake and suddenly, you know, so this is a deep ghafla that people go into 
about death. It's a deep ghafla. They really don't believe that they're going to die. And, and if they do, it's just lip service. Oh, well, that's a long way off, which is pul al-amal. So karahiyat al mawt is when you hear death and it literally bothers you. I don't want to talk about that. Let's not talk about that. Let's change the subject. This is depressing. This is morbid. That's not from uh, our, our tradition. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ once passed by a group of people who were laughing in a masjid and he said, majalisukum bi dhikri hadam al Mix your, rem- your gatherings with remembrance of the destroyer of, of pleasures. Right? In other words, it brings a to- type of sobriety and weight to a gathering that sometimes gets a little too frivolous. Which is not to say people can't enjoy, I mean, you don't want to be morbid and, and be, right? But the point is, is that people can get together and that's all they do. It's just a frivolous gathering where there's no substance and there's no tafkir. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ was warning us about, of being in majadi al Because the Prophet ﷺ said, that there's no hour in this life that you will regret except one that you spent without remembering Allah in the, in the Akhirah. There's no hour in the dunya. And, and he also said in another one that anyone who sits in a gathering and then gets up from that gathering and has not remembered Allah, it's as if he got up from a dead carcass. Right? It's just carrion. It's jifa. So it's important, you know, that as humans... We were created to worship Allah. And as humans, we're inclined to uns, intimacy, to gatherings and things like that. So our gatherings should not just be for uh, uh, pure enjoyment. There's, there should be some purpose uh, getting together to, to uh, discuss things of importance to us, things like that. So that's important, to make dua for people, things like that. Now, then he says, uh, he says, this is ma'dudatun min jumrat al-amradi. This is reckoned to be among the diseases of the heart. Farda bima Allahu ta'ala qadi. So be content with what Allah uh, has decreed for you. Right? Be content with what Allah, the Exalted, has decreed for you. That apostrophe yeah, shouldn't be there. So it's, the point is, is that if you are in a state of death acceptance, you won't, it won't bother you. And accepting death is, is accepting the decree of Allah. Because Allah, you know, like one uh, sheikh told me once, he said, we're all on death row. We were in a gathering. And he said, we're all on death row. We're just waiting for the executioner to come. Right? <laughs> huh? Allahu Akbar. Right? I mean, we're all on death row. We've all been condemned to death. We're just waiting. Right? And so once you realize that, you, the one who condemned you to death was the one that gave you life in the first place, so you should be content. Because he's done it for a wisdom. There's a wisdom in it. And, and, you know, from another point of view, death is a celebration for the Muslim. Right? Death is a celebration for, for the Muslim. Like the man who said, Fustubi Rabbi Kaaba. His death was Allahu Akbar. That's the end. Shaykh uh, Ibn al-Habib radiallahu said, فِي الْمَوْتِ أَلْفُ الرَّاحَ In death, for the moment, there's a thousand raha, just repose. He said, in this world, as long as you're in this world, there's not a cell in your body that can't have pain and disease in it. Once you're out of this world, all of that ends. So there's a raha in death. Right? And... Uh, another time he said that death for the moment was like going from the third class compartment to the first class compartment. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's just the conductor comes and he tells you, no, no, you shouldn't be here. Come up to first class. What do you say? No, 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 I don't want to go. I like it here. I'll stay here in third class. <laughs> you can say, oh, great. It's like when they get you on the, on the airplane sometime, they bump you up to first class. You're not upset about it. Right? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. 
So uh, that's it. For the mu'min, it's not a bad thing. Right? And that's why our mourning is only three days. I mean, I had a professor, I had a course called Death and Dying, and this professor uh, said that one of the worst things about this country is the industry of mourning. And he said it's a disservice to people that they there's this whole industry of mourning that goes around death and, uh, and, and this idea of dragging on the mourning period. A lot of people will go into mourning for like years or, and, and, and they'll go to therapy and do all these things to get over. That's all love of dunya and connect to dunya. People of Allah, you know, when, when you accept Allah and you accept, if Allah takes your beloved, khalas. Allah took that person, Allah took that child, Allah took, and, and it's painful, the Prophet ﷺ felt pain, he cried, but it's Allah who did it. And we have to be pleased with what Allah does, and that's why the mu'min is the one who's able to go through that. And another thing about the Muslims, which is amazing, no, as far as I know, definitely not the Europeans, but no, no people can deal with death like the Muslims do. And... and if you look uh, at calamities and tribulations when they befall the Muslims, y- you see what, where the Muslims are at. And, and when you see the opposite happen to the non-Muslims, they're committing suicide, they're just, they can't, they fall apart. The Muslims are able to because of that rabta, you know, that, that strength with Allah and that connection that they have, a divine connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why they're able to do things that other people can't do. And, and, and that's why we're able to deal with death and Maurice Bukhayil, the French uh, doctor, one of the things that he said that got him interested in Islam was how Algerians died in France compared to uh, the French people. Right? He, he was so impressed with North Africans, the way they faced death. And, and if you've seen, because I've worked in, in uh, uh, you know, uh, on hospital wards where people were dying and it's amazing you see people in this culture a lot of them have, they can't die they don't know how to die they, ha- they don't have a clue and if you watch a Muslim who, especially a devout Muslim if you watch a devout Muslim who's, he's been practicing for death his whole life right so when it comes he's ready for it you know and, and uh, Sheikh Uthman Bashir Uthman Rahimullah who is a close friend of mine he was in his uh, early 80s and uh, he grew up in, in uh, Eritrea and he um, he came to the US actually and I told him about Dar al Islam and he said we have to go there and he uh, he um, he got a wanted me to go with him because he couldn't see going to speak Arabic and uh, Tekrur and so we went, and, and, uh, and then he went back to Medina, and he died right after that. And, one, and a couple of things, one of the things he told me, he told me that he knew he was going to die in Medina, because he told me his, uh, his uh, sheikh, when he was in Eritrea, when he was a young man, he told him, there's going to be a lot of fitting in this country, uh, there's going to be, the communists will take over, and you're, you're going to have to flee, but Allah, inshallah, will open up a place for you in Medina, and, and you'll go live there and you'll die there and you're going to be buried in Baqiya. He told me that. I heard that from his lips. And this is what they call kishf, which happens. Some of the people of Allah, Allah give them... It's not like a revelation. It's not revelation. It's just Allah give them a type of opening and they, they see things and, uh, and they can tell people sometimes. And, uh, and he told me he always thought his sheikh was just kind of saying nice words to him. And, you know, and he said after he died, sure enough, communists took over... He was a wealthy businessman. He had to flee and a, a place was open for him in Medina and he ended up getting uh, resi- uh, uh, citizenship there and, and he lived his whole life. But he traveled all the time. And he told me, he said, I really feel, inshallah, I'm going to die in Medina. They took him back to Jeddah and he, uh, he was in the hospital there. And I have the card from uh, Dr. Almar told me everything how he died. He, uh, he was in the hospital in Jeddah and they, he had cancer. Uh, and he he was going to die, and he had almost no strength, and they had him hooked up to all this stuff, and and then he was there for a while, and then one day he told his son, "We have to go to Medina today." And he said, the doctor said, "No, no, he can't leave." And he said, "He said, no, I I'm leaving today. They're going to drive me. My son will drive me." 
and I'm leaving the hospital. And his doctor was totally said, no, you're too sick and uh, you, you need to stay here. He said no. They took him that night. He went all the way back, got to Medina. He did just said la ilaha illallah the whole night. Right before Fajr, he told uh, his son to say a few things to certain people and this and that. And then he said the shahada and, <laughs> and died. And he, he was buried in, uh, in uh, Baqiya. And uh, the place he was buried when they went in, um, he gave me a piece of the, the, from the road that covers the Prophet Sallallahu grave, because they cut it up every, when they change it. And he gave me a piece of that. But he, uh, he, and he was buried with that. Huh? <laughs> but he, uh, the place that he, he was buried is right next to Imam Malik and Nafi, where people aren't buried anymore, because it's, it's in the old Baqiya. But when they came in, they found there was a dug grave there, and so they just they put him in that grave. But he was prayed on on Yom Jum'ah. He was the only person that died that day, or that was uh, had janazah that day at the Prophet's mosque. So that I mean, I'm just telling you that story because that is an example of how you know Muslims who know how to die die. Right? I mean, there's a there's a story. Allahu Anam of its truth, but but it's you know it's a story told in Persia about. Uh, Fariduddin al Atar, who was a perfumer, and uh, the, and I, he actually tells a story. I think that he uh, the way that he made his tawbah to Allah was a man once came begging for alms, and he told him like, "Why don't you get a job?" And he said, "This is my job." And he said, "What do you do?" And he said, "Well, what do you do?" He said, "I sell perfumes." And he said, "The most important thing that you're ever going to do is die." And he said, and I know how to do that. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah, and he died. So there are people that do know how to die, you know. I mean, whether that story is true or not, there's a truth in it. Is it there? Huh? Yeah. I mean, there there really is. There are people that know how to die. And when the time comes, they will know what to do. And there's other people that don't. And when the time comes, they go into a real state of confusion. So, and that's one of the blessings also of doing dhikr of death. And another thing that our scholars have recommended, and the Prophet ﷺ, based on his uh, hadith of remembering death, is to go through the states of the akhirah, to actually go through visualization of dying, of being washed, of being wrapped, of being put into your... Uh, grave of having the dirt cover you and then being asked by the angels and then resurrection of actually going through the states and the mizan to reflect on those things as a practice to do uh, it's a very sobering uh, type of practice to do that just to really uh, get you out of a, the, the sleep that we're in uh, in life now another thing he says uh, here is that amma idha qalahu لا لذاته ولا للانصرام عن لذاته بل خوف قطعه عن استعداده بطاعة الله إلى معاده. If he doesn't like death, not for its death, because it's death, nor because it's going to cut him off from the pleasures of dunya, but if he doesn't like it out of fear that he hasn't had enough time to prepare for death, then that's a good reason. And the Prophet ﷺ encouraged you to desire a long life. Because he said, if you're a bad person, you have time to make up for the wrong you've done. And if you're a good person, you have more time to increase your good and to uh, strengthen your uh, sahifa or your, uh, your scroll on the Yom al So we should have, and he mentioned that about Tawl al-Amad, that it was good to desire, if you were in good deeds, it was a good thing to desire long life. Uh, for that reason. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, about death, he once said to Aisha radiallahu anhu, Man ahabba Allah, ahabba liqa'ahu. Whoever loves Allah, loves to meet Allah. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, al-mawt, you know, nakrah al-mawt. We, we don't like death. And the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, you know, that that was normal. That was a natural thing. But rather, it was a dislike of the akhirah, of meeting Allah. 
You see? So, the point is, is that di- the dislike of death is obviously natural. I mean, Allah's put it in our body. It's at a cellular level that you don't want to die, right? And that's why it, in certain instances where your life's threatened, you go into a hyper state of functioning and, and you'll do things that are really not at the conscious level to protect yourself or others from death, right? So that is normal and Allah has put that in us. That's a good thing. And that's why Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he said, Allah ta'akurun, when he offered them the food, the angels, and they didn't eat, fa'ojasa minhum khifa. You know, he felt fear. And that fear was that they were going to rob him and kill him or something. So that's a natural thing uh, to, to have that. And that's not what he's talking about there. And then he says, أَوْفَوَّضَرْ أَمْرَ إِلَى مَوْلَاهُ فَمَا يَشَاءَ أَرْدَاهُ أَوْ أَبْقَاهُ if on the other hand, also, if he completely entrusted his affair to his master, and whatever he wills, either felling him or giving him respite, contents him. So, in other words, you don't mind. Whatever Allah wants to do with you, you're just content with that. That's fine. And, and so those, both those positions are good positions. And that's why he says, فَذَانِ مَمْدُحَانِ مَحْمُودَانِ وَالْكُرْهُ لَا يُبْعِدُ مِنْ كَدَّانِ He says that those, both those attitudes towards death are commendable and praiseworthy in any way a dislike of the reality of death in no way distances uh, you from you death's proximity. So even if you don't like death, it, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to make it uh, any more distant from you. It's, it's much better to accept it for your own state. And, and the other thing that's uh, important about this is that one of the... Well, he mentions it here. And then he says, ذَاكِرُهُ يُكْرَمُ بِالْقَنَاعَةِ وَبِنَ شَاطِ قَلْبِهِ لَطَاعَةِ The one who remembers death much, he's ennobled by certain characteristics. Four things. One of them is qana'a. Because of your remembrance of death, you tend to be more content with what you have. In other words, if you really think that you could die any time, there's going to be more of an impetus to enjoy uh, the experience of life now instead of always uh, thinking, you know, eventually I'm going to get it together, as they say in America. And uh, that never happens, right? So the point is, qana'a, and this is the Prophet ﷺ said, al qanaatu kanzun la yafna. Contentment is a treasure that is never exhausted. So, qana'a is really important. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma arzuq ala Muhammadan al qana'a wal kafaf. Oh Allah, give the family of my family, the family of the Prophet ﷺ, contentment and enough to live their lives with. So, just give them enough to get by and then make them content with it. And that's why the qana'a, a person who's in a state of qana'a, he's the only wealthy person. So a poor man who's, who's content is a rich man in reality. A rich man who's discontent is a poor man in reality. Because faqar is want. And qana'a is there's, you have no want. If you don't have want, you're rich. Because the definition of a rich person is that without need. So if you don't have need, you're wealthy. And that's why al-ghina, ghina nafs. The Prophet ﷺ said real wealth is the wealth of the, of the soul. Right? Al-ghina... It's not having a lot of stuff. It's, 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 the, it's the contentment of the soul. And so when, when you remember death, you, Allah, one of the blessings, He's telling you, this is a given. You are given qana'a. And this is an age where people, there's so many false needs and wants that are inculcated in the hearts of people. I mean, that's what media is doing constantly. Just... Yagris, you know, it's, it's just planting the seeds of fama, of desire, of shahwa, of all these things in the heart. And then he says, it also will give you energy, right? His heart's activities directed towards obedience, right? So, by remembering death, it will give you a type of nishap. You become nishat, which is to be energized, to do good deeds, because if you think about death, then it's going to make you want to be more obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبِبِدَارِ تَوْبَةٍ وَيُبْتَدَى 
And then also the other thing that you're given is you're given uh, a, uh, a, uh, a state where you'll hurry to toba. If something does occur, if a slip does happen and, and, and you do something wrong, it will cause you to quickly make toba, which is rectifying things. So toba rectifies wrong actions and that's a gift of remembrance of death. Because if you do something wrong and then you say, Subhanallah, I'm accountable for this. Astaghfirullah. Then it, it causes you to actually ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness. Now, the opposite is true. The one who forgets the, the, his death, he's given those three opposites. He will always want more. He'll never have qana'ah. And he's also going to be yursiru jawarihuhu fil ma'asiyah. He'll uh, do wrong actions because he's not worried about death. He's not thinking about death and the yawm al qiyamah and the hisab and these things. And then finally, uh, he won't have remorse when he does things that are wrong because he's not really uh, worried about uh, what's going to happen uh, in the akhirah. Now, the next thing, this one really is one of the most important in the whole thing uh, because shukr really is, is essential to the deen of Islam. And, and gratitude, and the meaning in Arabic for, for kafir, a kafir, one of the meanings is kufran and ni'mah. And this is why a Muslim can be a kafir. Right? Because there's a kufr dun al kufri. There's a kufr that's less than kufr. Right? And kufran and ni'mah, like one of the things the Prophet ﷺ warned women against, was kufran and mu'ashara, uh, being uh, ungrateful for their spousal companionship, right? If, if Allah gives them a husband and then they're ungrateful towards him, right? So they, they don't see that there's a blessing, there's a ni'mah in that protection, uh, you know, giving, uh, taking care of the needs of the person, etc., etc. So, uh, the next disease is called oblivion to blessings. مَنْ عَيُوبَ النَّفْسِ نِسْيَانُ النِّعَمْ وَأَصْرُهُ الْغَفْلَةُ وَمَا بِكُمْ That's an ayah in the Qur'an. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ And there's no ni'mah that you have except that it's from Allah. So, you know, in this culture they say you should count your blessings. Right? Count your blessings. And uh, people that do that are actually quite rare. Because Allah says, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تَحْصُوهَا If you count the blessings of Allah, enumerate them, you will never encompass them. So, just to go into this, one of the things... Uh, وَبِدَوَامِ ذِكْرِهَا So he's saying you should always remember that ayah. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةً فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Now, the, in the Quran begins بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ Some of the Mufassirun say that Rahman is the giver of جَلَائِرَ النِّعْم The big blessing. Rahman means al munim bi jalail al ni'am and Rahim means al munim bi taqaiq al ni'am Rahim means the giver of subtle blessings In other words Rahman the blessings of the Rahman are easy like health it's obvious if all you have to do is say to somebody oh thank god you're healthy and they say you're right you know Alhamdulillah ala saha wal afiya. That's a obvious Alhamdulillah ala al iman. But then there's all these other blessings, daqaiq al ni'am. For instance, the blessing of the eye, the fact that the eye is lubricated. Now there's some people that have to have these visine type things because they get dry eye. And what happens when your eyes are dry, you blink, what the blinking is doing is cleaning the eyes. Right? And it also protects it because you've got these eyelashes and it's very fast. 
if the eye, if you look, just a slight piece of hair gets into the eye, it's really uh, troublesome. So Allah made this eye, you have this blinking that protects your eye from being harmed. And then He also put sockets in there. So the eye is slightly back in, this, uh, in the skull, right? In order to be protected from uh, blunt wounds and things like that, right? And people that don't get the uh, lacrimentation of the eye, they have to put drops in the eye because it hurts so much, right? Or people that can't close their eyelids or people that lose their eyelids. There's actually people that lose their eyelids. So that, I mean, there's all these... And then just the eye itself. If you look at the, the, all the colors that the eye gives. So if you start looking at the body and realizing that the whole thing is all ni'am, the fact that you're balanced. Because people that lose uh, their ear, they get a disease in the ear... Because balance is actually part of it is, is related to the ear and the nerve in the ear. So if you have uh, eighth ear damage, uh, people actually start losing their balance and they can't stay up because they're not... So balance itself is a ni'mah from Allah. The fact that you actually, when you're standing, you're balanced. There's people that don't have that. Right? And then the way you eat, all of that is a ni'mah from Allah the digestive juices that you're not even aware of that are going in and then breakdown of the foods and all the separation of all these things are hidden now that are hidden from we don't even think about it the the cerebellum and and the uh, uh, the the, uh, the 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 whole way that the uh, the brain is working at a subconscious level breathing you don't have to remember to breathe right you don't have to do anything these are all ni'am that Allah has given you and oftentimes we're not even aware of it, right? The thumb itself, right? The opposable thumb. Other animals can't do that. Like some, and Allah says, لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We ennobled Bani Adam. Some say it was that He gave us the thumb. And the word in Arabic for thumb is ibham, which is the strange thing. Mubham, you know, it's a strange thing. Because other creatures don't have that. So the thumb is a big ni'mah of Allah, right? Alexander the Great used to cut off the, his enemy's thumbs. Right? So they couldn't fight him again. Because you lose your thumb, you can't do anything. So, uh, and then all the pleasure that Allah has given you, your taste buds, that's a ni'mah. Allah could have made your food rocks, and He could have made your water brackish. He says that in the Quran. He could have made your water brackish. It could have been uh, horrible to taste, and you'd still have to drink it. But He made it sweet. He could have made all the foods taste the same. But He gave like, lemons for people that like sour things and honey for people that like sweet. He gave all these different things. And then He gave you different taste buds to where you could actually enjoy the different things in it. So all of these, this idea of reflecting on the ni'm. One of the things Imam al-Ghazali says, he said, look at your food. Allah says that in the Quran. فَرِيَنْظُرْ إِنْسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِ we brought down the rain and then we split the earth. And you can see it when the rain reaches and the seed, it says, it mixes with the seeds of the earth. And then when it splits open, Allah is the splitter. When he, Allah splits that open, it causes the earth to break forth. So Allah is doing all that. And so he tells, فَلْيَنْظُرَ insan, Let a man look at his ta'am, إِلَى ta'ami. إِنَّا صَبَبْنَا مَا صَبَّ ثُمَّ شَقَقْنَا أَرْضَ شَقَّ فَأَنْبَتْنَا بِهِ حَبًّا وَعِنَبًا وَقَبًّا وَزَيْتُونًا Right? All these things Allah has given. The inab, the grapes, the, the zaytun, olives, the, uh, the, the dates, the, the, all of these things. The fodder, the animals eat and we benefit from. Secondarily, Right? in there Abba how we benefit from Abba benefit it secondarily they didn't know that then you know the transformation of all that through meat and that animals eat it and then we eat the meat and we get that secondarily so all that's Allah saying look at those things reflect on them and realize that's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more you do that then the less inclined you are to forget the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and, and you'll honor the ni'mah. And the importance for this cannot be underestimated. Why? Because he says here, وَذِكْرَ الْآيَةِ مُرْجِفَاتِ غَيْرِهَا Remember the other ayahs that should put fear in your hearts. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيْرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتِّ يُغَيْرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah does not change the blessings of a people and turn them into the opposites until they change themselves by not showing Him gratitude for them. That's how that verse is interpreted by the scholar. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيْرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ Allah gives you a ni'mah and He won't take it away from you until you show disgratitude for it, ingratitude for it. Allah says, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَمْ يَكُمْ مُغَيَّرًا مُغَيَّرًا نِعْمَةً أَنْعَمَهَا عَلَى قَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِيَنْفُسِهِمْ That is because Allah will not change the blessing that He has given a people until they change themselves through ingratitude. And the poet said, إِن كُنْتَ فِي نِعْمَةٍ فَرْعَاهَا إِنَّ الْمَعَاصِ تَزِيرُ النِّعْمَ If you're in ni'ma, guard it, because disobedience takes away your ni'm. If you're disobedient to Allah, you lose your ni'm. And that's why Al-Waqi'ah, when he was asked when he was young, uh, when he was old, he could uh, move so quickly, and somebody asked him the secret of that, and he said, تِرْكَ الْجَوَارِ حَفِظْنَاهَا لِلَّهِ فِي صِغْرِنَا فَحَافِظَهَا لَنَا فِي كِبْرِنَا These are limbs that we guarded for Allah's sake when we were young, and so Allah has guarded them for our sake as we're old. So if you, if you protect the ni'am that Allah has given you, then that's the way you maintain them. Right? قَيْدُ ni'am. They say قَيْدُ ni'am as shukr That uh, by keeping the ni'mah t- with you is gratitude. تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Allah has announced to us, He's told us, if you show gratitude for my ni'am, I will increase you in them. I'll give you more. Right? So oblivion to ni'am is a disaster. It's a disaster. And the other thing about this is what's known as istidraj. And istidraj is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow you to continue on in disobedience and increase you in in blessings. And you think that it's because Allah likes you. And that's what the man says uh, in the Quran when he says... uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the man who he's given blessings and things, he says, Rabbi uh, akramani, my Lord, he's given me ikram. And then, فَإِذَا قَدَرْ عَرِسْقَهُ قَالَ إِنَّ رَبِّيَ هَانَنِي فَيَقُولُ رَبِّيَ هَانَنِي When Allah makes it constricted for him and difficult, he says, my Lord, ahanani. he's insulted me, he's, uh, he's denigrated me. So people see that uh, if it's difficult, they think that that's uh, a sign that Allah hates them. If it's easy, they think Allah loves them. Now this is an important point because there's, there's a few things happening. In terms of ni'mah, first, what is a ni'mah? In other words, how do we identify a ni'mah? If you look, there are things that will benefit you They'll benefit you short-term and long-term. An example of that would be like uh, ilm and husn al-khuluq, good character. So things that benefit you in short-term and long-term, that is a, a true ni'mah. That is a true ni'mah. Something that will benefit you in your dunya and your akhirah. That is, that is pure, unadulterated ni'mah. And then you have something that is uh, nafi'un. You have something that's darrun, filhan, wal ma'al. 
It harms you in the short term and the long term, like ignorance and bad character. And then you have something that is beneficial in the short term, but in the long term it's not good for it. Um, and there's a lot of things like that. Shahwats are generally like that. If you eat a whole bunch, you're enjoying it while you're eating, but then uh, overeating is bad for you. It's just bad for you. Simple as that. So it, it's beneficial short term, long term it's harmful. And then there's other things, the opposite of that. They're harmful in the uh, short term, beneficial in the long term, like suppressing the shahwat. So not stopping before you're full. That's difficult. So yaduruka fil hal. It's something you don't really like in the short term, but in the long term it's good for you. And uh, ignorant people see this as a ni'mah. Ignorant people see the short term benefit that has long term uh, harm, they see it as a ni'mah and they like it. And, th- and that's why they're not very intelligent. Because uh, people, intelligent people, the difference between intelligent people and uh, ignorant people is intelligent people look at the aqibah. They always look at the long term. Uh, children can't look at long term. And that was why one of those tests that they did on the EQ test, which I thought was really interesting, is uh, the man who did all the studies on children that were successful later on in life. I mean, they have different criteria for success than we do. But the point of the, the test was, is that they would take a child and say, uh, I'll give you, uh, they, they'd leave cookies out and they'd come in, oh, can I have a cookie? And they'd say, I'll tell you what. Uh, you, you can either have one now or you can have two later. And consistently, the more intelligent ones would pick the two later. In other words, they were willing to put off the short-term gain for a long-term greater gain. And that is intelligent. That really is, that is a sign of intelligence in Islam. Al-aqibatu lil muttaqeen. The kuffar look short-term, fourth quarter, Right? The Muslims look long term, right? Now, there's dunya, like for instance, you know, the, one of the things about the Jews is that the Jews are good at that, right? They're good at thinking long term benefit. And this is one of the problems with the Muslims now. Muslims are very short sighted, which is a sign of our own uh, stupidity. You know, we've, we've lost the intelligence we have because we left guidance. And our intelligence is based on our guidance. It's not based, because Allah won't give us tawfiq with other than Islam. Sayyidina Omar said, أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ فَإِذَا طَرَبْنَ الْعِزَّةِ فِي غَيْرِهِ أَذَلَّنَ اللَّهُ We are people, Allah gave us dignity with Islam. And if we seek dignity from other than Islam, Allah will humiliate us. You see, so it doesn't work for us. We, the rules are different for the Muslims and the kuffar. They're different. I mean, there are sunnah that are thabits for everybody. But Allah will not give Muslims tawfiq except with Islam. It's impossible. Whereas with the kuffar, he'll give them temporary successes with their kuffar, with their disobedience. Right? But the long term, they're going to fail. The long term, they'll always fail. They have to. So, uh, now, another thing that he mentioned, that Imam al said, oh, anyway, did I finish with this? Yeah, so another thing about this is um, there are two types of ni'am. There are what are called usul al-ni'am and furu' al-ni'am. Usul al-ni'am are the roots of the ni'am, which are the most important ones. And then there's furu' al-ni'am. There's branches. The usul of ni'am are things like health, iman, islam, uh, safety in your body and your uh, and your where you live and in your well-being and, and those things. Th- those are the most important ones. And then there's other ones that, that are embellish it. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about, uh, about uh, Palut um, in the Quran, when they, the Bani Israel, you know, they say, how can he be a king? He doesn't have any money. And this and that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, in Allah astafahu wa zaaduhu bastafan fil ilmi wal jismi. Allah chose him, but not only that, he gave him basta. He gave him increase in knowledge and in his body. So this is, this is something that Allah embellishes people with. 
Uh, and that's why Sayyidina Omar said, إِذَا بَعَتْهُمْ رَسُولًا فَبَعَتُوا حَسَنَ الْوَجْحِ If you send a messenger, send somebody with a good face. Right? Because that you want somebody to present, uh, in this culture they call it personable person. Somebody who's, you see them and there's, there's an automatic uh, attraction to that person. The reason for that is there's a wisdom in it. That Allah has uh, inclined the hearts towards... Uh, towards those people. And so that's why the messengers were all attractive to look at. Uh, leadership, one of the qualities that leadership has is height, right? To be actually tall. That, that's something that many leaders uh, have in history. Uh, Napoleon is, is a serious exception uh, to that rule. But generally, people tend to uh, follow, you know, with kids, the, the, the tall one will often be the, the leader of the gang and things like that. It all either be the tall one or the clever one. Right? One of the two. Like Napoleon was clever, but he wasn't tall. And he was in the end a very stupid person. But uh, he was militarily uh, at points. So, you know, I, I could go on and on about this one because it's a really uh, important one. And uh, I think everybody gets the idea. Um, one, one man once said to the Prophet, uh, in front of the Prophet, uh, he asked for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma inni asaruka tamam al ni'mah. Oh Allah, I ask you for the completion of ni'mah. And the Prophet said, Atabri ma, ma huwa tamam al ni'mah? Do you know what tamam al ni'mah is? And he said, La, he didn't know what it was. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Dukhul al jannah. To enter into paradise. That's completion of ni'mah. So if you had a good life in this world, it's a ni'mah from Allah. And if you had iman, that's the greatest ni'mah in the dunya. But the completion of that ni'mah is to enter into, into paradise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَادْخُلِ فِي عِبَادِي وَادْخُلِ جَنَّتِي Enter into my, amongst my servants, into my paradise. That is the ni'mah. And then Islam is, is the ni'mah of Allah that He, that he gave us. Right? وَأَتْمِمْتُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي I have completed my ni'mah uh, of Islam. عَلَيْكُمْ Right? So in this world, Islam is, is the ni'mah that Allah has given us. And then another thing that uh, Shaykh uh, Muhammad al-Hajjar, who uh, I met in Medina, uh, I was walking out with him uh, to, uh, to his car, and, and he said, right next to the Bab al-Salam, he said, مَنْ أَصْبَحَ مُعَافًا فِي بَدْنِهِ آمِنًا فِي سَرْبِهِ عَنْدُهُ قُوتُ يَوْمِهِ فَكَأَنَّ مَحِيزَتْ لَهُ الدُّنْيَا بِحَذَافِرِهَا Whoever wakes up in a healthy state, mu'afa, right? He's in a good state in his body and he's safe in his uh, possession, in his, uh, what he has and, and he has enough to get through the day. It's as if he has the world and everything in it. Right? That's a hadith from Tirmidhi. So if you really reflect on that, if, you, if Allah, if you woke up this morning with with good health and, and you're protected you don't, you're not feeling anything and you have enough just to get through this day it's as if you have everything in the dunya and so that's, that's a ni'mah that you should be all of us should be grateful for so uh, branches would be things like ornamented ni'am blessings that you know for instance a house uh, you need a place to live but if you have extra things in the house and furniture and all those, those are like furu and ni'mah. I mean, it's the accessory ni'mahs. You don't really need them, they're more. And the more ni'mah you have, the more hisab you have. And that's why uh, when the, the Prophet once went to a house and they had meat and dates and cool, cool water, and Allah said, ثُمَّ لَا تُسْأَلُونَ يَوْمَ إِذَنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ And then you would be asked about the na'im, the blessing. And the Prophet said, هَذَهُ naim This is the naim we're going to be asked about. So some of the um, Sahaba came to the Prophet and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we realize we don't have any blessings to be asked about. <laughs> <laughs> because they, they weren't eating meat and dates. <laughs> so Jibreel السلام, told the Prophet that Allah wants to know, do they wear sandals? And do they drink cold water? And, and the reason behind that is, is that you can walk without shoes. 
So that is a ni'mah to have shoes on your feet. And you can drink water that's not cold. So if you drink cool water, the coolness in it is a ni'mah that you'll be asked about. And you can just continue on from there. Right? Mm-hmm. Could, could that be interpreted as you know, a recommendation to go with the bare minimum? To, to do, yeah. Sayyidina Adi, he said, the aqadu nas az-zuhad. The most intelligent people are people that do without in this world. And he said, wa ahmaqu nas al-bakhir. And the, the, the most stupid of people is the, uh, the, the bakhir. He said, because... Uh, he said, uh, his, his mal, malahu, he said, uh, He doesn't get to use it in this life, and then he's punished for it in the next world. So he's an idiot. Like the miser who won't spend even on himself, he just hoards the money. He, that is the stupidest person. Because he's not enjoying it in this world, and it becomes a punishment for him in the next world. But the point is, the zuhad, the zahid, and that's a maqam. He goes into that maqam. Maqam is zuhud. Doing without. Now, the Prophet ﷺ was somebody who was balanced in that in relation to our time now, he would have been considered living, uh, you know, way below poverty level. In terms of modern, the way the modern world looks at it, his actual, what he was living with, uh, would be so little. Uh, it's unbelievable. But by no means was he uh, in, uh, impoverished, you know, in the sense that he, uh, his needs were taken care of, right? So, and he didn't worry about anything, and, and there, was, uh, there was some difficulty with food, but Aisha radiallahu said that there was always dates and, and, uh, and uh, yogurt and milk, and, and uh, people would send barley bread. They, sometime two months would go by, they didn't see smoke, and they asked her what they were eating, and she said, we used to eat al-aswadain, uh, dates and uh, water. So, mm-hmm. Good point. I, I'm glad you said that. Marat al-Hajj, when I asked him, can you be a, a, a zahid and have a lot of wealth? And he said, كان عثمان أزهد الناس وكان عبد الرحمن بن عوف زاهداً like Abd Rahman ibn Auf was a Zahid, and they were very wealthy. So here it has to do with the heart. If the heart's not connected to it, in other words, if you have all this wealth and you could lose it tomorrow and you would be the same person, then that, that's a sign you're Zahid. But if, if you fall apart and go into despondency and people can see that that person's a broken person, they'll say he used to be rich and poor guy, he lost everything and now that's what happened. That, that means, you know, that his whole thing was, it was all in the heart. Whereas uh, the, the, the Zahid is the one, if it's there with him, khalas, he has it. And if he loses it all, alhamdulillah. And that's why the Prophet said he chose to be hungry one day and full the next day. To keep him in that state where he would never get used to uh, uh, one or the other. Right, because because it's all about dis uh, attachment. It's not being attached to all this stuff, right? The next disease is al uh, 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 and uh, this is uh, derision, deriding people, uh, making fun of people. Uh, in, in the Quran, when Ibrahim, when Musa alayhi salam tells the Bani Israel to sacrifice the cow, they, they say, "Atastahzi'u bina? Are you making fun of us? Is this huzu?" And he said, "A'udhu bi Dhaan akum min al-jahilin." I seek refuge that I should be from the ignorant ones. From that, the ulama took it that istihza is from jahil. It's ignorant. To, uh, to have istihza towards people, to make fun of people. That, that's a type of ignorance. And um, it, this can be lampooning, right? Uh, making caricatures of people, drawing funny things. Uh, in this culture, you have comedians that make fun of people and, uh, and, and anybody. They take as their target. 
What he says about this, first of all, uh, that its cure is the same cure for arrogance because it's a type of arrogance. If you see them as less than you, then it's kibbutz. Then you're arrogant. And this is why uh, the, the Moroccans say this, but it's actually from uh, Sayyidina Ali. Um, they say, لا تحقر عبدا عسى يكون لله وليا. Don't belittle anybody because he might be a wali of Allah. And the reason for that is, even if you see a man drunk, vomiting on the street, you don't know what his seal is. Right? And that's why Imam al-Qurtabi said, Omar, when he was bowing down to idols in Mecca, was still the beloved with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because al-umur bi khawatimiha. Allah knows what the seal is. So that, that Omar who was bowing down to idols, that the, the Muslims could have looked at and made fun of, and what a stupid idiot and a polytheist, etc., etc. They didn't know Omar. Right? They were just seeing one stage. And that's why it's very dangerous to judge somebody uh, where they are or make fun of them or things like that. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا يَسْخَرْ قَوْمٌ مِنْ قَوْمٍ عَسَى أَنْ يَكُونُوا خَيْرًا مِنْهُمْ Don't let one people mock another people because maybe they're better than them. وَلَا, uh, ولا يَسْخَرْنَ النِّسَاءِ وَلَا تَسْخَرْ نِسَاءٌ مِنْ نِسَاءٍ and don't let a group of women mock another group of women because maybe they're better than them. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. I don't know. It might be. But uh, what I know is that the Prophet was commanded not to curse their gods. Don't curse those who call on other than Allah, meaning the idols, because they will curse Allah out of ignorance. And that's called sadda dhari'ah. So, things like burning the Israeli flag publicly. Uh, Muslims do stuff like that, or burning the American flag. What you're going to do is have them go and take Qurans or something and burn them or stomp on them. Or you're going to have them go and take a, a Saudi Arabian flag that has La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah on it and stomp on it and burn it. So you incite them to do something that, you know, is not only bad for them, but it's also, it's, it's uh, sacrilegious to us. Right? We don't want people cursing Allah. So, so you shouldn't do that. There's no reason to do it. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, in his victories, he was, never, uh, he was never boastful. When he went into Mecca, he went with his head bowed down. He didn't go in triumphant leader. He went with his head bowed down. Total humility. And, and that, that's the great, that's the warrior. I mean, that's the great, not that other one. Because so, that's jahiliya. I mean, that's Abu... Uh, you know, that's, that's uh, Abu Jahl. No, that, that's what those people do. And we're supposed to be above that. We're supposed to be in a real way. Not, not in, a, in a false way, in a deep way. Mm-hmm. Uh, regarding the fact that we don't know the seal of a person, how they'll end up where they think their Muhammad might change. So we don't deride them, but what about like, praying against them? Or... Oh, that's, you can pray against uh, your enemies. Uh, it's mustahab to make dua for people uh, for guidance that's mustahab it's not a wajib it's mustahab to make dua for people Um, some of the ulama said don't curse Israel because it was a name of a prophet right the name of a prophet. So, you know, but, I mean, the point is, is that, and then also, you know, there a lot of Jews become Muslim. They have throughout history, and they still do. Right? And there are Jews that become Muslim. There have been Israelis that have become Muslim. So they're human beings. I mean, they're not demons. They're human beings. Right? The Serbs are human beings. I mean, I, there, there's some, been some good articles recently just about the demonization of the Serbs. The Serbs are our enemies, and, and they did some horrible things. But they're human beings that can become Muslim. What the Jihadi Arabs, Hind ate the 
bit into the liver of Hamza. I mean, that's, it doesn't get much more barbaric than that. She became a Muslim. Wahshi who killed him became a Muslim. So people can make Toba and they can become Muslim. And those people that did all those things, you know, it'd be interesting to see what they're like now, how they're sleeping at night, you know, because people do things in war and, and they pay for it for the rest of their lives. And, uh, and more, Vietnamese, Viet, uh, more veterans of the Vietnam War have committed suicide than died in Vietnam in this country. Right? A lot of people don't know that. So they paid their price. And the people at the Gulf War uh, who saw that carnage, you know, they'll pay their price. They're human beings. They have hearts, you know. I mean, you, 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 all of you have worked with non-Muslims. They cry. They have tears. Allah said, you know, in yamsaskum qarhun faqad masraqawun qarhun mithruhu. If you're afflicted with something, they get afflicted with it too. Right? So we all bleed red. Uh huh. Well, I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu there's du'as in the Qur'an against the Vadi mean. So, anybody who oppresses, which is why the Prophet Sallallahu said, رُبَّ قَرِئَ أَنِّ الْقُرَانِ وَالْقُرَانِ يَلْعَنُهُ Maybe a man's reading the Qur'an and the Qur'an's cursing him. <laughs> right? Because Allah says, عَلَىٰ إِنَّ لَعْنَةُ لَعَنَةُ كَاذِبِينَ Isn't it that the la'na of Allah is on the, those who lie? If you're reading the Qur'an and you're a liar, you're reading a curse on you. Uh, interestingly enough, that that's all of the uh, the diseases. Um, just this last thing here, he says, to treat it with the same treatment that you do with kibar, which we already went through, and then also knowing that with the knowledge that uh, that one's purpose in doing it is to humiliate somebody else. That's the reason you make istihza with another person, is to humiliate them. Yet, by doing that, a person is humiliating himself with Allah and is recompensed with ignorance. Allah says, لَا تَنَعْبَزُوا بِرَالْقَابِ You know, don't throw uh, uh, names at one another, don't make fun of each other. And... Uh, So, so that's, uh, and then that you'll be recomp recompensed with evil. Now the next uh, and final section on this one is he goes into a comprehensive treatment plan for the diseases of the heart, right? <laughs> Actions that purify the heart, the root cause of the heart's diseases, the source of good and bad character, and then treatment with dhikr of Allah. Um, so, inshallah, we'll, those that will be the last sections. And then, like I said, basically, uh, that we've covered that whole section. Oh, there's one more thing before we end the class. I'm glad I remembered this. Does anybody know the, the uh, seven deadly sins? Any ex-good Catholics in here? <laughs> Okay, pride, there's an order, are you going in order? No, pride is not, pride is arrogant. Yeah. Anger. That's not the three. I know, but it's not three. Envy. Not, it's not, gluttony is not sloth. sloth. Good. <laughs> Greed. Gluttony. And lust. Now, 
of all these diseases, which ones did he cover? He covered pride. He covered anger. Envy. Kasal. Laziness. Greed. Now, did he cover those two? He did? Yeah, there, he deals with the cause. But he doesn't deal with it as a disease. Right? He talks about a cause. But he doesn't talk about the disease of Shahua in there. Right? Now, why do you think those two weren't dealt with? Because Shahua is also good. That's a good point. These both are fitra inclinations. And this is why even in the Catholic tradition, they were the last ones. These were considered worse than these two. Right? Now, Imam al-Ghazali deals with these two in an entire book that's been translated. And I would really recommend the book because it will augment this course that we did called Breaking the Two Desires. And it's actually two books. And one of the books is translated by um, Abdul Hakim Winter, T.J. Winter. It's a brilliant translation uh, with a lot of really good notes also. But he deals with these two separately. And he calls it Kasur al-Shahwatayn, breaking the two desires of gluttony and lust. Breaking the two desires of gluttony and lust. Gluttony is fuel for lust. In other words, gluttony, uh, lust generally will follow gluttony. Not necessarily so causally, but generally. Um, even people that do a lot of uh, fasting and so, can still have trouble with that. But generally, you can break it that way. Um, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned for the young people who weren't able to, they couldn't afford to get married, he said, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالصِّيَامِ Then you should fast. فَإِنَّ لَهُمْ فَإِنَّ لَكُمْ وِجَاءَ Because it's, it'll act like a, the wija was a little uh, bag that they put on the, the, uh, the goat so that it wouldn't uh, impregnate other goats. You know, it's like, it'll act as a, it'll kind of repress uh, that desire. So, so gluttony and lust are two uh, problems, right? Um, but they're fitra problems, right? Hunger and the desire for food is, is part of human nature. And what one has to do is learn to control it. And then lust is uh, also, it's part of human nature. It's a natural inclination of human beings. And the, and the way to work with these two is balance. Not to eliminate them. You don't want to eliminate uh, shahwa and you don't want to eliminate shahiyah. They're from the same root. Desire for food, desire for sex. They're, they're not meant to be eliminated. They're meant to be uh, controlled. That's all. And, and the book is worth uh, reading. But I just wanted to mention that about that. Because if you look at the, out of those seven, uh, the first five uh, he deals with and they're really important. But, uh, but those two... He doesn't really go into any detail. He does mention uh, uh, shahwa uh, in, in relation to causes and things like that. I <laughs> وصلي اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالم إن تحمل المجيد اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم انشر علينا رحمتك وانزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله 
ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلي اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله we're coming to uh, a closure on the diseases now and what he's going to deal with now is actually a general mm, a general or comprehensive treatment plan for the diseases of the heart so he says wa qabbu aw qabbu aw qabbu this is that it goes all three ways wa qabbu amrad al qulub al jami'u lahunna nahyu an nafsi amma tatfa'u that the treatment plan that's comprehensive al jami'u for the heart's diseases is to prohibit the self from its own desires coupled with and then he gives us wa saghabun والسهر الليالي والصمت والفكرة وهو خالي coupled with hunger, vigilance in the night, silence and meditation in private now he says رحمه الله that in order to treat the self or the, the heart itself you have to prohibit the self from what it desires now there's a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu said لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به in other words none of you truly believes until his hawa his caprice or his desire is in accordance with what I have brought so in other words the way you purify your heart all those things are haram the diseases that he just mentioned so they're not in accordance with what Allah and His Messenger have given us as guidance. So Allah's Messenger وسلم, said the Iman is not complete. In other words, your heart is not sound until your Hawa, the desire of your heart, is in accordance with, with what I brought, which is Huda. And the way that you do that is by prohibiting it from those very things that aren't in accordance with it until you no longer desire them. And that's the idea of uh, the nafs is like a infant if you neglect it it grows up loving to suckle but if you wean it it loses its desire because the child there's people in this culture that, that like lecho leak they breastfeed until four or five years old the child keeps desiring it right and they just keep going but if you if you wean a child at two years or even a year or half a year whatever age uh, you wean a child I mean Sharia prefers that it goes to two years and there's a wisdom in that and there was actually a study done in Israel that proved this is just a sidetrack that proved that uh, they did a statistical analysis of breastfeed children breastfed children and children that weren't breastfed and correlations in statistics are always the problematic aspect of it but they found that there was a, uh, 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 an increase in the IQs by three points for every month of breastfeeding. That, that's what they found. And, and, and I mean, there's obviously a lot of variables in a study like that. But I thought it was interesting because the Prophet said in a hadith, uh, uh, beware of the, uh, uh, he, he said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْحَمْقَى فَإِنَّهَا تُغَذِّي uh, beware of the wet nurse who's not very intelligent because she's she's nourishing the brain right so that traditionally they used to look for sagacious people uh, to hire as wet nurses and things like that and obviously Halima and really fascinating thing about Halima Sa'diya read her hadith if you don't know Arabic read her hadith and it's one of the most sophisticated uh, Arabic that, Every collection of hadith that has that hadith in it, they always have to comment on all the words she uses because they're so difficult. Right? I mean, her, she was incredibly eloquent. 
Alayhi has salam. She's the mother of uh, the Messenger of Allah. Allah wa akbar. So, uh, so that's what he's telling us. And that's where you get in the Quran when the Quran says, Rabbi, وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنَ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى The one who نَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنَ الْهَوَى The one who fears Allah, the Maqam of Allah, and then actually prevents him, himself from doing what it desires. Right? From doing what it desires. So that is something, it's mujahada, qama al nafs, literally suppressing the nafs desire. And this is self discipline. Mandana nafsuhu. You have to discipline the soul. If you discipline the soul, you'll be happy. If you don't discipline the soul, you'll be miserable. And in this culture, you look at all the self help, all the things, it's all about people who can't control themselves. And that's why Islam gives us prayer to learn how to, uh, be, to become disciplined in our time and in our days. It gives us uh, washing, becoming disciplined in cleanliness and ritual. It gives us uh, the, um, uh, Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidina Muhammad, fasting, which is all about learning discipline, of disciplining the tongue, disciplining the stomach, the genitals, all of the things. That, that Islam brings, it really relates to learning how to discipline yourself. Because I guarantee you, if you don't have discipline about time, you won't pray on time. You have to have some, in order to pray on time, you have to, especially in this culture, because uh, you don't have the adhan, and you don't have mosques everywhere. So you really have to keep that in mind. It's, it's, it's actually, uh, it's so easy. Whenever you go to the Muslim world from here, it's amazing how easy it is. Uh, to pray. Incredible. This is a huge difference. Whereas here, there's a vigilance you have to maintain. But that's still a, a, a disciplining aspect. So you have to discipline the soul, the tongue, learning how to say stop. You know, learning how to, when you desire to backbite, catching yourself. I don't want to do this. You have to learn to do that. It's, it's, it's a process. And, and, and if you do it enough, it'll get to the point where you're not doing it anymore. And that's where the hawa becomes in, in accordance with what the messenger brought. Taba'ani ma to be. So that's what he's telling us. Now, then he gives us the way to do that. Right? How do you... Okay, what are the key things that the, 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 the soul wants? Right? Sahab, hunger. In other words, the stomach, kasra shahwatain. The stomach, by getting the stomach, you get the genitals as well. The stomach is the key uh, impulse of people. In other words, if you can learn to control your food, and this is why one of the salaf, according to Imam al-Qashiri, said, for me to raise my hand from the plate while I'm still hungry is better than spending the whole night in prayer. Because that, if he can discipline that aspect of himself, everything else will be easy. Because it's very... Uh, and people, you watch people who don't get food. Right? Have big food nuffs. Right? Food nuffs. There's some people have really big food and if they don't get food, they start getting angry, right? They'll blame it on hypoglycemia. No, there are people that do really have that. So I'm not going to make fun of that. But, but you know, there's people that get uh, really angry that the food's not on time. You see them at restaurants, waitresses, and waiters have to deal with that all the time. Where's my food? You know, well, <laughs> there's uh, 500 other people in the, in the place and we do have a number. And you came in to us and, you know... It just take time. People don't have that time. They have to wait. That's why fast food, right? Go to the box. Get It's fast food. That's America. Quick, I need it now. Give me my food. And this is the infantile nuts. Because the baby, the first thing it does, ah, what's it want? Food. The mother, the milk starts flowing when they hear the uh, baby scream, right? So the baby is screaming because it wants food. And when it gets the breast, it just goes into a state, complete relaxation, and the world is wonderful. And so that is the infantile nuff. Right? And, and this is what ha- you have to, and I have to, all of us have to discipline in our souls the idea of being able to do without food and not getting grumpy about it and not worrying about it and recognizing you're not going to die from missing a meal. You, you will not die from missing a meal. People say, I'm starving. You're not starving. Really, you're not starving. I mean, there are people that are starving, they're dropping dead. Really, there's people all over the place uh, that are actually, they are hungry. And that's part of what, you know, sahab, and that's why the early uh, 
shiyuch, all focused on hunger more than anything else. This does not mean become anorexic. All they're saying is learn to discipline yourself, right? You really, if you eat, I mean, two meals a day is enough. I guarantee you. Two meals a day is enough. You don't need more than two meals a day. Morning, late afternoon. That's all you need. If you want morning, afternoon, then something light at night. But three meals a day. And one of the amazing things uh, in the... uh, There is a a man uh, who... He was... um, Allahumma sari'a ala Sayyidina Muhammad. He was from Yemen. He was actually a Hanifi from Bani Hanifa. Uh, and I can't, his name I can't recall right now. He came to the Prophet وسلم, and uh, the Prophet gave him, it's in Al Bukhari, the Prophet gave him seven, uh, he gave him a bowl of milk and he drank it. And uh, the Prophet said, Would you like more? He said, Yes. And he kept giving it to him seven bowls. He drank all seven. And then after that, he became Muslim the next day and he came back and he could only drink one and all the Sahaba were amazed because the night before they saw him drink seven and that night they only saw him drink one and he was he was tough you know desert Arab and they asked the Prophet what's the wisdom in that and he said Al-Mu'minu ya'kuru uh, Al-Kafiru ya'kuru min sab'ati am'a that the Kafir eats from seven intestines but the mu'min only eats from one. So iman actually will decrease your appetite. Now obviously I don't want people to get worried about. So hunger is, uh, is a big, big one. Now obviously uh, in that early community that, you know, another interesting thing to point out something really important. People eat much more now common people than they've ever eaten at any other time in history. All right, there is a massive surplus of food. Traditionally, they were not able to produce food, and a lot of this is agro business. Uh, there's people are eating meat now that never used to eat meat. You ask any people who are from immigrant countries, even people from this country, right? Um, because people, African American people who are from the South, uh, know about what they call soul food which was all the leftovers of hogs um, because people were very poor and they couldn't afford uh, to buy um, meat, even pig meat, right? And the same is true in most Muslim countries. You ask your grandparents if they're still alive, how often did you eat meat? And if they weren't from a wealthy family, they probably ate meat maybe once a week if they were city dwellers, if they lived outside of the cities and villages and things like that, even less than that. And I've asked many, like Yemenis and things, some of them, they would eat meat only on their ease. Right? So, meat consumption has increased massively. Uh, and everything else. And even pe- people in this country uh, who are older will remember that, yeah, there's people in this country that can remember that you just didn't have snacks all the time. Children didn't have access to all that stuff. You ate, you know, at times that you were supposed to eat and other times off limits. And there weren't convenience stores everywhere where you can go and buy a Coke and buy... So this is all part of the modern culture which is making people more like animals. Because what if you notice about the animal, it grazes. And Allah mentions that these people are like an am. They just graze. In fact, there's, they put them in these some of these... Uh, co-op type stores, you know, no grazing. They have a little sign there where, where they have open things with bulk food. No grazing, you know. <laughs> and, and so people have become grazers. They, in the sociologists call them food contacts and they say like average American has 20 food contacts a day. In other words, during the day they're going to have food 20 different times throughout the day. And there's even people who recommend that now, having these smaller meals throughout the day as a healthier way. If you go into all the traditional cultures, they have meals specific times and they don't, they don't eat between meals. One, they're 
There's no refrigeration, things like that. And so they're much more disciplined about those things. You know, you take a Bedouin from Mauritania, they can go days without food. Very little food. Because they're disciplined in that area. People here, it's interesting, in the American army, they have now hot food. All you have to do is uh, pour uh, water on it and they've got these things with chemical reactions and it becomes hot. And they not only that, they have for Indian, like Sikhs and things, they have Indian curries in the army now, right? And for the different ethnic groups, they actually you can request different sea rations and things like that. And this is all completely, it, it destroyed their army. There's no fortitude there, there's nothing. They're, they're just going to be complete. Uh, and then the other thing about the American army now is they need, for every one man in field, they need 17 men to back them up. Right? 17 to maintain. And they plan by the year 2003 or something to have every American soldier have a personal PC. A personal PC. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, that, it's unbelievable, but that's a whole other thing. Anyway, the point is, is about food. Is that if you, if, if you have Muslims... Fasting is discipline. The Muslims can deal with, with uh, times when there won't be food just from the fasting. They're used to not eating during those periods. Now, one of the things about Ramadan that's been ruined uh, is that Muslims eat more in Ramadan than they eat in other times. And there are Muslims that will spend the whole night eating because I've seen it. It's, I'm not joking. There are Muslims that will literally, the night becomes not for ibadah, for it a lot. It just becomes uh, eating uh, and huge feasts and things like that and all these things. Traditionally, they, you know, I mean, if, in, if you invite people over, you want to feed them and things like that. We've gotten into these walima, extravagant things, and, and so a person can't even invite somebody over unless they make this massive thing. And all these things is one of the, you know, things that the Prophet Elijah warned us against doing all these things. And, and he used to feed his guests sometimes with dates and water. Right? I mean, you don't have to do that, but they're, they're, you know, it's, you, you shouldn't expect things when you go to people's houses. Don't expect this extravagant thing. Be content with what they bring and don't see it as an insult or anything like that because there's people that don't want it to be extravagant. And if they're misers, have a good opinion of them anyway. But maybe they want to follow the sunnah. It's always good to have a good opinion of people. So, in any case, you don't lose. So, hunger, I mean, there, there's a lot about that. But in terms of, for us, what, what I would recommend personally is if you do have a problem with food then begin to discipline yourself begin to lower the portion preferably eat uh, together because if you eat alone you'll eat more there's less baraka the more people at the plate the more baraka descends the less food you need and people who know that know that if you, if you eat from and one of the things about Sheikh Khatri when he went back to Mauritania somebody asked him like one of the, what was one of the strangest things he saw or tell him about the strange thing he said one of the things that shocked him the most was they all eat from separate plates he, he that just completely shocked and, and and when he was telling these people that they were all saying Keith you know like <laughs> like they couldn't understand it like how would they do that when well, he said everybody takes their own portion and goes through and they were like they just couldn't imagine it just seemed so bizarre to them to do that and he said he said, so many times I made a fool out of myself because they put a big plate there and I start eating from it. And then they'd all come up with their small plates. <laughs> you know, so really, it, it, eat together. You know, it's good for the family to eat together and things like that. There's barakah in it. You eat with the people, there's more barakah. And then also, just to, you know, to control yourself, to eat uh, preferably two meals. I mean, if you really, if you can't do that, then just don't eat real heavy meals. Just eat enough. And also, the better the food is, the less you'll need of it. So, the food that these people eat, part of the reason why they eat so much, and I guarantee you, if you go to a, a, a restaurant in this country, they give, they put down in front of one person what ten people would eat in West Africa. I guarantee you. Ten people. And most of them clean their plates. So, uh, you know, the portion of food, if it's good food, you'll need less. 
If it's bad food, you're going to eat more and it won't, the, you know, it won't. And by good food and bad food, I mean food that's nutritious, you know, good grain food, vegetables, things like that. If you're eating all these empty type foods, fast food type thing, I wouldn't even eat in a fast food restaurant. I wouldn't even go near one of those places. Even if it's a mick fish burger or whatever it is, I wouldn't. Uh, And they say it's more nutritious just to eat the stuff that it came in. Like the, <laughs> the, the cardboard box. <laughs> Throw the thing, the hamburger out. <laughs> They're more rough than you know. <laughs> Allahumma wa thaqna. You know, uh, if you want to bring the heart to life, give the night some time. And uh, they say even if it's two rakats, you know, that uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali bin Maliki said, don't leave uh, Qiyam even if it's just two rakats. And she, one of the things that Sheikh Wabd al-Khadim, Allah says, is that in this age where it is difficult for a lot of people to do these things, don't, you know, it's worse to try, like one night you get up and you pray uh, ten rakats and you read longer surahs and these things, maybe you spend an hour, or half, but then the next night you don't do it, or the night after that you don't do it, or whatever. It's, that, it's better to get up just five minutes before the, the, the prayer and just pray two rakats consistently every night. Just, just make a habit. Consistently do give, give some prayer to the night. And to do it consistently and, and you'll get a result. But it, it, if, you, if you do a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit, it doesn't get you results. See, the Ahmed Zarro says it's like drilling a little bit here, a little bit there. You'll, he said you'll never get water. Right? So, some uh, portion to uh, prayer. And a few things just uh, about the prayer. The Prophet Sallallahu when he went to Medina, uh, Abdullah bin Saddam, uh, anhu, the rabbi who became a Muslim, he said that, the, the, that he gave a khutbah there when he first came, descended upon Quba, and he said, Ya yuhan nas afshu salam, spread peace, greetings of peace and peace amongst yourself. Afshu salam, wa at'imu ta'am, and feed other people food. Wa sallu bil and pray in the night when others are sleeping you'll enter Jannah without any difficulty now just look at the, how easy that is just in terms of, uh, of the statement spread peace, don't be a dissembler see somebody who unifies people brings them together uh, keeps those in feed other people, be generous in other words, all the things that go with that. Because if you feed them, you're concerned about them. You know, you, so, so be concerned about others. Spread peace, be concerned about others. And then take care of your own soul. You know, think, correct yourself. If you do those things, that's a tadkhulu is a jawab sharp. If you do those things, that's the that's the that's the condition, halal. That's all. Just that one hadith. If we took that one hadith, every one of us, and just made that a practice, that's a guarantee from the Messenger of Allah. You'll enter paradise. And one of the occasions, and they said about a man who uh, who used to do some things during the day, but he prayed at night. He says, "Satanhahu." It'll stop him if he keeps doing it. On the other hand, there's another hadith quite frightening about a woman who used to pray at the night and give sadaqa and the mes- and but she was mean to her neighbors. Can it the can it She used to uh, uh, be foul to her neighbors, and he said he is not. And it's a sahih hadith. She's in hell. And then another one. They said they don't pray at night. They don't give sadaqa. They don't do other things. But he's good to his neighbors. So, that you can get up and do all the night prayers you want. If you don't have good character, forget it. All right? So, put things into perspective, you know. But, uh, tahajjud is a big thing, right? And, and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, 
has has uh, encouraged that for all the believers. Um, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Woman and lady, that the hajjid be nafid at the neck, asa and yabatika rabbuka maqam and mahmuda." And from the night, spend some portion of it in tahajjud as a nafila, right? Extra act. And perhaps your Lord will raise you to a praiseworthy station. So, doing those, it will help purify the heart. And Allah says about those people, the Mu'minun, تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَبَاجِعِ They're people who will raise their sides up in the night when they'd rather sleep. So, sleep is something the nafs loves. It loves sleep. We all like sleep. Sleep is something the nafs loves. And that's why to prohibit the nafs, not all night, you don't want to go into a psychotic state, you know, you don't deprive yourself of sleep and things like that. You put it into balance. And just in the same way, when they say hunger here, they're not talking about, you know, the Buddha where his spine's showing because his stomach, there's not, you know, there's a, they call it the starving Buddha. It's a, it's a famous statue or picture of the Buddha. That's not, we're not those people, right? That's not our tradition. Uh, the point is, is that you, you learn to control your food now. The same with the night prayers. It's not that you spend the whole night in, in, in prayer. There was a ta'ifa amongst the sahaba that spent a good deal of the night in prayer. Not the whole night. A good deal of the night in prayer. That was a ta'ifa from amongst them. A, a group, ta'ifa according to Rabbi Isbahani is less than a thousand. So there was a, a number of the sahaba that were spending a good deal of time. But not all of them were doing that. And the famous hadith about, uh, 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 about the man who, who the Prophet said, here's a man uh, for paradise, and, and uh, he, you know, one of the Sahaba followed him and asked if he could keep coming to him. He didn't just see him doing anything. And so he asked him, what are you doing? He said, all, all I know is I, every night before I go see, I make sure I don't have any rancor in my heart towards any Muslim. So he wasn't praying at night, he wasn't fasting, he wasn't doing anything. And, and, and so... You know, that not all of the Sahaba were praying all night. But Allah says about a group of them, There was a, a small group of them, they didn't used to sleep at night. In one uh, recitation. In another recitation, uh, That uh, they only slept a small portion of the night. It can be both, interpreted both ways. So the point is, is that for some people that was their practice. For us, I think what's, what's, uh, rational and reasonable is to just have some steady practice of doing something. What Walid al Khadim says is it's good to do the short suwar now that have a lot of reward with them because of the nature of the age. And I mentioned last night about either al Ishruna min Sha'bana walat fawasala sharba laylika bin nahari. You know, when, when your life is coming towards an end, you know, start, start trying to get as much actions as you can. So he actually recommended even just doing Qurhu Allahu Ahad ten times, even short rakats, and getting a lot of reward for that. So even if you do short rakats, if you make it your practice to do that some portion of the night, and you happen to oversleep until Fajr, then it is still permissible and acceptable as to Hajjud to pray before you pray your Fajr prayer. Right? So in other words, if you practice to pray ten rakats, and you wake up one time late, then just get up and pray those ten rakats before you do your Fajr prayer. As long as you won't miss your Fajr prayer or the, is, is, uh, the Isfar comes in. There's still some darkness. And you can pray them, you can pray ten rakats easily with Qulhu Allahu Ahad, with Tumatnina in, in, in uh, seven or eight minutes. They're not, I mean they won't be fast. They'll be reasonable rakats. And you can do that in maybe ten minutes. There's enough time to do that. A minute, a uh, 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 rakah. Mm-hmm. If for women who can't pray, then uh, if if it's perfectly uh, acceptable, like to uh, get up in the night and you know you can you can read something that's beneficial or uh, you know meditate, whatever you want to do. Do some uh, adaya, some some duas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could do it in every rakat. Or, I mean, the ones that have a lot of benefit, either Zulzirat al Ardu Zulzaraha, Qurhu Allah Wahad, the Mu'awidatain, Qur'a'udhu Birab Firaq, Qur'a'udhu Birab Bin Nas, 
uh, uh, لِإِلَافِ قَرَيْشَ الْحَاكِمُ تَكَاثُرُ uh, You know, those surahs the Prophet ﷺ used a lot. وَالتِّينُ وَالزَّيْتُونَ Another one. مَرَبْتَرْ حَاجِهِ Recite all the time إِذَا زُلْزِلَةَ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا He recite that one and وَضُوحَا وَالْلَيْدِ إِذَا سَجَا I mean, he doesn't, it's a bid'ah to do the same one in every rakat in a farb. You shouldn't make it a practice to do. Uh, and there's some khilaf about this. Uh, like the Shafi'is, I think they'd permit it. Um, the Madakis would be considered a bid'ah. So don't, you know, you have to be careful if you say it's a bid'ah. For some imams it might be a bid'ah. For other imams it might be acceptable. But for him, Imam Madak, it's a bid'ah to say, do qurhu Allahu ahad for every maghrib prayer. Whereas, uh, you know, I've seen in, in uh, Sheikh Abdullah al-Haddad, one of his treatises, he mentioned that it was a good thing to do. And there is a hadith that one of the Sahaba did that. So, uh, be, you have to be a little careful with those things. Um, and there's another hadith also about Sayyidina Abdullah bin Omar, who once walked by and the Prophet said, نِعْمَ الرَّجَلُ لَوْ كَانُوا يَقُومَ اللَّيْلُ What an excellent man would, and that's how it's interpreted, would that he spent some time at night praying. He didn't mean what a good man he would be if he prayed at night. The Sahaba, the, the ulama have negated that, although that could be understood in the statement. He said, Layla, you know, would that, Layta, Layta who can yaqum al But when he said, Ni'mar Rajal, Abdullah ibn Allah, so, which the ulama took from that certain understanding. One, is that a person be good even if he doesn't pray at night, like Abdullah. But how much better would he be if he prayed at night? And so, the mu'min who hears that desires kamal. And so, Abdullah ibn Umar, when he heard that, and he actually narrates the hadith to his uh, son, when he heard that, he never left after that once, qiyam al-layl, ever. There are also the ulmah he a proof that it's permissible to praise somebody who won't be affected by ujab. Like Abdullah ibn Umar, the Prophet knew وسلم, that it wouldn't, had he heard that, it would actually encourage him to do more, which it did. Because had he been mu'jab, he would have said, oh, well, I don't need to do qiyam al-layl, I'm already so good. And, <laughs> and then also the famous hadith of Aisha radiallahu anhu, which is a sahih hadith, in which the Prophet used to pray so much, sometimes he got some cracking and edematous, uh, a little bit of edematous swelling in his, uh, what they call venous stasis, the blood. If you stand so long, uh, your feet can get swelled up a little bit, which is why people that have jobs sometimes, like uh, nurses often wear s- certain stockings that actually keep the blood, help the blood go back up because you can get that thing. And so it, it happens to people. And But he did that and Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, why do you do this when your Lord has forgiven you everything you did in the past and the future? And he said, أَوَلَمْ أَكُنْ عَبْدًا shakura." Shouldn't I be a grateful servant? In other words, you know, that, that should make me want even more by that fact, to show gratitude. So it is a way of showing gratitude to Allah. And the ulama say that that hadith indicates that one of the greatest ways of showing gratitude to the ni'm of Allah is to do some at night work. So, sahr al-layali. And then they say, مَنْ طَرَبَ al yeah. Whoever seeks high things uh, spends his night uh, uh, awake. And also for learn that people who are students, the night is the best time. The night before, the best time, uh, if, if Fajr happens at this time, then what you need to do is you would divide uh, 12, you would divide it into six parts from Maghrib, from Maghrib to Fajr, right? So it's going to be uh, every two hours, right? Is that right? No, I'm going to do... That's right, right? That's right. So, each one of these would be two hours. 
there. This portion is the best portion for uh, Qiyam al-Layl, the last sixth of the night. So for now, if it's 6 p.m., 6 a.m., I'm just making it easy because I'm not very good at fractions. Um, then one sixth, right, is going to be the two hours. So if it's at 6, from 4 to 6 uh, p.m. is going to be the best time to do that night work. Although any time after Isha is considered Qiyam al-Layl, right? And some say after Maghrib. So even if you did, if you, because some people are different. If, if you're a, if you have like heavy liver, it's very hard to get up in the morning. All right? And so uh, you can do that before you go to bed. Do some, some rakats before you go to bed. But you should do some rakats in the night. Um, the other thing for some people is, interestingly enough, it's actually easier to get up uh, uh, like now, it would be like about 4 or 3 o'clock. Much easier to get up than it would be right before Fajr. That sleep right before Fajr is recognizably the heaviest sleep of the, of, of the, which is a hikmah from Allah. And it's actually the point where the cortisol levels are the highest. The hormones uh, in the brain actually are the highest at that point. Uh, so, and Ibn Atayilah, Rabbi Allah, said that the hikmah of that is that Allah wants you when it's most difficult to be able to snap out of that sleep. Um, so uh, it's actually easier to get up before that time. So anyway, that that's uh, and then obviously eight or twelve. Muhammad had said ten. There's a hadith of Aisha eight and ten is a, a sahih hadith as well. So I was told ten is the best. But two, four, six, eight, ten, and then Shafa and Watar. Better it's done after Aisha. Unless you are somebody that by your nature you get up every uh, night and don't have any problem with it, then uh, you can wait. But Sayyidina Abu Bakr, who was very strong and did night prayers, most definitely used to pray before he went to bed. Mm-hmm. What, what, do you have to get up in the morning if you're staying up late and pray? What, what do you mean? Like you have to sleep for a while and then get up. No, you don't. I mean, obviously it's better. You know, to, to actually sleep and then get up. Because the Prophet said that was the best way, is the way Dawood did it. He would sleep some, get up some, go back, sleep some, get up some. That's harder on the cell than to do that. And he did that as his fast during every other day. So it's the same idea. And that's real mujahada. That's complete control over your nafs. Because it's hard to go to sleep and then get up. Once you're, and then shaitan, a'udhu billah, uh, never forget you know, always remember he's around as well. So shaitan ya'qidu uqda, uqad tarafa. He will bind three knots on your head at night in, in the unseen world. And he'll say, amamik laylun tawil. You have a long night, especially in winter, obviously, right? Amamik laylun tawil. Right? You have a long night. Just relax. And then you go to bed. And those three knots they, they're heavy. The Prophet said, if you wake up and you and you say like Subhanaka, Alhamdulillah, Ladi Ahyani Ba'dam Matani Wa Irayn Nashur, one of one of the du'as of waking up, that the first knot gets un, un, unlocked. If you get up and do wudu, the second lock gets uh, knot gets unlocked. If you untied, if you if you do some prayer then the third is, and you're freed from those knots. If the Prophet Sallallahu said, مَنْ نَامَ حَتَّى أَنْ يُصْبِحَ No, he was asked about a man who نَامَ حَتَّى يُصْبِحَ Which is a sign the Sahaba didn't used to do it. He said, ذَاكَ رَجُلٌ بَعْلَ شَيْطَانُ فِي أُذْنِ That's a man whose shaitan urinated in his ears. Now, that's actually anybody who doesn't pray night prayers. I mean, shaitan is taking your ear as a toilet bowl. That's, that's what it means. So, we should not want that, really. I mean, not, not to make light of it, because it's a hadith. We, we shouldn't want that. So, the way to get out of that is at least do something. 
you know, get up in the, in the night just something and do some uh, rakat for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah give us tawfiq to do that. And uh, the other thing about that, some of the ulama said it means haqiqatan, that shaitan literally urinates. In, 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 in the ear. There is haqiqah. And, and al haqiqah, in, there's a qaida that, uh, al haqiqah la tusraf illa al majaz, illa baroratan. That you don't take the haqiqah to the, the, you don't take the literal meaning to a metaphorical meaning unless it's, there's a necessity to do that. So that's why some of the ulama said there's not a necessity. It says that that a rajulun that a shaytanu qad that a shaytanu fi uzani or uzane. So some interpreted it metaphorically and said what it means is that he uh, he prevents them from all the khair, the good that comes out of doing something at night. But that's what it meant. Wallahu ta'ala mm-hmm. الحمد لله الذي أحياني بعد أن ماتني وإليه النشور بعد ما يا بعد ما أماتني وإليه النشور and then also uh, I haven't been able to do this but مرض الحال always there's there's a hadith that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم recited the end of Ali Imran uh, when he woke up and you know, I spent many, many nights in Murat al-Hajj's tent every single night when he'd get up. And he always got up. When, when I was there, he usually got up probably about four, sometimes five hours before Fajr. And, and always, that was, he, he'd wake you up reciting those, so that, uh, those ayahs. And he did it every single time. مثابرة. آه the eyes say إن في خرق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار دعاية لأول الألباب. those الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعدا على جونهم ويتفكرون في خرق السماوات والأرض. ربنا ما خطقت هذا باطلا. and I can hear him saying that. Yeah. and he you know إن شاء الله الله يجزيه توفيق. it's all توفيق from الله. You know, to be able to do that. It's a gift from Allah. And the thing, I would be that the thing that prevents us from Qiyam al and these things is uh, riba, you know, eating haram things, all, all that. That's what stops it. Because this is a gift from Allah. And people that have done it in their lives and then lost it, they know that the time that they were given that, it was a gift from Allah. And when it's taken away, it's, a, it's like a punishment. 
So you just make tawbah, ask Allah to give us inshallah all tawfiq. But it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, the, the people of uh, the qawm, they, they used to have so much muhasaba of themselves that whenever they were afflicted with something, they knew what caused it. And one of the ulama said, I once uh, uh, said something about somebody I shouldn't have said, and I was deprived to hajjud for 40 days because of it. So they, they could see like relations of why things happen. And another one, he said, uh, in the end of his life, he went bankrupt, and he said he realized it was from 40 years before he had once said to a man, Ya Muflis. And that's what he said. He realized that that was the source of, that Allah gave him what he had called that other man, pointed out his fault. So, Hasanat al Abrar Sayyat al Muqarrabin. You know, the good actions of righteous people are the bad actions of the. Mm-hmm. Alhamdulillah, uh, Alhamdulillah, means praise be to the one who brought me back to life after he had caused me to die, and to him is my gathering. I go back to him. Yeah. Just don't do the witr twice. In other words, if you do the witr, witr preferably should be the last prayer. That's just, that's the, that's the afdal. Right? But it's a fadila to do prayers after with her, you know, if you're able to get up. So if you go to bed, it's better to do your with her before, because with her should be done before fajr. And if you wake up and you forgot to, you can still pray it after fajr. But it's better done before fajr. And it's a sunnah mu'akkadah, it's a strong sunnah, it's wajib than the Hanafi madhab. So the sun, uh, the uh, the, the and with her should be done before you go to bed, and then if you get up before the night, you just don't pray the witr. You would do two, two, two. Qiyam al-layl, mathna, mathna. The hadith says that getting up at night is two, two. Mathna, mathna. You don't do four, you do two, two. What's that? I didn't understand. <laughs> Yeah, I'm saying you can do tahajjud after witr. It's preferable to delay the witr to be the last prayer of the night. That is preferable. But it's perfectly acceptable. Put it this way. If, if, if you are absolutely certain, as certain as you can be in anything in this world, that you get up before fajr, then it would be preferable for you to delay your prayer to fajr. If you're somebody who's... Every night you wake up half hour or an hour before Fajr and you get up and you're able to pray your with her. If that's your practice and you're consistent in that and you're, com- you're confident in yourself that you can do that, it is better to delay the with her. If on the other hand you're somebody that you don't do that as a, as a constant practice, it is better to pray your with her before you go to sleep. Azam. Right? It's, it's better. Abbaq. And then if you get up at, during the night before Fajr, you, you do your tahajjud without finishing it with witr. Because you've already played witr and there's only one witr in the night. Do you understand? Huh? Oh, okay. In Greasy, Nahi Malum hai. Huh? That's all the order I know. <laughs> they say somebody went to, huh? They said this Afghani joke. They say Afghani, are you Afghani? No. They, they say Af- this American went to Afghanistan and he wanted to find the greatest spiritual teacher in Afghanistan because he heard that Afghanistan had all these spiritual things. So he went to that Afghani man and he said in English, like Americans do, assuming that they know English, he said, who's the greatest spiritual teacher in Afghanistan? And the, and the Afghani lady said, he said, Nami Fahman. <laughs> so he said, Nami Fahman. So he starts going around looking for Nami Fahman. And so he sees this, there's a funeral, right, going by. And he sees the funeral and there's all these people looking. He goes up to one of the Afghanis watching the funeral. And he said, who just died? He said, Nami Fahman. <laughs> so he said, I just missed him. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Nami Tahma means I don't know in Persian, right? And then another thing just about taking this easy and, and not getting uh Sheikh Habib said in, in his uh, in a Qasid, he said, What's the Dunasika Sabir al Rifti? لِكَيْ يَكُونَ سَيْرُهَا بِالشَّوْقِ فَإِنَّ رَكَعْتَيْنَ مِنْ مُحِبٍ أَفْضَرُ مِنْ أَدْفٍ مِنْ غَيْرِ حُبٍ He said that go the path of ease with yourself. In other words, don't wipe out yourself because you need yourself. You, you don't want to... Your horse has to get you to where you're going. So you treat your horse well. Don't overdo it, right? He's not saying don't be lazy, but don't wear your horse out so it can't take you anymore. Uh, in order for you to move along with yearning, you see, because if, you, if, you, if, if you're uh, not too hard on yourself, then yourself will do these things. Like if, if you try to stay up the whole night, that's too hard on the self. If you try to stay up half the night, it's too hard on the self. And so the self won't, it'll just lose its energy. Whereas if you start just doing a little bit, then there's a shock because you start tasting it and you get the benefit of it and then you desire it. So actually you're looking forward to it. The self begins to look forward to it. Right? And, and that's the, what he's saying. And then he says, because two rakats done from a lover is better than a thousand done without love. So if you do two rakats with shok, you want to desire, you, you really desire of Allah's pleasure. And he, if you do those two rakats, then Allah will love it. But if you're there doing, I have to do these and it's important and I have to, and you're doing that, that's, there's no love there. You're doing it with this idea in your head. So that's, the point is, is that it's out of a yearning for Allah that this should all come. Is it mahabba from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright? And then he says, wasamtu. Silence, one of the, obviously, led to uh, al-kalam. Kalam is ladhi for most people to speak. And that's why the Prophet said, man utiya, samta faqat utiya al-hikmah. Whoever was given silence, just as, as part of his nature, He's been given wisdom. There's a wisdom in being silent. Just in being silent. Even if he's an ignorant person. If he was given silence, he has a wisdom. Which is, if you're an ignorant person, don't make a fool out of yourself. If you have something to say, then, then in, in that case, speech is better than silence. If you have nothing to say, then it's, it's mubah. Right? But there's no, there's no benefit in it. It's just mubah. Now, if that mubah kalam is how are you, where have you been, this and that, that's fine. But if it's, did you hear about so and so, did you hear, then it moves to either makru or haram. And, and, and so, learning how to control the tongue uh, is, that, that's a big discipline. Uh, Imam, Sha, uh, Imam uh, Shafi'i, radhi anhu, said that when he was in a gathering and needed to say something, he always looked into himself to make sure that it, it, that he wasn't saying it out of a desire from his nafs to, to prove something or to show his knowledge. He checked first that is it acceptable to him that somebody else would say the same thing. And he said if he was aware of that, then he would say it. If he wasn't, he would remain silent as a tarbiya for his nafs. And he also said, Rabbi Allah, that uh, I never ar- had a debate with anyone except that I prayed to Allah. It, he made a dua that Allah would make the truth manifest on his opponent's tongue so that he could submit to it. Whereas he didn't want to win the debate. He would actually prefer to lose the debate so it would make him humble. And that, that's a rajan. I mean, that's, that's a man. So, that, that's, that's the point, is that uh, some... And the Prophet kind of asmat and nas. He was the most quiet of people. Wa ida takallama takallama bil haq. When he spoke, he spoke the truth. So he was not somebody who who was a, what's called farfar. And he said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, inna uh, inna abghadukum uh, inna abghadukum minni wa abghadukum idayya uh, yom al qiyama uh, uh, al farfarin al mutaf al mutakab." Huh? المتفهقين الثرثارين there's three things 
Farfarin, what Mutafehiqin is, is the last one. And they knew the Farfarin and they knew the second one. They didn't know the Mutafehiq. He said it was Mutakadar. Farfar is somebody that speaks a lot. Farfara, Yutharfiru. They speak a lot. So he didn't like people that just spoke all the time, right? Chatterbox, what they call Chatterbox. If you're teaching, if you're saying something useful, it's another thing. But if it's just Karam, for Karam's sake, then it's a waste of time. And Imam Malik radiallahu said about one man, one of his students, he said, نِعْمَ الرَّجَلْ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ يَتَكَلَّمُ كَرَامَ سَهْرًا فِي يَوْمٍ وَاحِدٍ He's a good man except he, he speaks a, a, a month's worth of, of talking in one day. And then, الفكرة وهو خالي فكرة means to وَهُوَ خَالِ means literally to be in a place where there's nobody around and you're reflecting and that's called meditation in English to meditate is a practice right not like a yogic or something like that but literally sitting and meditating and and basically there's different ways to do that and you get into different traditions within the tradition of Islam some will do a tafakkur fil mawt like doing Ahwal al-Qiyamah, which is a practice. So you can literally, you sit and you go through the, the Qiyamah, the visualization of going through the raising in the grave and these type things. Um, other is to do uh, tafakkur in the divine name. So you go through the divine name, right? Ya Allahu, Ya Rahmanu, Ya Rahimu, right? You go through the divine name and reflect on the attributes, things like that, right? So, fikra wa huwa khali is useful for the heart. And then, sahbat al-akhiyari ahl al-sidqi man yahtada bi haadihim wa nutqi. This is keeping the company of good people. And it comes from a Quranic injunction in which Allah says, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu, taqu Allah wa kunu ma'a sadiqeen. Have taqwa and be with the truthful ones. In other words, sahba. And this is what they call in Persia, sahbat. You know, keeping good company with the, uh, the, the righteous people in order to purify your heart. And Imam uh, Ibn Atayullah radiallahu anhu says in the Hikam, لا تصحاب إلا لا تصحاب من لا ينهبك حاله ولا يدلك على الله مقاله Don't take as a companion somebody whose state does not elevate you and his speech does not direct you to Allah. And Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says in his commentary, He's not talking about shiyukh, he's talking about your friends that you spend time with. In other words, you should find people that are going to elevate your state, not to bring it down. And by elevating your state, their state is elevated, so you become elevated. What it means is, is that their hal with Allah is that they're in a, sta- a good state, they're in a state of gratitude. So if you're with people in a state of gratitude, it's hard to complain around them. Right? You, you can't, because they're saying, Alhamdulillah, SubhanAllah, I feel really grateful, you know, I, SubhanAllah, Allahu Akbar, Allah has given us so much. And, and, and so you're sitting there going, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't agree with you, you know, I just, <laughs> life's tough and blah, blah, blah. It's, he's in a different hal from you. So if you're the one in shukr, don't be with the one in shakwa. And if you're in the one, you're the one in shakwa, desire to be with the one in shukr in order for you to become like him. So don't bring him down, let him bring you up. That's what it's saying. And then also that their speech directs you to a lot. There's people that if you did complain to them, they would say, Subhanallah, Allah says, وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمُهُ لَا تَحْصُوهَا if, if you try to enumerate his blessings, you can't enumerate them. That's for everybody. So maybe you should just try enumerating his blessings instead of looking at the, the trouble. So you change, they help you change your focus and remind you. And it's amazing how a person's state can be changed by just sitting with somebody who gives them good and sincere advice. Really, they can completely turn that heart around and a person who is completely black and negative because the, the, the effect of it was, was uh, useful and valuable, they change their perspective, and that's guidance. So you want that. Uh, and then, Sidi Abul Hassan, Rabbi Allah, said, مَنْ ذَلَّكَ عَلَى الدُّنْيَا فَقَدْ غَشَّكَ Whoever tells you to go to the world, he's cheated you. Right? So if they tell you, 
oh, you know what you should do with your life? You, you really want to do good financial planning and get, you know, this house and blah, blah, blah and all these and, and And that's their whole focus. They're indicating to you that, that, that he's cheated you because you could die at any moment. And this is why the example that I like to use is the example of, you know, if, if uh, there's two salesmen, there's, there's a salesman, right? And he comes and he says, I've got two houses for sale. One of them, if you buy it, the only problem with it is it could disappear at any time. And I can't tell you how long it's going to be around. Maybe 50 years. Maximum, it'll only be about 70 years. And then it definitely will disappear. But any time during that time, it could disappear. But I have another house that's going to last forever. And it's guaranteed. But it's more expensive. <laughs> so which one are you going to buy? Right? Seriously, which one are you going to buy? Any man with intellect or woman with intellect, they're going to buy the more expensive one. And that's akhira. And you buy it with your soul. It's for sale, you buy it with your soul. And the other one, you buy with your soul as well. But you buy it by destroying your soul, not by saving it. Come on. So, keeping good company with people and having them... And then he said... من غسل من ذلك على ومن ذلك على العمل فقد أتعبك. and the one who tells you oh quit doing lots of deeds and all these things he's just exhausted you. in other words if you think that you're going to get the jannah by your deeds you're going to exhaust yourself. ومن ذلك على الله فقد نصحك. but the one who indicates to how to get to Allah which means the contentment of Allah right that one he has given you sincere counsel. Because if you're content with Allah, a little action will be enough for you. But if you're not content with Allah, even if you do tons of action, it's not enough. And then he says, uh, finally taking refuge, and then he says, uh, To finally take refuge in the one unto whom all affairs return. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, to Allah, all the affairs return. So, seeking refuge in, in Allah, فَهُوَ طِبُّهُ الْأَنْفَعُ Of all these diseases, it's the best disease. And this is why Sayyid ibn Asha رضي الله عنه says, لَيْسَ الدَّوَى إِلَّا فِقْرَارِ لَهُ He says the only real cure for all these diseases is اِقْرَار مُطَّر To just go to Allah with complete, please, you know, I have to, change. I have, you have to help me change. And, and there has to be a real sense of urgency with Allah. And if, if that's the situation, then inshallah Allah will help us change. And, and for me personally, I know that I, I really believe that my coming to Islam was a result of a state that I got into before I was Muslim in which I was in that state. The complete matar. And, 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 I, and I called on Allah in the name that I knew, which is God, you know. But I asked God, just give me guidance, show it to me. And I was in a complete state of ittirar. And I can remember that. And most of the, the uh, people that I met who became Muslim, they, they will confirm that. That they had similar uh, states. That it was, it was really getting to a state of just absolute... Just show me what to do. And then that guidance just opened up, became very clear. Khalas. And then it, it's easy after that. So. I think that Allah is, is, is merciful and if there's sincerity with somebody, inshallah, that uh, even if in their own limited understanding of how they perceive... I mean, there's an apocryphal story and it's apocryphal, so I'm not going to, there's no aqidah based on it or anything, but it's a wisdom that's been told about, uh, uh, about the, 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 uh, Musa alayhi salam meeting the man, uh, who's, who's telling, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he just wants to wash his feet and give him a massage and do all these things, and he's, he's an anthropomorphist and he doesn't know, and Musa, uh, you know, scolds him and explains the real tawheed and, 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 and this and that and, 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 does, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
you know, reminds Musa that he was harsh on the man, and the man was saying those things out of love for Allah, but he was ignorant. And so you, the thing to do is teach the ignorant person, right? So, the, you know, the idea is that people, everybody is at the level that they're at. So even the one who's going to the idol, that's his understanding, and that's where he's at. And that's why Allah says, وَلَا تَجَعْلُ لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا Right? Don't make for Allah and dad what you And you know that it's wrong. So once knowledge comes to you, that's when Allah does not, uh, that's when shirk uh, destroys you. If you don't have any knowledge, then Allah, if He hasn't sent His messenger to you, He's not going to punish you. So if, if you don't know about Islam and, and, and you're asking for guidance, then tell that guidance come. Wallahu ta'ala alam. And then he says, بِأَنْ يَكُونَ كَغَرِيقًا أَوْ كَمَنْ ضَلَّ بِتِيهِمْ لَا يَرَى الْغِيَافَ مِنْ سِوَى الْمُهِيمِنَ الْعَظِيمِ الْقَدْرِ فَهُوَ الْمُجِيب دَعْوَةِ الْمُطَرِّ So here he's saying, you know, that you have to be like somebody who's drowning or someone lost in a barren desert and sees no source of succor except for the God. And this is what happened to Yusuf Islam. I heard him say this in a lecture he gave of how he became guided and he said he was drowning in, in uh, Malibu. That he was being pulled out by the undertow, which is really dangerous. And he actually said that he completely uh, called on God. He said, just give me guidance and, and I'll follow it. And I'll do whatever you tell me. And that's the gharik. You know, that's somebody like, they're a gharik. There's nothing else you can do. And that's why Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl, his guidance came on a boat. Right? In which there were Habashi Christians on the boat. <laughs> and, and it started, the waves started taking it, and they thought they were going to drown. And he started calling on Hubal. And these Christians were laughing at him. They said, you're calling on, on an idol made out of wood in Mecca to help you here? <laughs> and he said, it, he, re, he realized how stupid it was. That he could only call on Allah in that place. And then Tawheed came into his heart. So that's the idea of being like the one drowning. Right? And he says that in fact is the most beneficial. In other words, that really is the one that will help us. There, this must be to the point at which you are like a man drowning or someone anyway. So that's, that's that. Now, about... Uh, Okay. Then he says actions that purify the heart. Wamadihi lal qalbi sufun min amal anfa'uhu huwa al mudamu wa yaqil. So as for the act for action that is beneficial in purifying the heart. None is more beneficial than that which is consistent, even if it is slight. And this is from the hadith, خَيْرُ amal أَدْوَانْ بَهَا وَإِنْ The best actions are the continuous ones, even if they're a little bit. So, so he's saying the, the most beneficial, because what you're doing, you see, like, if I take, if I take a coin, and I, I polish it really hard for a few polishes, and then I put it down, you take the same coin and just very slowly, with not much pressure, polish it and just keep polishing it and keep polishing it and keep polishing it. It'll become bright and shiny. Whereas doing it once vigorously won't do the work that doing a little bit but continuously will do. And the heart, the, how it gets encrusted with wrong actions is the same situation. If you do a whole bunch at one time, it's like doing that vigorous rubbing. But if you do just a little bit, consistently, the heart over time, that crust begins to break off. And that's why a little bit done consistently is much better than a lot done. And the proof that the Sahaba, they were always consistent in their actions. In other words, even the man who asked the Prophet to fast, the fast of Dawood, he regretted it in his old age. 
But the ulama took that as a proof that they used to even consider the nafida something they wouldn't leave. Not because it was fault, but because it was something they had taken upon themselves to do. And if you read the hadith about the Prophet he used to fast so much we thought he never broke his fast, and sometimes he didn't fast that we thought that he never fasted, and then sometimes he used to stay so much in the night we thought he never slept, and other times he, he would be that we didn't think he did uh, much qiyam. Remember something very important about the Messenger of Allah. The Messenger of Allah is... He is the universal Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other words, his being is encompassing the possibilities of every good believer. So he, every good believer has in him a model. And there are people who do not have qiyam as one of the openings Allah gives them. There are people that won't have recitation of Qur'an as an opening Allah gives them. Their opening will be in hadith. There will be other people whose openings will be in sadaqah and they won't be in fasting. There are other people whose openings will be in fasting and it won't be in sadaqah. There will be some people whose openings are in uh, hikmah and it won't be in other things. So people, very few people ever have all of them. And this is why when the Prophet talked about the different gates of Jannah, and one of them was for the faster, there's a gate for the mujahideen, the different... He's, uh, Abu Bakr says, Ya Rasulullah, ayadkhulu ahadun hadihi al-abwaad kullaha? Does anyone get to go in all of them? And he said, Naam ya Abu Bakr, wa arju an takun minhum. There are people who do that, and I hope that you're one of them. And that was, they say, I hope he was. <laughs> but it's so no easier than things like that. In other words, keep working. And that's to all of us as well. So the point is, there will be people that have these broad-based tawfiq. But Imam Malik was somebody, he wore very nice clothes. He used the best scent. He liked the oud. He used to burn the oud. He was somebody that outwardly, when the zuhad looked at him, they thought he was very extravagant. And one of the zuhad wrote him a letter and said, I can't believe your state. Do you realize you eat the best flour, you wear all these fancy clothes, the perfume you have costs so much money, this and that. You would be better giving all that stuff up and spending less time with people. Because he used to teach a lot, so he was, he was talking in the masjid a lot. So the Zahid was telling him on Matic, you know, look, compared to me, you're in bad shape. <laughs> right? And this is my job. And Imam Malik wrote back to him an incredible letter. And he said, Ya Abdullah, right? Servant of Allah, I'lam, anna Allah qad fataha ala ibadihi min abwaab and shatta. Allah has opened up for his servants many doors of khayr. And he said, For min hum min fataha alayhi fa siyam. Wa min hum min fataha alayhi fa zaka, fa sadaqa. Wa min hum min fataha alayhi fa jihad. Wa min hum min fataha alayhi fa zuhud. وَمِنْهُمْ مِنْ فَتَحَ لَيْهِ فِي الْعِبَادَةِ وَمِنْهُمْ مِنْ فَتَحَ لَيْهِ فِي الْعِلْمُ وَالْتَعْلِيمِ And he said, فَأَنَا قَدْ رَضَيْتُ بِمَا فَتَحَ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ بِهِ He said, Allah, some you give an opening in fasting, some in charity, some in zakah, all these different things. He said, some in knowledge and teaching the people. He said, I'm pleased with what Allah has opened up for me. And he said, وَلَا أَحْسِبُوا أَنَّنِي فِي أَقَلَّ مَا أَنْتَ فِي I don't think that I'm in something less than what you're in. In other words, all your zuhud and your good state, he confirmed it. But he said, I don't think that what I'm doing is less than that. And that's not murjib, it's qawl al-haq. You know, it's telling somebody the truth. So the point being is, you know, where you see your facilitation, follow that. You know, follow that. And recognize that, you know, there are certain... No, there's limitations. We won't get tawfiq in everything, but inshallah we get tawfiq in something. And then, uh huh. Yeah, the door of humility. Yeah, zul wal wa 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 And then he says, وَعَمَلٌ عَنْكَ شُهُدُهُ أَفَعَلْ أَوْ لِحُبَابٍ أَوْ جَلَالًا إِنْ فَعَلْ Include action done in the absence of witnesses or action done for his love or in awe of him. So he's saying also that it's beneficial 
to do actions done uh, where there's no other people. That's good for the heart. Right? It's good for the heart. For instance, a lot of people, and you know, the, 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 but to give uh, ch- uh, charity, nobody knows. It's better. If you open it, na'ma, you know. It's a good thing. If you give charity openly, it's a good thing. But to give charity secretly is better. Right? Uh, to do prayers that people don't see is better. To do those five. It's better to protect yourself from riya. Right? And ujjah than these type things. Once Bishar al Hafi was walking, he was very uh, well known uh, Zahid. It's actually Bishar al Hafi. It wasn't Bishar al Hafi. Fubail ibn Iyab. Fubail ibn Iyab was once walking down a street. And uh, somebody said, there goes a man that spends the whole night in prayer. And immediately, Fubel heard it, he burst into tears. And he said, I can't remember ever spending one night uh, in prayer, all, the whole night. And he said, how honored Allah has, has, how great Allah has honored me by veiling me and making think, people think I'm better than I am. So, you know, that idea of, uh, of hiding and concealing the state, right, is better. And then action done for love. That's the highest action. They say there's two actions. He said, Mahabba or Jalal. Man khafa maqama rabbihi. It's a Jalal of Allah. It's not doing it out of fear of the punishment of Allah. Although that's one reason for doing action. It's the lowest one. And it still shouldn't be belittled because Allah tells us to have khawf. But if you have khawf maqam, it's, it's jalal. There's haiba. And you have a sense of haiba of Allah and how great Allah is. On the other hand, it's, it's the mahabba is from Allah's rahmah and, and the mahabba of Allah and, and yearning for Allah that you do things. That, that's the best one. And he tells you that the last maqam is mahabba. Maqam and mahabba is the highest one. وَعَمْرُ الزَّاهِدِ مِنْ أَسْكَ الْعَمَلِ بِعَسْفِ رَاغِبٍ فَسَعْيُهُ جَلًا Also, the purest of actions is done by someone free of worldly wants. The zahid, he's doing it not for anything. لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جِزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا We don't want thanks or gratitude. إِنَّمَا نُطَعْنُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ We're doing this for the sake of Allah. So that person is, is that's the highest action. There's no zahid, there's no tamah, even in akhirah or dunya is worse. But Akhirah, even in Akhirah, you just do it for the sake of Allah. That's the highest and best action for the heart. And, and, and zuhud is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is feeling, uh, it's a lack of want, that's what it is. The zahid is not like the ascetic. In Christianity they have the ascetic who like wears uh, harsh clothes, flagellation, all this type, does all the fasting and everything. The, in Islam, the ascetic is the one who the, the thing is not in the heart. That's why Abdurrahman bin Awf was a zahid, even though he is wealthy. And then he says, وَعَمْرَ الرَّاجِينَ أَسْنَ وَأَجَلْ مِنْ سَعِي مَنْ دَعَاهُ لِسْسَعِي الْوَجَلْ And the actions of those who strive out of hope are higher and more exalted than one who is compelled by fear. So if you're doing things, مَنْ كَانَ يَرْزُ اللَّهُ الْيَوْمَ الْآخَرِ You يَرْزُ الله. It's not يَخَاب الله. He said, وَلَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ لَي Iswatun Hasana. Right? You have in the Messenger of Allah the best example, Liman Kani Yarzullah, the one who hopes for Allah. I didn't say Liman Kani Yakhaf Allah. Because the Prophet said, he said, Ana Akshakum Lillah. But the Prophet is the Habib Allah. He, he is the lover of Allah, and, and Allah is, loves him. So that's, he loved Allah, and Allah loved him. Safahu Allah. So that's the high. And then he says, وَمَا تَعَدَّ نَفْعَهُ لِغَيْرِهِ أَوْ شَقَّ بِالنَّفْسِ كَصَوْمِ الشَّرِهِ Particularly action whose benefits extend to others. Action that benefits the heart. If it extends to others, it's very good. In other words, to give out in charity is, is a high action. Why? Because the benefit not only benefits you and your soul, but it benefits another human being. وَفِي كُلِّ كَبِدٍ رَطَبْ أَجَبْ in every moist liver, in other words, in every living thing, there's a reward. To actually feed animals to uh, uh, a place where birds eat. If you plant a tree, every animal that eats, bird that eats from that tree, till, as long as that tree stands, you get a reward for it. Right? 
So all of those things... Uh, ونشأة الشباب في تأثم وطاعة ونفقة and then he says fasting for the, the sharah if you're a glutton fasting is really good for you if you're somebody actually who uh, has good control over his food nafs right then fasting is a good thing but it's not going to be the same for the one who really needs to control his nafs and discipline that aspect of himself alright so that it's a good thing for somebody who... Or a miser, sadaqa. If you're somebody who's generous, you're helping people, for a miser to give out is better for the heart and there's more reward in it. They asked him, Ya Rasulullah, what's the afdaru sadaqa? Qar afdaru sadaqan, sadaqatin, sadaqatun, hinama anta sahihun, shahihun, takhshal faqar. The best sadaqa is when you're sound, you're in good health, and you're, you're shahih, you, you don't want to give it out. And you have fear of poverty. That's the best one. Because turghim amf shaitan. It's like really rubbing shaitan's nose in, you know. In yeah, in it. Thanks. Uh, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> and then he says, uh, or, or the young, or are you spent in avoiding wrongs? So obviously there's people in the ummah who they spent their whole life being horrible people and then they get old and they make tawba and then they start wagging fingers at all the young people. Right? I mean, obviously that person does not have the same maqam as a young person who spent their youth when they had all that energy to be disobedient. Like the old guy, he, he can't even, he doesn't have the energy to do wrong things anymore. Right? So tawba is a lot easier on an older person except for the fact that other that, that you know, if you disobey Allah throughout your youth, oftentimes the heart's so encrusted that I'll do that that you have a bad seal. But you know, for Alhamdulillah, a lot of Muslims do make tawbah as they get older. They hit 40, 45, and they start getting. I mean, that's you know, like in Tunisia, Qais is in here, but in Tunisia they say sin uh, taklif arba'un. You know, the the year of responsibility is 40, because that's when the wahi came down. In other words, like do whatever you want before 40, and then that. I mean, it's just ignorance. But the point is, there are a lot of Muslims that kind of have that attitude. When I go to Hajj, you know, I'm, then I'm going to grow my beard and I'll be a good Muslim. There's Muslims that say that. And they go to Hajj and some do. They get better, you know. They come back and they're... they're better. And these are kind of attitudes that have accrued in the Muslim world that unfortunately they're ignorant, you know. But they, they really are. They've become like almost cultural artifacts that indicate how far we've come from our tradition. But anyway... So a youth that raised up in... Allah loves the youth. Nasha'a fi ta'ati Allah. Allah loves that man. Shabab is from... Uh, uh, generally from like... Uh, I mean the Arabs would generally say it's from 15 to 35. That's Shabab. 15 to 35. Some say 15 to 40. So, but that's that's it. After 40, you're no longer a shab. You're a rajul. A, ma- a man, you're a man. Rajul. And then he says, وَنَفَقَتِ الْمُلَمِي خِيَارَهُ وَهُوَ صَحِيحُ الْقَانِصَ بِهَا رِضَ اللَّهِ تَعَانَ مُخْلِسَ And also, uh, the contributions of a miser for the best of his wealth when he is in a sound state seeking it by the pleasure of Allah with absolute sincerity all of these things purify the heart. All of these things purify the heart. Moreover, anything done with discretion and concealment is also purifying. And the best of it endeavor, endeavors is the one that purifies the heart. So the best thing that you can do in your life are things that are good for the heart. Purify the heart. And, and that's why we're doing this class and that's why he's telling us all these things. Likewise, كَمَا أَضَرُّ ذَنْبِ مَا أَقْسَاهُ بِيَانْ أَدَمْتُهُ أَوْ إِسْتَحْلَاهُ And also, uh, the worst things are those things uh, that harden the heart and you were constant in or enjoyed doing it. The, the nafs liked it, right? So those things are the worst things for the, uh, the heart, things that harden the heart. One of the things that hardens the heart is uh, speaking a lot without mentioning Allah. And that's in the Muwatta of Imam Malik. Uh, Sayyidina Isa is reported to have said 
uh, don't speak, sit in majlis without mentioning Allah because a majlis in, in which Allah is not mentioned will harden your heart and you're not even aware of it. So the hardening of the heart occurs without being aware of it, physically and spiritually. And the more the tongue is occupied in remembering Allah, the, 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 the softer the heart gets, right? Really. The more, the more dhikr somebody does, the softer the heart gets and the more compassion and the more uh, benefit they get from it. So that's... And then, وَفَضَّرُوا ذَنْبًا لِذُلْمٍ جَرَّا عَلَىٰ عِبَادَةٍ كَسَدْكَ كِبْرًا Now this comes... This is a really important point. Sidi ibn Atayla رضي الله عنه said مَعْصِيَةً أَوْرَثَتْ ذُلًّا وَاسْتِقَارًا خَيْرُ مِنْ طَاعَةً أَوْرَثَتْ عِزًّا وَاسْتِكْبَارًا That a wrong action that leads to a feeling of shame and, and bereftment, impoverishment before Allah is better than obedience that leads to uh, feeling proud and arrogant. Now, and this is the secret of wrong actions. In other words, the wisdom of wrong actions is that Allah wanted us to do wrong, to bring about this state, See, this is the secret of wrong actions, right there. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا لَمْ تُذْنِبُوا لَخَشَيْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ مَا هُوَ شَدْ مِنْهُ الْعُجَبْ If you didn't do wrong actions, al Kama Qal, if you didn't do wrong actions, I would have feared for you what's worse than wrong actions, ujab. Being pleased with yourself, being impressed with yourself, vanity, thinking how wonderful you are. That's worse. And then uh, Hanbara, when he came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Nafaqa Hanbara, I went through that. The point is, is that when he said to him, لَوْ لَمْ تُخْطِئُوا لَسَافَحَتْكُمْ الْمَلَائِكَةَ فِي الشَّوَارِعِ If you didn't do wrong actions, you'd be shaking hands with the angels on the streets. <laughs> right? That's why little babies, you watch the little babies. I mean, some people say the, they know Syriania. Abd al-Aziz Ibris said, uh, Abdul Aziz Sidi Abdul Aziz Dabbaq, Rahimullah, uh, that, that's one of the things he said, but, but but if you look at babies, you can see newborns like they don't look at your uh, face. They're looking around you. You know, you wa- it's amazing. You watch them, they look on both sides of your shoulder. They'll be looking like this. And they have this amazing look of just like. And then the other thing that they look at is light. They're, and they ha- get these awe. It's like they look at light, like like reminding them of from where they came from, because they they come out of that present. You know, they're arwah. We're in that present, and these are all reminders. Right? It's an amazing thing. So, so the uh, the angels. If you don't have wrong actions, the prophet said you'd be seeing angels. Now, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says about that, that the good of ta'a is in the essence of ta'a. And the evil of ta'a that he's talking about is what it results in. So, when he says that, don't think that he's in any way saying that obedience is, there's bad obedience and there's good ma'asiyah. That's not what he's saying, so don't confuse that. What it means is, that ta'a is good, ma'asiyah is bad. But, if the secondary result of it was pride, it, when you did a good thing, but the result of uh, uh, no, disobedience was toba, then in reality, that, 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 the, exactly. You see what I mean? So he's not saying that ma'asiyah is better than ta'a, billah. What he's saying is, is that the results of the actions you might think it's good and it turns out, and that's why Asan Sakra was saying, well, lakum. Maybe you hate this ma'asiyah that you did, but in fact it was a good thing for you because it brought you to Allah. Right? It brought you to Allah. Just like those people here in America, they, they kill somebody or they rob the store and they go to prison and they got guidance in their prison. That happened to a lot of people. So, that disobedience that they did actually was ended up being part of the causative process of the means by which they were given guidance. And so even though it was a disobedience, it was actually, it, it led them to guidance. 
So it wasn't a good thing, but it resulted in a good thing. And that's what he's saying. That a, an action, a good action that results in a, in a arrogance is worse. In other words, what it results in is worse than uh, a, a wrong action that results in humility. And then he says, وَذَرَّةٌ مِنْ عَمْلَ الْقَلْبِ الْعَلِي مِثْلُ الرِّضَى وَالزُّهْدِ وَالتَّوَكُّرِ أَغْبَرُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ جِبَالِ شَمَخْنَ مِنْ ظَوَاهِرَ الْعَمَالِ This is really important. And Adam's weight of high praiseworthy action from the heart is better than high mountains of external actions with no heart. And that's that idea of فَإِنَّ رَكَعْتَيْنَ مِنْ مُحِبٍ خَيْرٍ مِنْ أَلْفٍ مِنْ غَيْرِ حُبِّ That to do two rakats with love is better than a thousand without. You know, much, much better. And then he mentions something that Imam Sahnoon said, which is, وَتَرْكُ دِرْهَمًا لِكَوْنِهِ حَضَرْ أَفْضَرُ مِنْ تَصَدُّقَاتٍ وَعُمَرْ Imam Sahnoon said, leaving one banik from what Allah made haram is better than, than doing uh, 70,000 hajj and umrah. What banik is like a penny, farthing. It's like a really least amount of money in Arabic tradition. There, they say, uh, uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq said, Arba'atun izuha ghul. There's four things that even the best of it, there, there's, uh, there's a... Uh, there's a, 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 a basement in it. He said a dain wa uh, a, a debt even if it's a danik, like a least amount. A bint wa a daughter even if it's maryam, right? Because it's, it's, they, they don't have the protection that a son has. If a man has a son, you know, he's strong and, and in the society. And whereas a daughter, she, she's, she's going to be in a situation where it would be more difficult to protect herself and things like that. It's not saying that, you know, son's better than a daughter. It's just saying that in those situations that her is is still, she doesn't have the is that a man has by merely being a man just out of uh, strength, physical strength and things like that. And then, because uh, Aziz, don't forget, in Arabic also means qawi, physically strong or or politically strong like Aziz al Masr. And then he says, Was Suad wa okay fa tariq. Wa wa layla. Asking a question even if it's how do I go on this road? There's a type of even though there's nothing wrong with it, you know, you there's a uh, humility that comes with it. And then uh wa layla like being alone even if for a night. So anyway now we go to the root causes of the disease. Uh, let's see. Let, let me get through these and then what I'll do. The, next week I'm going to do treatment of the diseases of the, uh, remem- with remembrance of Allah. And inshallah, Shaykh Khatri will be here, so I'm going to ask him if he'll come uh, and do this class next week. Inshallah. So if you're going to have questions and things like that. And, and I read, he loves this book and he, he knows it. He knows this book really well. He, he spent a lot of time with this book. And, and I read sections of it with, with him. Uh, I, I, read, uh, I read the Sharh Wal Khudaym with uh, Sheikh, a lot of it with Sheikh Khatri, but I read uh, it with uh, Sheikh Abdullah. And I read the other Sharh, and we, we did Khatam of it on the Hajj. We did it uh, on an Arafat, we made Khatam of the book, and then we made a dua of all the diseases. Name them all that Allah inshallah would purify us of them. So Allah yataqabbal minna, inshallah, and all of us. Um, so he says, Wa asurah al jami'u hub al hadari fi ma hakad hidari wa ibn ashari. He says, The comprehensive ideology of all of these diseases is love of the temporal world. This is the opinion of both Imam al Hilali and uh, Imam ibn Ashar. So their opinion was it's hub al hadar. Love of this world is the root disease. Uh, and, and there's difference of opinion. Like we saw, Ibn Abad said the root is thama, is, is da- desire. But again, you can see how it's hub, you know. And so, y- you get in these are really semantic differences. They're all pretty much agreeing. Even Ibn Aisha radiallahu anhu, when he says it's hub riyasa it's still hub dunya because why do you want riyasa? You want power, you want dunya, you want all these things. So in the end, really, it's hubb dunya And there's a hadith, even though it's weak, uh, رَأْسُ كُلِّ خَطِيَةٍ 
Hubbin Ajira. Love of this world is the reason uh, for every wrong action. Uh, Ibn Atayilah radiallahu anhu, on the other hand, considered it to be a man's self-satisfaction. And that's really interesting. So Ibn Atayilah actually had, had a different take on it. It's still similar, but it's a different take. And he, radiallahu anhu, was a scholar. He was died in 709, which is 1309, the Christian era. And he's actually considered one of the greatest masters of this science. He wrote the Hikam, and he was a Madaki jurist, and he was uh, Imam al-Banani, said had it been permissible to recite uh, other than the Qur'an in prayer, it would have been permissible with the Hikam. Which is a hyperbole, it's an exaggeration, he's just saying how great the, the Hikam was. And uh, Ibn Atayla says in the 35th Hikam, Hikmah, he says that the source, وَعَلَمْ بِأَنَّ أَصْرَ He says the source أَصْرُ كُلِّ مَعْصِيَةٍ وَشَهْوَةٍ وَغَفْرَةٍ الرِّضَاعَ عَنَ النَّفْسِ وَأَصْرُ كُلِّ قَاعَةٍ وَعِفَّةٍ وَيَقَرَةٍ عَدَمُ الرِّضَاعَ مِنْكَ عَنْهَا He says that the source of every disobedience, indifference and passion is self-satisfaction. Whereas the source of every obedience, vigilance and virtue is dissatisfaction with oneself. And then he says, it is better for you to keep company with an ignorant man dissatisfied with himself than to keep company with a learned man satisfied with himself. And then he says, for what knowledge is there in a self-satisfied scholar and what ignorance is there in an unlearned man dissatisfied with himself? And then he says here, وَأَصْرُ كُلِّ خَصَرَةٍ وَقَارِ إِنَّ أَصْرَ كُلِّ دَائِي رِضَى الْفَتَى عَنْ نَفْسِهِ الْعَطَائِ Ibn Atayla said that وَأَصْرُ كُلِّ خَصَرَةٍ تُسْتَحْسَنُ عَدَمُهُ وَالْوَجْهُ فِيهِ بَيِّنُ So he's saying and the reason for every good character or quality is lack of self-satisfaction. In other words, even if this culture, if you look at it, the whole idea of getting rid of shame and get rid of... I mean, they have all these things, right? But... Look at the fact that the reason the guy's in the self-help section trying to, buying the book of how to get rid of shame, why is he there? He's dissatisfied with himself. In other words, if he was happy about if he didn't have any shame, if he felt great, and good, so the guy that wrote the book doesn't want you to be self-satisfied. He wants to sell you the book. So he's glad that you're not there, you know. <laughs> right? They're all just liars and hoaxers, most of them. So the point is, is that dissatisfaction with the self is what causes you to want to change. If you're satisfied with yourself, if anybody here was satisfied with themselves, they wouldn't be here. Right? Inshallah, none, nobody would be here. Why would you be here studying the disease of the heart if you thought you had a, that you were free of them? But the fact that, that, that people have these troubles is what actually makes them want to go out and get better. And that's how you go out and seek help. If you feel that you don't have guidance, you seek guidance. The one who submits to Allah, he starts seeking guidance. Why? Because now he knows that he needs Allah's guidance. But if you're out there walking around feeling perfectly content, I don't need guidance, I'm guided, then you're not going to seek that guidance. And that's what, what he's saying there. So he's saying it's, it's clear. How this was arrived at is obvious, right? Now, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says, and this is important, Adamatul Rida and Anas Tharat. There's three signs to being content with the soul. Ru'yatul Haq li nafsihi. It's seeing that the Haq has a right. Now, it's interesting in this culture, we have a, 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 a bill of rights, right? But there's no bill of responsibilities. Right? I mean, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Because there's much more focus in Islam on your responsibilities than on your rights. In fact, the Qur'an is really a bill of Allah's rights. It's the haqq of Allah on us. And that's why hukuk al-insan is an alien idea to the Islamic uh, ethos. I mean, human beings do have uh, God-given rights, but they're not human rights. Right? They're hukuk Allah fil ibad. There are Allah's rights in His servants. So Allah has a haqq that you don't oppress, His creation. That's a haqq of Allah. 
So if you kill somebody, you kill them بِغَيْرِ حَقِّهِ And if you killed him because he, was, he warranted it by Sharia, then it's a haqq of Allah that you took his life. Because Allah demands his haqq to be fulfilled. Now Allah gives a human being a haqq. Majazan. In other words, if you're wulat ad you have a haqq. But that haqq was given to you by who? By Allah. Right? So it's a haqq of Allah. And the reason the other person's fulfilling it is because he fears Allah. And this is why fear of Allah is the foundation of, of, of a Muslim society. That's the foundation of it. You have to have fear of Allah, taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first one is seeing a haq for the self. If you see all the time, you, they're wrong, I'm right. It's a very common psychological disease. You think they did it to me. It's all their fault. The mu'min always think, and this is, there's a story I might have told you this before, but it's important, so it's a Moroccan story about a sheikh uh, who there was a self-satisfied uh, alim. Uh, who didn't like this sheikh. And he was visiting once and he said, you know, the least of my students uh, is better than uh, you. And the sheikh said, how is that possible? And he said, I'll show you. Come to my madrasa tomorrow and I'll show you. So this little sheikh comes back the next day. And he tells all of his uh, students when the sheikh comes in, don't say to him, Wa alaykum salam, when he says, Salam alaykum. So the sheikh comes in. And he also told him, and when uh, so and so comes in, who is a student of his, don't say, Salam alaykum to him when he comes. So the sheikh comes in, Salam alaykum. Salam alaykum. Salam alaykum. A'udhu billah. These are your students? هم جهال ألم يسمعوا في قوله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما 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 أو قول الله تعالى right? إذا حييتم فحيوا بتحياتنا بمثلها أحسن منه Have you heard Allah say if you're given a greeting greet or better than that هؤلاء جهال So that's what he did and then he told him usually and then his student came in and he said سلام عليكم nobody said Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Wallahi ya, ya ikhwan, samihuni yaani. Akhpa'tu fi hukukikum. Fa'abtu shay. Wallahi samihuni yaani. Why don't you agree? Did I do something wrong? Excuse me, whatever I did. And that's a completely, those are the two. One self-satisfied, and the other he's looking, what did I do wrong? And that's the, the see, it's al haq for the self. The man who came in, he saw, I have a haq, and my haq is you return my salam. The other one was saying, what haq didn't I fulfill that these people aren't saying salam to me? You see, so he's looking from the opposite. And one self-satisfied, and, the, and that's why even though he was the least of his students, he's the jahil. That's why even Atayla is saying, what knowledge does a man who's self-satisfied have even if he's an alim? And what ignorance does an ignorant man have if he's not self Because he's going to ask and want to learn and be taught, right? So it's a hikmah. I don't know if it ever happened. Inshallah it did. But, you know, it's a, it, there's meaning in it. So that's the first one. The second one is al ighba'u an ayubiha bi tazkiyatiha ma haythu yara qabihaha hasana bi ta'wil li'annahu ya'lam al ayb thumma yughbi anhu wa in kana nu'an minhu wa anshadu fi hadha al ma'na wa ayna al-rida an kulli ibn kabiratun lakinna ayna sukhti tubdi al masawiya He says the second one is ignoring the faults of the self by deeming the self to be already in a state of purity even if it's by interpretation. So for instance, somebody gets angry, uh, or somebody's mutakabbir, and he says, well the hadith says, be mutakabbir in front of a mutakabbir. And that's just his nature, but he's using, you know, pretending something, or like that, you know. So, or he gets angry, and he says, ta'atari khiyara ummati. Anger even gets the worst of my ummah. In other words, 
I, you know, I'm, I mean the best of my ummah. So I'm from the best of the ummah and I still get angry. So it's that idea of seeing the faults, uh, and, but I- interpreting them in ways that you don't deem them as false. And this is what he said the poet meant when he said, uh, the eye of contentment on kulli ibn kariratun. An eye that's content is always doesn't see the fault. Right? Like the one who's in love, they can't see the fault. One of the signs they say of falling out of love, they start noticing all the faults of the person. I never noticed one ear is bigger than the other. I never, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, what I can aina sukhti to be in masai, what the eye that's angry begins to show the wrong actions of that person. And then, so those, those are, and then a shabaqatu alayha, having compassion for the self. Poor me, you know, I'm really having a hard time and, and complaining and, and that type of thing. So those are the three signs that somebody's content with themselves. The, the, three, uh, the three signs that somebody's not content with themselves, according to Ahmed Zarruq, is the first one is ittihamuha, yattahimuha. He's always checking the self accusing, being suspicious about the self's intentions. And this is Sayyidina Yusuf a.s. who is a prophet, ma'asum. Uh, there's a khilaf about the statement, but uh, Sayyidina Ahmed Zarruq and others, that Sayyidina Yusuf a.s. said, لا أبرر نفسي I will never declare myself innocent. إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء The nafs by its nature commands to evil. So, Always being suspicious of the self. What were my intentions there? Wondering what it is. Not, am I doing this for riya? Man khafa, man lam yakhafa an nifaq, fa huwa munafiq. Hassan al Basri said, la yakhman an nifaq illa al munafiq. The only one who feels safe from nifaq is the hypocrite. So the mu'min is always checking the self. Al hadru min afatiha. Being careful of the blemishes of the soul. And this is, uh, this is the, you know, in the dua, the Prophet said, Allahumma la tikilli ila nafsi parfata aynan wa la aqalla min dharika. Don't leave me to my soul even for the blink of an eye or less than that. Don't leave me to the soul. And then the, the final one is hamluha ala al-makarih. Forcing the self to do difficult things. Makarih are things it doesn't like. And he mentioned them, saghab. You know, Eating less. Sahar al Spending some time. Those are, it's a makrahat. It's difficult to do those things. Jihad. Jihad is a makrahat. Jihad is a hard thing to do. All these type things. Forcing the self to do them. For the sake of giving out money. It's a makrahat. Self doesn't like it. You want to save your money. Right? We want to save our money and, and, and get whatever we need or put it away. Right? Kirshun abiyab liyom and aswad. Whatever. Now, uh, Abu Uthman رضي الله عنه said, لا يرى عيب نفسه وهو مستحسن شيئا منها. Whoever sees anything good about himself has not seen the faults of his soul. In other words, if you think there's anything good about you, now obviously the question is going to arise here, I think. See, part of the whole Western discourse is this idea, isn't this all uh, self-loathing and low self-esteem and all these, right? This is very antithetical to the modern thing of feeling good about the self, of feeling, right? It is. Now, a couple of things. This is not going to make people these... I mean, if you've been around the, the like the real shiuch, they're not these people that are self... But... They really do, they have that humility, they have all these qualities because, like Aisha, we read this morning for the people in this class, Aisha, she is the wife of the best of creation. She was a beautiful woman, physically. She was an intelligent woman, one of the most brilliant women, uh, certainly in Islamic history and in human history. She was from an excellent family, aristocrat, from the tiny clan of, of Quraysh. All these things, and yet, 
when she's desiring Allah to absolve her of, uh, to, to, to actually de- uh, de- declare her innocence she said وَكُنْتُ أَرَى نَفْسِي حَقِيرًا I deem myself as so insignificant that I would never think Quran would be revealed about me so this despite all of those things she was not a woman with low self esteem she was a woman she was a, a, a very excellent woman with with self-confidence. She, I mean, she's one of the few people, she, she asked the Prophet when he said, يدخل الجنة بلا حساب أولم يقول الله فسوف يحاسب حساب يسيرا but they'll get an easy حساب how is it now you're saying? So she's actually questioning the Prophet with her knowledge on Quran. None of, nobody else would do that. Only a woman with great self-confidence or a man would even th- think of doing it. A Sahaba wouldn't do things like that. So Aisha had great... She t- took an army out. She regretted it. But she took an army out. She, she you know, harrabatum. She said, let's go. Let's, he's wrong. We're right. Let's go and, and solve this situation. She went out in her hodaj and went out to the battle of the Jamal. And when the man, one of Sayyidina Ali's men came, he said, Ya, ya Umm al-Mu'mineen. She said, No, Umm Malik. Yeah. <laughs> Does the Arab say that to like... Really, it's kind of an insult. You don't have a mother. You know, don't call me your mother. You don't have a mother. Right? So she was a, she was a strong lady. Anha. But, still, her, her understanding of her, 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 you know, herself was that she was insignificant. And that, and that is what this is talking about. It's not talking about being in this state of self-loathing and being, you know, without any uh, confidence or things like that. You should be confident. You should have all those things. But, you should not be content with yourself. That's all they're saying. Don't, don't be content with yourself. Don't see, uh, always want to change. There's always room for improvement. And that's the point. No matter how, if you're a master calligrapher, there's always somebody better than you. There's always somebody to be, if you, the perfect tajweed, there's always uh, more mastery of the Qur'an to be done. So you always deem, I haven't done enough. That's all. And that is because we're human beings. And, لَمْ أَرَى عَيْبٍ مِنْ عَيُوبِ النَّكْسِ كَنَقْصِ الْقَادِرِينَ عَلَى التَّمَامِ I never saw a fault from amongst the faults of people like the, uh, the inability for people capable of achieving human perfection why they don't do it. And the reason they don't do it is because they're satisfied. You get to a level of, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, I recite the Qur'an reasonably well. I don't really feel a need to go and sit with a tajweed teacher anymore. Khalas, you're self-satisfied. You, and that's the level you'll get to. Because now you're, you're pleased. But if you say no, right? Khalas, you want to go and increase it more. Lugh al Arabiya, alhamdulillah, I studied enough, I know khawaid, I'm not going to make any mistakes. Khalaf, you're not going to learn anymore. And the thing is, all of these things, they're endless. All these sciences are endless. All of these uh, knowledges are endless. All of these abilities are endless. And the master is not the one who actually achieves the mastery, it's the one who's committed constant to constant improvement. Right? That, that's the person who has mastery because they, they're always improving they're always improving their technique they're always seeing I, there's always room I can do better but if he feels content I'm self-satisfied Khalas, there's no more improvement and, th- and then you're dead so that's, that's what he means alright and then he says because when a man is dissatisfied himself, this acts as an impetus to seek virtuous character and to vigilantly avoid what is unbecoming of him. So you're always vigilant about it. Alhamdulillah. So we'll stop there, inshallah. And, uh, and then next week we'll finish this uh, section. And then what I'm going to do, inshallah, we have how many more classes? Three? Three. Or two? Is there three? <laughs> yep, you're right. I'm wrong. So inshallah we'll do this uh, next week and then I'm going to do the khawatir the week after that and then uh, or what I'll do actually is
I'll do, I'm going to go through the, uh, the adhkar of the sabah and the masa the week after that, which everybody should be doing. And, uh, and I'll get you a copy of, uh, of that. And then, um, and then we'll do the khawatir. And then that's, that's the, the khalat. Jazakumullah khairan. Takbir! Takbir! اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم انشر علينا رحمة وانزر علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والاكرام وصل الله وصل على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ولا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلي العظيم the, uh, there was a question here about, I think from the previous class, uh, just about uh, women having male slaves. Uh, women, a, a, a bondsman, which is an ad, uh, is permissible for a woman to own, uh, but they're not, they're, they're still, uh, they're mahram. That's, so they can't uh, they can't be alone with them by the same type rules and there certainly no can be no sexual relationship between the two that was the question in, in uh, this last section before the uh, did I do the Mithatiyah the keys Last week, let me do that because uh, miftah is a key in Arabic, and if you look at the word, this root word uh, is what fataha, and the 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 wasn't that it's on is Nif'an and this is a wazan that's used for tools right like uh, Miknas would be Miknasa like something that you use Midras would be we need to change that so the uh, the Miftah is the tool that you use to open something up and obviously it's, it's uh, a key in Arabic but the point is is that a key which unlocks a door. In Arabic, the word for key uh, means that thing that opens, that causes an opening, right? Which is different from unlocking, if you think about that. Okay. In other words, the metaphor is much stronger in Arabic than it is in English. You can say he had the key which unlocked the secrets. But the idea of fatah, right? Related directly to one of the names of Allah, which is the Fah, the one who opens. So, in other words, people that have uh, spiritual keys, and Allah says He has the Mafatih al the keys to the unseen, a person who has these uh, keys, they think that they can uh, open up. And there are many hadith that indicate this is the key to this, like Al Sabr Miftah al Faraj. Sabr is the key to getting uh, the faraj or the opening. So that's, that's a hadith. In other words, if you want faraj from Allah, then the key is sabr. In other words, if you don't have the miftah, you can't open it. So, like right now, the ummah is, there's no faraj. But if you look at the ummah, there's no sabr. If there was sabr, then you could have the faraj. And part of sabr, patience, is that you don't uh, complain. So you have to stop complaining and and literally be patient. Because men betha lam yasbir, you know, if, you, if you're complaining, you haven't been patient. 
Unless the complaint is what they call arhal, which is just, you're not complaining, you're just letting somebody know what the conditions are. That's different. But if it's like, woe is me, why is this happening to me, and this is horrible. And now, Imam al-Manawi says that this is one of the most important babs of knowledge. It's called bab al-Mafatih. So I'm going to give you uh, the Mafatih that he laid out. Miftah al-Salah, the key to prayer is tahor. The key to prayer is wudu. So, Sayyid Ahmed Zarruq says, if you have presence in your wudu, you'll have presence in your prayer. If you're heedless about your wudu, you'll be heedless about your prayer. And one of the things about modern Muslims is that they don't do wudu as a ibadah anymore. They do it hurriedly in a bathroom and they just want to get it over with so they can go pray. And the point is, wudu is a spiritual preparation for prayer. So it's a miftah uh, for prayer. Miftah al-hajj al-ihram. The key to hajj is entering into the state of ihram. So if you do the ihram properly, then you've opened the door to the hajj. Miftah al-bir al-sadaqah. The key to righteousness is charity. لَن تَنَالُ الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You won't get uh, righteousness until you, you give out in charity. So, مِفْتَحُ الْبِرْ الصَّدَقَ مِفْتَحُ الْجَنَّةِ التوحيد. The key to paradise is tawheed. Now, obviously, every key has asman. Right? In the old keys. Right? So the key itself, like the key to Hajj is Ihram. But then it, there's, there's teeth to it. So there's obviously other things that are, but that is the key that opens up. So, Niftahu al Jannah at Tawheed. Niftahu al Ilm, Husn al Su'al, Wal Isra. The key to knowledge is asking intelligent questions and learning how to listen attentively. That's Miftahul Ilm. Miftahul Zafar al Sabar. The key to victory is patience. Or the key to gaining what you want is patience. Arafa Sabru, Arafa Sabru, Arafa Sabra. Arafa Sabra, Tabuluhu Maturidu, or the Tuqa Yadinu Lakar Hadidu. With patience, you will gain whatever you desire. And with taqwa, you can bend iron. Miftah al-Mazid al-Shukr. The key to increase in this world, تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِدَنَّكُمْ Your Lord, he, Allah has declared, if you show gratitude to Allah, Allah increases in you. So Miftah al-Mazid, in khayr, of good, is shukr, gratitude. If you want increase in good of this world and the next, then the key is shukr. Miftah al-wilaya, the key to wilaya, becoming a wali of Allah, al-mahabba wa dhikr is love and remembrance of Allah. That's how you will enter into a state of wilaya. Love of Allah's Messenger and Allah and dhikr of Allah. Love of dhikr of Allah and dhikr of His Messenger as well. Miftah al-Falah al-Taqwa. The key to success is taqwa. Ulaika, right? Qad aflah al The people of taqwa are the people of falah. Ulaika hum al so taqwa, falah, success in this world and the next is taqwa. Niftah al-tawfiq, al-raghba wa rahba. The key to tawfiq from Allah, which is where your will is in accordance with Allah's will, is rahba and rahba. Is understanding, desire, what you should naturally desire and incline to, and what you should naturally have an aversion to. So the fitra gets tawfiq, when it inclines towards what Allah has commanded it to do, and like prayer. Allah encourages us to pray. So that's a raghba. 
And if you pray on time, you're muwaffaq in that thing, in prayer. Allah calls us to fear certain things. So if you fear them, you're muwaffaq in, in, in fearing the right things. So raghba and rahba. Desiring the right things and fearing the right things leads to tawfiq from Allah. You're considered muwaffaq. And then miftah uh, al-ijaba al-du'a. The key to getting uh, answer, response from Allah is calling on Allah. That's the miftah. If you call on Allah, Allah says He'll answer you. Miftah al-dukhul ala Allah. The key to entering into the presence of Allah in a, in a non, uh, you know, no anthropomorphism there. Is istislam al qalb wal ikhlas lahu fil hubbi wal bughr. It is the key to being uh, aware of the divine presence, is the heart entering into submission to Allah, and then love, uh, and then sincerity in what you love and you hate. In other words, you love things for the sake of Allah, and you hate things for the sake of Allah. That's the key to being uh, present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, Miftah Hayat al This is a really important one. The key to life of the hearts, bringing the heart to life. Tadabbar al-Qur'an. Reflecting on the meanings of the Qur'an. Tadabbar al-Qur'an. Wa tadarra and al-ashar. Calling on Allah sincerely before dawn. Wa al-dhunub. And stopping wrong actions. And, and if you do any one of those three, you'll see a difference. And if you do all three, uh, khalas. <laughs> the second one. The second. Uh, tadarra ila Allahi uh, and al-ashar. Like tadarra and al-ashar means ya tadarra ila Allah. You know, to really call on Allah out of desire. You know, of need, intense need of Allah. Tadarra. You want your right? Quran, reflecting on the meanings of Quran. Uh, Tadarra means to really to uh, to fervently seek help or uh, like one of the reasons Allah says in the Quran that He gives people tribulation is لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَضَرَّعُونَ in order for them to يتضرعون, really to plead with Allah to really change me, help me, save me and so doing that at dawn before dawn, pre-dawn time okay. and then tark al is leaving wrong actions wrong actions and then he said, "Miftah uh, Hasul al Rahma al Ihsan fi Ibadat al Haq wa Sa'i fi Nif al Khalq." The key to gaining mercy from Allah is doing ibadah properly and helping creation. That's where you get the rahmah, because Allah said, "Rahmati wa Sa'at kulli shay'in wa Sa'atuhu al-Ladin wa Taqoon." 
that his mercy encompasses everything, but he'll write it for people who have taqwa. And taqwa is ihsan and ibadah. When you have taqwa, you have ihsan in your ibadah. And then also, ar-rahimun, yarhamuhum ar-rahman, yarhamu man fi al-ard, yarhamukum man fi al-sama. Have no, uh, the, 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 those who show mercy, Allah, the Rahman shows mercy in them, and then show mercy on those in the earth, and Allah will show mercy on you. So the, the, that's the key to Rahma, is to have Ihsan in your Ibadah, and then to benefit uh, the creation of Allah, to show mercy and have Rahma. Mustah Hasul al Rahma al Ihsan fi Ibadat al Haq, wa Sa'i fi Nafa al Khalq. And then, Miftah al-Risq, al-Sa'i al istighfar The key to provision is to go out and get it, but do it with istighfar. So that's the key to provision, to go out and search for it, look for it, but do it with istighfar, because the nature of going into the world is you're going to get vinub. And so if you make istighfar, it'll counterbalance uh, the vinub that you acquire in, in the world. مفتاح العز الطاعة The key to dignity in this life is obedience to Allah. That's the key. And, and Sayyidina Umar said, نحن قوم أعزنا الله بالإسلام فإذا طربنا العز بغيره أذلنا الله We're a people that Allah gave us عز with Islam and if we seek uh, dignity from anywhere عليكم السلام ورحمة الله أنا أثنت يا عمر I'll just, there's only three more, so I'll finish them and then we'll, I'm going to let Sheikh Khatri do the rest of the section here. And then he said, مفتاح الاستعداد الآخرة قصر الأمل The key to getting ready for Akhira is having uh, uh, short hopes. In other words, don't think you're going to live long. If you want to prepare for Akhira, don't think I've got lots of time. Get, believe that you're going to die any minute. And that's the key to preparing for it. And then, مفتاح كل خير الرغبة في الآخرة The key to every good is desire of the next world. Just like the key to every evil is desire of this world. رأس الخطايا حب العاجلة And then, مفتاح كل شر حب الدنيا So that's, that's it. Those are the مفاتيح. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of knowledge in those uh, مفاتيح. There's a lot of knowledge there. So inshallah we'll let, uh, uh-huh. uh, the key to every evil is um, love of dunya. Now where did we get to last week? What's that? Uh, the sources, yeah, khalas. وأصل الأصلين خلال أهل كل فدين المرء دين الخلي قال أن أصل داء المرء هو بالمرء عن نفسه بل لا أرض يمرء عن نفسه معنى ذلك أن هذا هو الداء الداء معنى شنو معنى الداء هو المرض الذي لا غير معه الداء هو المرض ومرض المرض المؤمن so he said the source, he, before, the section we did before, he talks about the root. And he said that the root of uh, the diseases of the heart is a human being being self-satisfied. And he said, so if you have a human being that's satisfied with himself, then he has a diseased heart, he's mariyab. قال ومرض القلب مرض لا 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 يكتسب معه حسنا لا يكتسب المرض حسنا ما دام راضيا عن نفسه 
So he said that a human being, he's not going to be able to acquire any good as long as he's content with his self. So he said, so the human being he knows, uh, he said the origin really of the good is knowing uh, yourself. Because if you know yourself, you can't be content with it. And if you're not content with it, it's going to encourage you to do things that are going to improve your soul, which is good actions and acquiring good character. So by knowing your soul, you'll actually set out to do something about it. So he said, if you're self-satisfied, then what happens is you, you actually deem wrong actions to be good things. Because the nest by its nature will make wrong look good, appear to the self. And that's the, um, often in the Quran, right? Tazjeen of shaitan, of nafs, of hawa. And he said, so the, the hawa, the nature of your hawa, which is your caprice, is that it inclines towards ma'asiyah. And if you don't, if you're unaware of your own soul's natural inclination, the soul's inclination, not the, not the ruh, but the soul is inclining towards wrong action. If you don't know that, then the soul will convince you, if you're satisfied with it, that what it's inclined to is good for it. Right? Like in this culture, it's the best example of that. So he said that the the uh, the, the the soul, when it's uh, not satisfied with itself, then will seek what is good, and what is good is what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has told it to do. And in the Ibat al Jannah, which is a, a poem on the Aqidah. He said that what is good is not what the aql thinks is good, but what Allah says is good. Just like what is ugly is not what the aql or the nafs or anything says is good or ugly, it's what Allah says is ugly. So the sharia tells us what's hasan and what's qadiyah. <laughs> So the, the, what he's saying is that the sharia is what tells us what is good. And sharia tells us what is bad or ugly. And the intellect has no access to that. You know, it can sometimes get it right, but not always. And so it's, it's not an absolute source of guidance. Right? I mean, the intellect is a relative or limited source of guidance. So, sharia indicates what's hasana and what's sayya. And then the human being who recognizes now that his nafs is, is not going to save him or help him, then he looks to what will help him by recognizing it's what Allah told him to do. And so that will lead him to doing the actions that are uh, in, in uh, accordance with Allah and His Messenger. <laughs> Uh, 
من كان يحمل المعصية أو كان سيئة الأعلام أو يحمل الثلاثة أعضاء فيها أو لا يزكي ماله أو لا يرحم الضعفاء فهذا أنت على دينه إذا طاعته لأن المرأة على دين خليله فإذا أردت أن تستكر بأهل الطاعة كنت من أهل الطاعة فإذا أردت أن تستكر بأهل الفساد كنت من أهل الفساد فعليك أن تجاهد نفسك حتى لا تطع بما يعطي الله تعالى وهو النهي عن الكفر عن النهي وكتاب الطاعة فهي سيدة What, what, uh, what he's saying in the poem here is that the origin of, of those two, uh, right, the disease of the heart and the good things of, of, that are going to happen is the company that one keeps. Because the hadith says that a man is on the deen of his companion. So the shaykh said that if you keep company with a person who delays his prayer, if you keep company with a person that doesn't pay his zakat, if you keep company with a person that does wrong actions, then you will be uh, doing those things that he's doing. And in the same way, if you keep company of a good person, then it's going to affect you also. So the, the, the person is, is on the dean of those he ke- keeps company with. And that's why people have to look at who they're keeping company with. Because the company is indicative of the state of a man. <laughs> لا بد أن تشم رائحة طيبة فإذا جلست على باب خمع فإنك لا تحضر من رائحة مدينة So he said for example if you uh, sit at the door of a, uh, a bar then you're going to be smelling the foulness of the alcohol in the bar and if you sit at the door of a perfumer then you're going to be smelling the good sense of the perfume. So, the, 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 whatever, whatever you're in proximity to, you'll be affected by it. That's the point. So, if you're in the proximity of a good person, you're going to be af- affected by his goodness. If you're in the proximity of a bad person, you're going to be affected by his, his uh, foulness. <laughs> لقمان حديم قال لابنه عليك من مجالسة العلماء لأن مجالسة العلماء هو البطر الذي يريد أن تقطع دورتها شبه العلماء بالمطر لأن العالم إذا جالسه دائما فإنك تنبت بطرة الكتاب قد لا تطلع من حيث لا تحتسب من حيث لا تشعر إذا جالس العلماء فإن قلبك يصلح من حيث لا تشعر بدوام مجالسه العلماء ولقمان قال لابنه عليك بمجالسه العلماء فانها رجل مع خطا يحيي القلوب كما كما يحيي المطر اذا قطع بروحها So he said that for this reason لقمان الحكيم ربنا عنه mentioned in the Quran that he in the Muatta bin Malik he mentioned that لقمان الحكيم said to his son uh, sit with the ulama, keep the company of the ulama and the ulama are people who know things and act according to their knowledge. And he said, sit with those people because they are like rain that comes to earth and brings it back to life. They're, they are like that rain to the earth. The sitting with them is, is like the rain to the earth of your heart. In other words, it will bring your heart back to life. And it will bring it in a way, he said, that you're not even aware of. In other words, just by sitting in, in the company of righteous people, in the company of knowledge, the heart begins to, uh, to become uh, alive and, and Iman begins to grow in it until it increases and, and, and gets more and more. <laughs> So he said, the, the, the sitting with the alim of the arifin, the people who have knowledge, will take you from six things to six things. In other words, you'll go from six bad things to six good things. Uh, 
Mira. So, Mina Shek in al Yaqeen. You'll go from doubt to certainty. Mina Riyai in al Ikhlas. You'll go from Riya doing things for other than Allah to doing things uh, with sincerity, with ikhlas, for Allah. Allah. <laughs> so you'll go from heedlessness uh, to remembrance of Allah. Akhira. <laughs> So you'll go from desiring this world to the desiring the next world. Min al tibri, which is arrogance, from arrogance, ila at tawaba. وَمِنْ سُوءٍ So from a, uh, a bad internal nature to a good one. مِنْ سُوءٍ الطَّوِيَةِ إِلَى إِلَى وَمِنْ سُوءٍ الطَّوِيَةِ إِلَى النَّصِيحَةِ إِلَى النَّصِيحَةِ So from a bad uh, character that has bad intentions to a character نَصِيحَةِ to a, an inner character that is sincere to people. It has good intentions for people. And, and also in, in the hikam of Ibn Atayda, he said, don't, ass- don't keep company of someone who does not uh, elevate you, his state, his hal, his condition, does not elevate you, raise you up. In other words, by seeing him, you get elevated. Your himma gets higher, you desire Allah. Or whose speech does not direct you to Allah. Don't keep company with a person whose either his state is not elevating you or his speech isn't directing you to Allah. It's a bad company. So, so the uh, really of all these diseases that we've looked at in the Mapara, the the comprehensive cure for all of them is remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. More than anything else, that is the thing that will cure your heart. So, dhikr is recitation of Qur'an, prayer, of salah. That's a dhikr, prayer. Dhikr is saying subhanallah, all the types, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, al-azim, all those type things. Dhikr is saying la ilaha illallah. Dhikr is saying alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Those ad'iyah that the Prophet has given us, those are all dhikr of Allah. And then qira'at al-Quran, which is the highest and the best of them. The best dhikr the best is Qira'at al-Qur'an. Afbal dhikr Qira'at al-Qur'an. A person who is in a state of dhikr, his heart is going to be tahir. It will be pure.
سيدنا أحمد بن محمد عن أبيه الأفضل وقال قراءة القرآن لأنه أقرأ 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 So Sidi Ahmed ibn Hanbal radiallahu anhu uh, he, he, he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 99 times in his dream and in one of them uh, he was asked uh, of all of the things that draw a slave near to Allah which one is the greatest and he said that, and, and Allah answered him recitation of Quran and he said Ya Allah with understanding or without understanding and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to the Imam, answered him, Be fahman or be ghayri fahman, with understanding or without understanding? In other words, even an ajami who doesn't understand what they're reading, they're drawing close to Allah with the Qur'an. <laughs> so in Sahih al-Bukhari, Allah, uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the likeness of the one who remembers Allah and the present is like the living and the dead that's the analogy in the dunya somebody remembers Allah is hay qalbuhu hay his, his heart is alive so he's alive and the one who doesn't remember Allah qalbuhu mayyit so he's mayyit his, his heart is dead so he's considered dead And in a hadith, and it's a good hadith, uh, it says, make remembrance of Allah until they say he's a madman. Because one of the things mad people do is they talk to themselves all the time. So if you see a person remembering Allah all the time, it, it, they look outwardly very similar to people walking around talking to themselves. So if somebody doesn't know what he's doing, like if somebody's non-Muslim see you walking down the street doing dhikr, they'll think maybe he's crazy, he's talking to himself. So that's what the hadith means. <laughs> and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in another hadith which is also sound, uh, and, and, and it's in different narrations. Uh, should I not tell you what the best of all of your actions is and the most pure in, in, in the sight of your Lord your King and the most exalted in all of those things that you do that are in degrees it has the highest degree and, and better for you in spending wealth of gold and silver and better even that you go out and uh, meet your enemy in jihad and by going out and meeting them you strike them and they strike you you kill them and they kill you they said, of course, tell us, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Remembrance of Allah. And the, in explanation of the hadith, because you say, how could that be better than jihad or something like that? The ulama, Rabbi Ma'am, say, Zikrullah is a ghaya. It's, it's the end. That's why we were created, to remember Allah. Whereas jihad and everything else is a wasila, it's just a means. And there's no means in the world that's better than the end. And so the, the reason that we are created is to remember Allah. And that's why it is the highest thing in the dunya. Dhikr Allah. Allah says, Al-Quruni, Al-Kurkum. So whoever remembers his Lord, Allah remembers him. And whoever Allah remembers, He's enriched him in the dunya and the akhirah. He's in need of nothing. And 
And one of the things about dhikr which is not the same as other ibadah like hajj or siyam or things like that or prayer even is that dhikr can be done with all of your acts and there's no specific time that limits it. All of the human acts including going to the toilet having sexual relations eating food all of these things have dhikrs related to them. And they say that the, the one who's in a state of amendment with Allah, he's never afflicted by calamity, ever. Because whatever afflicts him and he was in a state of amendment with Allah only raises him in rank. If he dies and he's remembered Allah, he's a martyr. So this is the treatment for the foul soul, the foul nature. That, that's its treatment, is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, So he said, So he said, when you, when you want to do dhikr, you begin with istighfar. Because dhikr is to purify yourself, and obviously the reason that you need purification is because of wrong actions that have been acquired. So you begin that process by asking Allah to remove those wrong actions. And, and then, if, if Allah removes the wrong actions, then the dhikr after that that you do will remove the bad effects of those wrong actions. Because the wrong actions have effects. And so you pray on the Prophet ﷺ because prayer on the Prophet acts as a, a murabbi for the heart itself and purification of the heart. Which is why the, also most of the later ulama all encourage those two specifically because of the wrong actions that so many of us uh, are engaged in but also because by idma of the ummah The only dhikr that's absolutely guaranteed to be accepted by Allah is Salah al Anybody Anybody who says Allah wa sallam ala sallam Muhammad is maqbool. So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded a command that he himself began with which you don't see that anywhere else in all the things Allah has commanded us to do he doesn't begin with it except prayer on the messenger of Allah so he Allah himself said in Allah and then he seconded it with his angels they do this and then Allah said Ya Allah Lidina Sallu Alayhi wa Sallam wa Taslima Pray on the Messenger of Allah and do Tasneem Allahumma Salli Ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wasallam So if you ever pray on the Prophet of Islam one time Allah prays on him ten times according to the Sahih Hadith And he said, whoever Allah has prayed on ten times, what else do they need in this world and the next? So, just pray on the Hadith of Allah, Alayhi Wasallam, Marra Wahida, Allah Akbar. So the Prophet Wasallam said that prayer upon the Messenger of Allah is light uh, in this world, light in the grave and then light on the Sirat. So in other words, it will give you light, guidance. 
in, in when you need it. They will give it in the grave. It will make your grave light instead of dark. And then it will make the sarat light so you can see to get across it. Nur of the Qalbi. Nur of the Qalbi. Light in the heart. So he said, no, no one else we've been commanded to pray on the Prophet's Allah and therefore when you pray on the Prophet, and that's why usually it's good to begin with the actual ayah because by p- beginning with the ayah, then you're actually, it's called intifad amrillah. You're in fulfilling the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you, if you have to do it as a wajib at least once in your life to fulfill that command. But you can do it every single time that you do the prayer on the Prophet. <laughs> And so the uh, the one who prays on the Prophet Islam, he should have the same adab that would he have if he's remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it's uh, mandu for him to be in wudu. It's mandu for him to be facing the qibla. It's mandu for him uh, hmm? So those things that are mandu for prayer are mandu for prayer on the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also istihbar, that's what he said. And then that you have istihbar of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you pray as if you were in his presence. You should, uh, in the same way that when you pray to Allah, you pray as if you're in the presence of Allah, ka'annaka tarahuvim min tukun tarahuvim min yaraq. That's ihsan. With the prayer on the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to pray as if you were in the presence of, uh, of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are courtesies of the prayer, the adab, that you, that you do when you do the prayer on the phone. So I said, like you're going to pray, it's these are men do that, adab, that you should do. Tahara, siwa, cleaning the mouth, uh, perfume, things like that. These are all good things to do. So every liquor has things that are appropriate for that liquor. So for instance, when you say La ilaha illallah, what's appropriate for it is that you negate uh, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that you negate shirk completely. That's appropriate for La ilaha illallah. If you say uh, Alhamdulillah, then what's appropriate for that is that you uh, are reminded of the constant overflowing bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of His blessings. Because He is Mahmoud. There's Hamad for uh, Ihsan and for the things that Allah has done for you. And then if you say uh, the La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, then what you should be doing is uh, you should have a takhallus, which is a removal or, or completely uh, uh, completely disengaging from any power or any strength 
you're, you're basically admitting that you have no power and no strength before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And, and therefore, when you, when you pray on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what's appropriate for it is it that you are aware of the presence, that you, you, you bring the presence of the Messenger of Allah as if he was before you, and, and all the wonderful things that he did, the guidance that he's given us, and all of those things that we owe to him as our wasila for teaching us la ilaha Allah, for teaching us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then to remember that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself that gave prayer on this messenger of Allah and his angels, and that you're, partic- you're participating in something that Allah himself says that he has done and his angels. <laughs> So another thing about dhikr that you should avoid is what's called lahan, which is an incorrect pronunciation. You should avoid it to the best of your ability. Obviously some people do not have the ability to pronounce everything in Arabic properly. But you should avoid it and you should try to learn uh, how to say things properly. He said some of these things, this pronunciation is considered uh, a ma'asiyah or a khata, but others are actually ridda, that it can take you into uh, getting out of Islam. So, so the ajami, for instance, that people can't pronounce bad and wa, things like that, they don't make a tamiz, they say what like zalim instead of balim. Those people, if they really can't pronounce it, there's a thakam in their tongue, a heaviness, that's my bad. He has an excuse by sharia. If he's done all that he can to not pronounce it uh, like that, and yet he's still incapable, then he's ma'adur, and he still would be the dhikr, even though it's pronounced incorrectly, and he gets the reward, and there's no wrong action that is entailed by doing that. And then one of the greatest of also of the worship is uh, meditating uh, on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention in the Quran of those people who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing, reclining, and on, uh, and on their standing, sitting, and on their sides, reclining on their sides. And then he says, those who reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth. And so Allah has coupled with zikr, fikr, or tafakkur. And so it's said that the, the action of the heart, which is tafakkur, that's why the heart is there to be able to, uh, to do this tafakkur. The action of the heart is better than all of the actions of the limbs. And this is why in one narration there comes a, a tradition that says to reflect for one uh, moment's reflection is better than a year of ibadah. So he says that the signs of, of reflection are uh, four, to four directions. One of them is reflection in the signs of Allah, and another is reflection in the creation of Allah, 
and its signs, and this leads to uh, love. So that leads to love by reflecting in, in the signs that Allah has made and in His creation and the sign that the creation indicates about Allah leads to love of Allah because you see all that Allah has done for the, for the human being. And then the next one is reflection in the promise of Allah of his, the rewards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised for his creation and those signs that are related to that. And its sign uh, leads to uh, a desire uh, of the of Akhira and of these things. Because Allah promised you Jannah, so the sign that you've reflected on that promise is that you have a raghba, you have a desire for Jannah. And then there's also reflection in the punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised creation. And the sign uh, of that is that there is rahba or fear engendered. So the person avoids disobedience. And then there's also reflection in the, uh, in the, in the, in the real nature of the self, the jafa of the self the harshness of the self towards Allah despite Allah's ihsan to him. So when you think of all that Allah has given you and then you see how you respond in the little that you actually do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then uh, this uh, is a type of reflection that leads to shame before Allah. In other words, the sign that somebody has done this type of reflection is they have a hayat with Allah. They feel a shame before Allah. That Allah has done so much with them and they have not done uh, anything for Allah. Uh, أن الأواضر أن يقولوا ما يقولوا ما يقولوا ما ما يقولوا 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 so the heart is the thing that differentiates between good and evil and the source of all of these matters is related to the inrushings that occur to the heart. So the heart has uh, these, these inrushings, uh, that uh, occur to the heart. It's like a guest that descends upon the heart and there, there are different types of them. Um, inshallah, because we're not going to unfortunately have much time with Shaykh Khatri, so uh, we'll, we'll just open it up for the last section, the f- about 15 minutes before we pray Asaf, for some questions. People have questions. كيف يصير عن مثل المتصوفة الذين يشتغلون بذكر الله وقد ممكن يهملون واجبات أو أول ما يجب على المكذب وأفضل طاعتي وأفضل أعمالي تعلم العلم قبل كل شيء تعلم العلم قبل كل شيء فضل عن قبل كل شيء لا يقبل من عبدي so he, the question that Hayes asked was about people like now what they call Mutasawifa. Uh, Imam al-Maqari differentiate between Sufiya and Mutasawifa. Uh, Mutasawifa are people that give uh, Sufiya. They claim to be Sufis. Um, and, and so one of the signs often of those people is that they'll do a lot of dhikr of Allah but but they ignore wajibat. And so he asked what's his opinion and the shaykh said that the first and foremost obligation on every human being is to learn knowledge before anything. 
and a human being is nothing until he's learned the Farda'in. He has no maqam, nothing with Allah. He's nothing. It's like an animal is the same. Because uh, Allah has commanded him with a very minimal amount of taklif to learn how to do certain things. And the Farda'in, if he hasn't learned them, then he's living the life of uh, this, like, uh, worse than animals because he's astray and he's not doing anything to get out of his error. And those people who learn knowledge, and Sheikh Wad al Khadim mentioned many of the ulama, Imam Sa'arani, Imam Asiyyuti, all of the great imams of the science of the outward and tasawwuf, all say that before tasawwuf there has to be thiq. And if you don't learn thiq before tasawwuf, then you'll go astray. So even showing filial piety to one's parents, uh, learning the fard is before that, the farta'in. In other words, Allah, the highest thing after tawheed of Allah that Allah mentions in the Qur'an is better al-waridain. And yet, learning what Allah has commanded you to do as a farta'in is over better uh, al-waridain. If you have not done that and you're taking care of your parents and that's preventing you from learning, then you're doing something that's wrong by leaving something right. He just said a little bit on the car that he came to the house. أفضل ما تفعل للذكر المرأة اللي حيض لا يحرم عليها ذكر بالذات إذا كانت ذكر يحيزها كل أنواع الذكر كل أنواع القرآن لا يجوز من حيض لأنها ما كانت فتلت أوطفت أنها كانت إلا فآل إلا أو Uh, he said that the adkar that uh, she can read all of the dhikr that uh, men can do uh, but she can't read from the Quran and then the khilaf in that of how much uh, like from memory if she memorizes the Quran then she can read what she needs to keep her uh, her Quran or if she's studying the Quran but she cannot touch the Quran during her hayab and she should not read it uh, uh, like extensively unless it's to maintain what she's memorized uh, or like ta'awwud or ayat surat al-tabarak for instance she's reading or she read uh, like that but other than that she can read any of the uh, ayahs of the adhkar the adhya la ilaha illallah fala al nabi which was you talking about the previous question uh, in America, I know a whole community, I can speak to you, and I wonder what you think of, because I know that's how people are in the future, and how to approach those people, 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 and how to approach
الذين يتقربون الى الاسلام عن طريق التصوف يعني ما هم مسلمون لكن يسمعون عن معاني الروحانيات في الاسلام وعن هذه الاشياء فهذا يقربهم الى الاسلام فهو قال يعني كيف مثلا بالنسبه لهؤلاء احسن طريقه يعني من احسن طريقه people are guided by the overflowing bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if, and if somebody is brought to you for that then Allah has brought him by his bounty but he said that first and foremost that uh, we worship Allah with these ahkam and, and that's what Allah has made uh, binding upon us and people who enter into Islam uh, the first thing the Prophet taught people was tawheed and then he, t- he told them that Allah has made five prayers incumbent upon you that once they accepted Islam they were told you have five prayers so he called them first to the unity of Allah and then he called them to prayer and, and that's the methodology of uh, the messenger of Allah and that's what we should be calling people to is to pray uh, in this culture there's a whole false or pseudo spirituality which is the idea that uh, you can have haqiqah without sharia and uh, it's, it's, it's a bajalic phenomenon it's misleading people and it's taking them away from the truth So it's actually anti-spirituality. Because real spirituality is protected by the, uh, the sharia. In other words, the fruit uh, is protected by the, 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 the orange is protected by the shell on the orange. And if you take that shell off before it's ripe, you ruin the orange. And so if you try to get spirituality before you've uh, protected yourself with the sharia, then you'll destroy your soul. And you become a false, uh, you know, and this is why they have all these false people who the mutamari tomb, in the photos of that he calls them mutamari tomb. They're, they're like people who pretend that their egos are dead, but yet they're filled with all the diseases of the heart, and they only outwardly pretend to do that. Yamat Ali bin Aswili Ikhfa, Ibn Ibn Hadhada Hassan, Hassan, Yani Ikhfa. So he said, uh, you know, yeah, if you've done things wrong, you should bail out them. And if you bail out them and make tawbah, Allah will forgive them. If you do them manifest or openly, then it's much worse because it leads to uh, the, the tribulation going all over. And... Uh, And that's bad. In the hadith, the Prophet was a man, the man 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 was I'm 
عليه ان يسرعون عن الناس لعل الله عليهم يجد منه ضرعا يجد منه ضرعا عجيبا والله يضاف So he said that people should veil their fault. And he mentioned a hadith that a man came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, I did something wrong, meaning zina. So uh, punish me with the proper punishment. And the Prophet turned away from him. He left, he got up, he walked out. The, the man followed the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam out, outside the masjid and he told him again. And finally the Messenger of Allah looked at him and he said, Didn't you just do what you do and pray with us? And which, uh, in other words, he's telling you that that's what Islam is for, to purify your, your wrong actions. And the man wanted, the, had punishment, and, and he said that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does any of these uh, wrong things, these foul things, let him veil themselves with the veiling of Allah, and let them make tawbah. And he said that whoever comes to us, to our faces and admits them, then we will punish him. So the point is, is that, He's commanding us to have sitar from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, <laughs> لا تفعل الله هو خير المسك لا خير الطاعة فخط طاعة لله وفي الدنيا لا تفعل الله هو دونة بالماء لأن صحبك الأعجاب تبسط الغالب لأنها تجيب المسك تفعل المسك إلى لا يجوز وصحبك الطاعة فهو بحاجة إلى ما هو الوقت so he said, uh, in terms of dunya, you should always be with somebody uh, lower than you. Uh, or the same. But you shouldn't be uh, with people like, if you're poor, it's better not to uh, keep uh, close company with wealthy people. Uh, and the reason for that is because you'll begin to desire wealth and you'll feel... Like they have something that you don't have, uh, you'll want a bigger house, you'll want a better car, you'll want these things, and, the, uh, and that leads to love of dunya. And the same with the, uh, but then he said that for akhirah, you should always be with people better than you. Because if you're always with people lower than you, then you'll start thinking that your deen is okay and you're better than them. And the thing about the people of Allah is that uh, they tend to uh, look at themselves as being less than everybody else. So they don't really have the danger of, uh, you know, if somebody's keeping company with them, they actually see them as better than them and not the opposite way around. This is why you should keep their company. <laughs> because it'll make you feel like if that person has that type of humility, then uh, you'll feel much... Uh, see. And so people who have to come there, and see themselves as better than somebody else. And this is why they say, لا تحقروا عبدنا عسان يكون لله وليا. Don't belittle people because they might be a wali of Allah. And you never know if a person's maqam is higher than yours. Even if they look like they're worse off than you now. He might be drinking alcohol, but uh, maybe in a few years he makes a tawbah that Allah accepts, and then he becomes a wali of Allah, and, and, and then down the road you do something wrong, and the opposite happens to you. So you should never feel that you're better than anybody. Uh, in the dunya. And that's why when you see people of Akhira better than you, you should always uh, want to be with them. Then in ayat Akhira Zaman, Anna Ahla had an end, Anna end Patir al Qurum, Kadin Karab, Akharahum, Famada Mafaru, and in Karab, Akhara Shiuk and Murabdin. هذا السؤال يلاحظ ان وقعه يدل على قوة اهتمامه بنفسه وبالآخرين جزاه الله خيرا. حسب اجتهاد الوحي وهو قدر عن فقط. حسب اجتهاد عقد كلكم لا يكون بصر وجود الشيخ عبد الله بن حميده لانه ليس دائما 
في كلامي وهو قطعه لا ترفع عليه of earth, put some tents on it, <laughs> and then bring somebody who can teach you uh, a pure being, and uh, and then just go learn your being and try to practice what you're being taught, and, that, and that's the best thing for you to do. And uh, yeah, yeah, these, these, these are masoos, you know, these are fixed things, nobody, nobody, these are made up things, this is our tradition been transmitted, and you know, the world you know, Upon a qaida. He gave us a, an incredible qaida. And if you learn this qaida, inshallah, you'll never go astray. You know, Malik was asked, Man ahlu bid'ati wa ahwa? Who are the people of bid'a and ahwa? And this su'al is muwafaq. It's an incredible jawab. He said, Ahlu bid'ati wa ahwa? Kullu man samma anfusuhum bi ghayri ma sammahum Allah. Wa huwa al-muslimun. Faman ahlu bid'ati wa ahwa? Anyone that calls themselves a name other than Muslimun is from the people of Bid'a and Ahwa. So any group that has, the fact that they're a group and they have a name, and this is not uh, a name like Maliki or something or Hanafi, because that's intisab li shiyukh ajma'at al-umma ala hidayatihim. If somebody says he's Maliki, that is not the same, because that is telling you where your source of knowledge came from, based on imams that the entire ummah has agreed on their guidance. In other words, if someone says that Maliki doesn't go under that, or Hanafi or Shafi'i, Hanbali. Those four, anybody that says I'm Maliki, Hanafi, Shafi'i, or uh, Hanbali, those, those are rightly guided, if they really follow what those imams came. Because those four imams, when you read the one, I mean, Arba'a, وَقَفُوا غَيْرِهِمْ جَمِعُ مَنَعَا it's Mujma Alayhim. Those four Imams is Mujma Alayhim. It's absolutely by consensus that they're rightly guided. And so people calling to other than that. And then in Aqidah, you take very simple Aqidah from a simple Matan like Ibn Ashar, Imam Tahawi, any of those. And don't go into Furu'a, Fara'iyat, where's Allah, uh, what's, uh, Allah has a, what's the hand like, what's the, all these type things. All that is, somebody came to me and they asked me, Somebody came to me and they said, what do you say about the ayah, Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa? And I said, the fact they ask you that question is a sign they have deviation in their heart by the shahada of the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an says, anyone that asks about those verses, that means their hearts are deviated. So anytime you hear people talking about the verses of Allah that relate to mutashabihat, hazy things, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. You just leave them. And that's guidance. Uh... The question. Uh, the question was about, like, what do we do in a time when shiukh have disappeared and there's really not much of the people of Tarbiya? And so, what Sheikh Khatri said, was that that question is a sign that the person is concerned about their soul. So, it's a good question. And it's a true the condition. And he said, you know, if you're in this country, then it's good. Like, the classes you're taking now, these are good classes. Things like this, this is a good thing to do. Uh, he said that that, that that is the best thing to study and make sure the source of your knowledge is good. And he said, you know, that 
the things that we're teaching, like these mutum, these are mutum that are thabit, that are part of our tradition, and they come from a chain of shuikh. And the people like his shaykh and my shaykh is Marat al-Hajj. And Marat al-Hajj uh, is somebody, you know, who, whoever seen him, seen him, he knows who he is. Um, his knowledge is pure, the source of knowledge is pure. He's never known by anybody to have done a, a makro. Nobody who, who, who has lived with Marat al-Hajj for over 70 years can say they ever saw him do a makro. He's never been ever heard to speak a bad word about anybody by name, anyone. He's never mentioned anybody with suit. His knowledge is pure sharia. And uh, he teaches people remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's in a state like one of the people said, and jirus anduhu kal jirus andar hadar al ghaib. Sitting with him is like being with somebody who's present and absent at the same time. He's present in that he'll teach you and answer your questions, he's absent in that his heart is, is moved from this world. It's not in this world anymore. So, people like that, who are hard to find. Peace to Allah, 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 Uh, <laughs> said that the, the hymn of aspiration of a moment is aqta'u min as it, It's more cutting than the sword. So if the hymn is strong, then uh, people can do amazing things. He said, for example, Yahya, the American man that became Muslim here, he's a young man, uh, he was, I think, 19 or 20, he became Muslim. He said he was a spoiled American uh, from Mudallal, that's what he said. Spoiled American, wealthy, from wealthy family, lost gatos. And he became Muslim, and he wanted to go seek knowledge. He had a scholarship to, uh, uh, yeah, he, not scholarship, but he paid, expense paid, Berkeley, everything. And, and he actually came to me, he'd already done two years of college, and I said initially that just finish the, the university for your parents' sake, and then go. And my sister, and I told Sheikh Haddamin this, my sister Nabila said, you did an injustice to him. And I said, why? Uh, it's only two years, it'll go fast, and then uh, he can go do what he wants. She said, how, how do you know what will happen to him in those two years? Maybe he'll get a fitna in Berkeley. Maybe he'll lose his desire for knowledge right now that, that the fear is, uh, you know, in the heart. And, and I realized when she said that, Nabila told me that, I realized that she was right. And I went and I told him, uh, you know, that advice I gave you, uh, I, I was wrong. And he said, I'm really glad you said that because I wasn't going to take it anyway. <laughs> That's what he told me. Uh, 
And then when I told Sheikh Haddami, the many times he's uh, the cousin of Sheikh Khatri and Murat al uh, cousin who's known to Allah's not for him, he's Jadid. When I told him that, he said, he said, uh, when I told him what I said and then I told him what my sister said, he said, SubhanAllah, I wanted to tell you you were wrong, but my respect for you prevented me from doing that, but I'm glad your sister did. <laughs> and he said, وَأَنَا أَصْبَحْتُ أُحِبُّهَا And I have love for her because of the good counsel she gave him. Because, uh, and so he said that he's there now with Murat al-Hajj. He said he lives in a little hut with uh, <laughs> made out of tree branches uh, with some rags tied together. He said, you know, in one year you can learn Fartain. It's not very much. And once you learn Fartain, you go where you want, do what you want. Once you learn your Fartain, uh, practice it in your house. Do your job, do whatever you want. But if you have room for buying, don't waste your time with other things because it's all fair. He said anybody who is calling to Islam, uh, like in a position of any authority, then what you should ask them is teach us how to pray, teach us how to do wudu, teach us how to pray our zakat, teach us how to get married, teach us how to buy and sell. He said if they can't do that, then it's a da'wah about that, it's uh, meaningless what they're calling you to. Because that's what Allah called us to, that's what His Messenger did, and that's what He taught. He taught people how to worship Allah, how to pay their zakat, how, these rules uh, that we're supposed to live our lives by. So really that's what we should be doing. He said that, you know, some people from a, like a Da'wa group came to Murat al to call him to Islam. <laughs> <laughs> and he asked them, like, what they want to do. They want to sleep in the masjid. He said, you know, they can't sleep in the masjid. Tell them to move along. It's better for them. And then he said, uh, don't you know that uh, the Prophet of uh, uh, didn't let some people sleep in the masjid? And he said, well, that's, that's those people. So they should just get along with wherever they're going and don't waste our time, you know. And this is one, there's a sh- man who studied with Murat that had several years, and he just recently went back. He's a wealthy man from the workshop, Muhammad uh, Amin Hayr, to Sheikh Amin. Muhammad Amin, in the workshop. But then he had the Yaqra Khalil Ma'atahir. Ah, He told me once that he heard some people came to his house, they said, come to the masjid, we're having a, a da'wah. So he said, he'll go, he went, and he said, he sat and listened to a talk, and he said that he didn't, he didn't learn anything because he said that we should be taught something that's going to benefit us. In other words, something we can hold on to and take with us, not just uh, uh, words strung together or, or something, right? Because really what's destroyed uh, Islam is the lecture circuit. You know, in all honesty, I mean, muhabarat have done more to destroy Islam than anything else, I think, personally. Because uh, now people think they just go to a, le- a lecture 
and they get, uh, you know, like the pilot light gets lit on a little bit, but then the least wind comes along and it blows it out again. And, and the thing about this is, you know, learning consistently and then practicing it, uh, you will see in your own lives the difference. Because I know there's people in here, just from studying Mathara, there's change in your own life and in how you view things and how you can see it. Because I can see it, you know, and if I'm teaching a class, then I know people, other people. Because, I mean, you can't read these things but and study them and teach them and learn them except you get affected by them. Unless you are just a complete, uh, you know, hypocrite or something, and I don't think any of you are. So that's the point, is that how do we get from A to B and then B to C and C? Like Muslims want, now they want to go from A to Z without going through the alphabet. They want this Dawla Ismaniyah, they want the Hukuma Rashida, they want all these things, and they don't want to do the means that we need to get to that thing. And these are why all these groups that call to Islamic government, what do you do to Shaykh Abdurrahman, the uh, cousin, he's the... Uh, nephew of Sheikh Khatri. Sheikh Abdurrahman told me he was in the Gulf and these people were telling him we have to get a government, Islamic government. He said, uh, let me ask you something. I'm the ruler of the Emirates and I give you the government today. What, what are you going to do? What, what's your economic plan? Uh, what are you going to teach the people? What are you going to put on the television instead of what's on it now? Because once you have it, then what do you do? Because it's easy to say we want it and uh, Islam will help, Islam's the solution and shout slogans in, in marches and all these things. But if somebody stops one of those sloganeers, pulls them out of the line and says, what is this solution that you're talking about? All he has is a slogan. Because he really doesn't know what it is. He just has this vague idea and that's the same as communism because that's what communists talk about once the revolution's over, Everything's really great. Well, they had their revolution, and it was a disaster, right? Because there wasn't any program. It was all just lies. So that's the point. <laughs> we should pray now. I, I know there's uh, more questions. Jazakallah khairan. اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم، ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم، ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. He, the section that we're going to do uh, quickly and that I want to go to the sheet that I've given you is uh, the section on the treatment of the diseases with remembrance of Allah. The, uh, there's no better treatment for the diseases of the heart than with this one. Somebody said, إِذَا مَرِضْنَا تَدَعْوِنَا بِذِكْرِكُمُ وَنَتْرُكَ الذِّكْرَ أَحْيَانًا فَلَمْ تَكِسُوا Which means, if we get ill, meaning we have diseases of our heart, then we treat ourselves with your remembrance. And sometimes, we abandon your remembrance and we have a relapse. So what it means there is that, the diseases of the self are treated by dhikr of Allah. And when you leave dhikr of Allah, you, you have relapses of those diseases. So if you get angry, and at the point you get angry, you, you remember Allah. And this is what Sayyidina Omar, one of his uh, people from his shura, uh, had a cousin who was just kind of an ignorant type person. But he said, listen, get me in with Omar. Because in those days, Omar had a... Hajib, and he was the ruler of a large uh, portion of land, and, uh, and the Muslims, so this man wanted to get in, 
and he 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 brought him in because he was uh, one of Sayyidina Omar's shura, and the man was his cousin, so he got him in with him. And when he stopped, he said to Sayyidina Omar radiallahu Ya Omar, أعطيني مما أعطاك الله فوالله ما أعطيت جزرا ولا حكمت برعدل أو عدلا He said, give me something from what Allah gave you meaning like money and he said, because you're somebody that hasn't given out much and you don't judge with justice Now Omar got really angry and humma bihi you know, he was actually going to do something about it and then his cousin immediately said to Omar يا يا أمير المؤمنين ألم تسمع تسمع بقول الله تعالى وأرض عن الجاهلين you know just turn away from ignorant people and when he did that Omar completely stopped and and the Rawi says وكان وقافا عند عند كتاب الله he was doing only what the book of Allah told him so the point is his anger and he was justified in his anger because the man was just uh, he said a lie and uh, he also insulted uh, the political authority right? I mean there's ways to speak to people and you, you shouldn't insult them because uh, it's a disrespect for the, uh, the, the authority of Islam, the Khalifa uh, but the point is, is when he immediately, the man reminded him of the Quran he stopped and so that's the meaning here إذا مرضنا, like with غضب تداوينا بذكركم we treat ourselves with your remembrance. But sometimes we leave the dhikr and then we have relapse. And so what he's saying here is that all these diseases can be treated with dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he begins with dhikr kafir. So do a lot of dhikr. Come from the ayat in Quran. Ya yalladina aminu udkur Allah dhikran kafira. Do much remembrance of Allah. Right? And many ayahs in the Qur'an uh, encouraging us to do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the verse in the Qur'an which says, وَلَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ ذَا إِسْوَتُنَ حَسَنَةً You have in the message of Allah the best example. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْفُ اللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا So if you look, the only people that are going to benefit from the messenger of Allah's example are people who do a lot of dhikr of Allah. Because those are the people that their character will be changed. And the word in Arabic for, for uh, tazkiya, zakah, means to grow. And zakah, like zakat, means to grow. Yuzaki means you need me to make something grow. So tazkiya to nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if, if it wasn't for his bounty, none of you would have grown. Ma zaka minkum ahad. Min ahad. So the, 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 the tazkiya of the self is a result of work. And the spiritual work that you do is, the, is dependent on the dhikr of Allah that you do. Uh, uh, praying the prayers on time is the most important thing. That's, that's, if you're not doing that, forget everything else. Sayyidina Omar ibn Ma'ana wrote to his, uh, to his uh, Ummal, and it's in the Mu'at of Imam Malik, in Bab al the, the time of the prayer. He wrote, and Abu Musa al Shari was one of his Ummal, and he said, رضي الله عنه he said إني لا أرى من أهمي أموركم الصلاة I consider prayer to be the most important thing that you do in your life فمن حافظها وحافظ عليها فقد حافظ دينه so whoever guards his prayer and is vigilant about it about its time he has guarded his deen ومن ضيعها فهو لما سواها أضيع and whoever is negligent about his prayer everything else he's going to be more negligent about so if you're not getting the prayer right, then you've got your priorities wrong about everything. So prayer, in its time, with its ahkam, you have to know what's fault, what's mandub, what's sunnah mu'akada, so that you can pray properly. You have to know how to do istidraq of your prayer. So that's related to fardain. So if you're, there's people now who do a lot of dhikr with a subha, and uh, and then they don't do their prayers. There's people that will stay up all night for like a moment and be doing dhikr and then they sleep through fajr. All that they did in the night is a complete waste of time. Waste of time, completely, nothing. Because if that caused them to miss their fajr prayer, there was no good in it. None. The fard is the most important thing in your life. So the most important... 
foremost thing that you, you do is your prayer. And your prayer has to be based on wudu and doing wudu properly and with its conditions also. And tahara. The Prophet ﷺ said, Wayru lil aqabi min al nar. Woe to the aqab from the fire, people that don't do the wudu and guard their wudu. And then he also said, people will be punished for yin that they weren't concerned about, that spilt on them. So guarding against najasa, these are all uh, things and ways of remembering Allah. And that's why the, the, they say, أَفْضَرُ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ ذِكْرُهُ عِنْدَ حَدِّهِ The best remembrance of Allah is to remember Allah when there's a had of Allah. So somebody who's doing dhikr all the time, and there's a riwayah, it's, it's apocryphal, it's not, I don't know the transmission, but it said that Dawid salam saw a group of people remembering Allah, and he was impressed with them, and then it was revealed to him, uh, that they, those people are of no worth in the sight of Allah because if one woman uh, offered herself to any of them they would have gone with her so the point is is that outwardly a person uh, if they look good if they look strong if they look all these things and they're not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or if the taqwa is not there when the hadd of Allah is coming then it's of no benefit and so then so he says وَالذِّكْرَ كَثْرَ وَالْقُرْآنُ خَيْرُهُ The best dhikr is Qur'an. And the best dhikr of Qur'an is Qur'an with tadabbur. Recitation of Qur'an with tadabbur. Which is reading Qur'an, understanding its meaning. And the more you read Qur'an with understanding, the stronger the iman becomes. That's why Qur'an uh, Qur'an with tadabbur is so important because it will actually increase your iman. And then he says, إِلَّا بِمَشُورِ عَفِهِ غَيْرُهُ Now this is important. What he means by that is, مَشُورِ عَفِهِ غَيْرُهُ is when the only time the Qur'an is not the preferred dhikr is when other things are uh, to be done at that time. So for instance, after Fajr, the best dhikr is to do the adhkar of the, of the sabah. It's actually better to do the, the adhkar of sabah at that time than it is to read the Qur'an. After Maghrib or after Asr, the best dhikr is to do the adhkar of the Masa. And those are actually over the Qur'an at that time. Uh, and, and that's because the Prophet Sallallahu did those at that time and he encouraged us to do those. No, that's what we're going to go into. It's the, uh, the thing that you have in front of you. And then he says... وَأَدَرْ Then he says, وَدَّ بِالِسْتِغْفَارِ وَالصَّرَاتِ عَلَى جَرِيدِنَا إِلَى الْخَيْرَاتِ Begin with istighfar. The reason that you begin uh, your dhikr uh, with istighfar is because dhikr uh, is for tasfiyah. And, and tasfiyah is to be purified of what, the, what has accrued from previous wrong actions. And so by beginning with istighfar, you're asking Allah to remove your wrong actions and then you, the, he said the prayer on the Prophet. And this is traditionally the most common uh, word that was given was istighfar, salah ala nabi, and then tahdeel la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, la ilaha illallah a hundred times. So istighfar a hundred times, prayer on the Prophet a hundred times, la ilaha illallah a hundred times, and then the ikhlas and the ma'awi the ten three times each. And that was, that was very common for people to do as a practice. Uh, and you should do istighfar at least a hundred times a day. Probably a hundred in the morning, hundred in the evening. And then do it throughout the day. And then he said, وَأَدَى بِآذَابَ الصَّرَاتِ وَاحْتَمِي مِنْ لَحْنِهِ فَهُوَ مِنَ الْمَحَرَّمِ Have the adab of the prayer and guard yourself from any lahm. Uh, adab of, of the prayer on the Prophet ﷺ is the adab of the prayer of salah. So you should have the same adab that you do when you do dhikr. You should do it... Uh, for, like the prayer. If you're not in Wudu, you should do Wudu. You should be in a Tahir place. Now this doesn't mean like when you're traveling in your car, it's encouraged to do if you want to recite Quran or do the If you don't have Wudu, then that's all right. You can do it without uh, the, from your memory, without the Wudu. It's preferable to be in the Wudu, but if you're in a situation to remember a line, you don't have Wudu, then you can do that. Right? So, and it's better to stay in Wudu all the time. If you're able to. No one will protect his wudu except for a mu'min. Is listening to the recitation of the Quran considered better or worse than other? No, that's good. You know, to listen, it's better to recite it. Because when you listen to it, the only thing you get is your ear. When you recite it, 
And that's why the, the Urdu say to recite from the Mus'haf is more reward than reciting it from memory. Because the eye gets reward, the hand holding it, uh, there's more musharaka in it. Right? So it's actually better to read from the Mus'haf. But if, if you uh, memorize from the Qur'an, I will allow you shiikh that I saw, like in Mauritania in particular, because so many people memorize the Qur'an, and they rarely even use a Mus'haf. The people that, you know, in fact, one Sheikh I knew, he told me he hadn't touched a Mus'haf in probably about 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, but also that's a Bedouin environment and books get ruined very easily and traditionally that's why they memorized everything because the books got lost. Whereas you live in the cities, the books are always there. Part of the, and that's what one of the things that in one of Plato's dialogues, when the man who invented writing brings it to the king, the king tells him, this is a terrible thing that you've done. He said, why? He said, people will lose memory, and they will rely on the pen. So he saw the bad thing. I mean, obviously there's great benefit, and a lot taught with the pen, but also, there's, you know, having easy availability. Like, one of the things about, in modern Islam, traditionally, because the Qur'an was not published and the ulama of, of the Ottoman Empire gave a fatwa of the prohibition of printing the Qur'an originally. Uh, they considered it haram because they considered pounding uh, the letters and pounding with a sacrilege to the Qur'an and that it should be written with the pen and should be done by a scribe and, and not by a machine. And that, that was a standing fatwa for 400 years. Yeah, they did not print the Qur'an. The Qur'an was actually printed in, in Europe before it was printed in the Muslim lands. So, uh, but the point is, is that people don't realize that the Qur'an now, because there's so many, and it's, people don't treat the Qur'an anywhere near the respect that they used to treat it with. People put the Qur'an on the floor. Uh, you see, you go into a mosque, I always judge a mosque by the Qur'ans in the bookshelf. Always. That's all you have to do. You look at the... the and Sheikh Abdullah al-Qadi, one of the things that most impressed me about his masjid in Lahsa, where his Sheikh teaches, the Qur'an are all in perfect order. Every time... And they read from them. You see, everybody reads them at, at Jumu'ah. Everybody's reading. At the end of the Jumu'ah, they're all back in perfect order. And that's from Sheikh doing their teaching them. You go to other places. Every time I go, there's mosques in there. Every time I go there, I look at the thing. It's always... Really bad, and that's all. Some are upside down, some are on the. That's all bad adab. And adab is that's what our deen is all about, learning adab with Allah and with creation. And then it says, beware of lahan, which is bad pronunciation, because it's muharram, uh, unless you can't do otherwise. So for instance, ba'daha ala al hawiya. So if like for the muhalliman or madda hamzahu biya. So if you say, like, la, if you say, la ilaha illallah, like you go that ilaha, la ilaha illallah, so like, that's haram. Or you say, la ilaha illallah, ha, as if there's an alif there. It should be pronounced properly, la ilaha illallah, like that. And then he said, asa bi ijma'in min al-umasi. So the ulama have considered it by ijma' to be a prohibition. Wa abdul ilaha bin ma'asi, and he has worshipped Allah with wrong action. And it's in the Khazina, Khazina al Asrar, which is the book of one of the ulama. Kama bin Sarraha fi fi Khazina, min nawarat karamu sakina. And then he said, La buddha fi zikri bi kulli harfi min wasihi fi makharazin wa wasihi. So when you do zikr, you have to do it with every harf that's in it from its foundation and its description. And this is learning tajweed, ahkam of tajweed, because you should use tajweed for your dua, the adhan should be done with tajweed, uh, the hadith uh, should be transmitted with tajweed, and uh, when you do the alkar like of the salah and nisa, it's you should do it with the proper makharij al huruf, where the huruf comes from, and also the rules that apply to them. Um, and then, al ibadati wa tafakkuru. Uh, the best of ibadah is tafakkur wa khayruhu al-fana al-maqam al-akbaru and the highest is what's called al-fana and al-fana comes from Imam al-Junaid uh, and Imam al-Junaid called al-fana'u which in Arabic literally means extinction 
And this comes from the idea uh, that the, the months, uh, the months experiences uh, separation. Right? In other words, each one of us has an experience of separation from other people. And one of the things that you notice about a child is that they don't really have the, when a, chi- a newborn does not have that experience. There, there's no, there's no uh, mass. There's no eye. There's no focus of the self. Right? And you can see it because even the way they look around, there's, there's no, there, 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 there's no uh, centralization. And what happens is they begin as the child comes in to its identity, which is its animus, uh, then it begins to see itself as separate. Right? Uh, now, Juno had said that the, what happens in deep spiritual practice is that there's, there's, there can be experiences. Some, the, the, one type is called a, a han, right? Uh, which a han is, is when somebody is overcome with uh, a spiritual state uh, that uh, often it's uncontrollable. I mean, it is uncontrollable. If it's, uh, and the ulama of this science differentiate between hal and maqam. The maqam is actually higher than hal. The maqam is where you're fixed in a state, a condition. So maqam of toba is where you can't do ma'asiyah because you're in the maqam of toba. And I have a of toba and you're in a, a, in a maqam now and so it's, you can't do things wrong wittingly. The hal of toba is when, for instance, somebody's doing wrong actions and suddenly an intense state of remorse overcomes them and they ask Allah for forgiveness. Right? So that's, that's a hal, but it's not a maqam. And the maqam is better because it continues. Maqam is zuhud, is where somebody is in a station. Hal is zuhud, is, it, it, it's a hal that takes them. And it might not, it doesn't last. So a person might go into a hal of zuhud, or they might go into a hal uh, of toba, but it doesn't last. So the maqam is over the hal. And, and then you have what's called a radid. And a radid is a, a, an inrush that comes into the heart, uh, very powerful, and it usually floods the heart with light, and there's, a, there's an incredible expansion that can happen from that. And that's also a temporary type state. What, what he's saying is that the highest, and there's something after fana which is called baqa, but Imam Junaid said, al fana is when the self is no longer aware of itself. That in other words, there's, there's a, 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 a ghibah that takes place. There's a loss of the experience of the self. And this does not last because if it lasts, you call it insanity. Right? I mean, it's, and that's why spiritual psychosis is real. There are people that actually go into uh, experiences that they can't control or understand and they get uh, sick. And uh, it happens all the time in this culture. There's a lot of people that do meditation uh, and go, like, uh, get into Zen Buddhism or get in, and they start doing a lot of meditation and they literally can lose it completely. Uh, and, and that's why it's so dangerous to be doing these things uh, without the protection of prayer, without protection of wudu, without protection, because Islam is all grounding. You know, we're not we're not trying to get these spiritual experiences. It's we're to be grounded. That's what Allah's commanded us to do, to be grounded. But if you do get it, which Allah commands you to do, and you do it properly, then often there are certain things that will happen in, interiorly in the inner self, and those things there's a science of the. Dis- of, of understanding them, which is part of the science of the khawatir, knowing if it's from shaitan, because shaitan has a lot of games that he can play on people that are doing these things, or if it's angelic, or if it's from the mess, 
And this is one of the things about new age people, is that most of the stuff that happens to them, because they do have these experiences, like people that go into new age religion, or do go into Zen, or go into Kundalini, that like fire yoga, you do this Kundalini breathing, uh, things like that. Uh, in this culture, there's a lot of people that do these type things, and they do have experiences, but they, they can't distinguish between the satanic, the nafsanic, and the uh, angelic, and the rahmanic experiences. They, they can't. They don't know how to distinguish between them. And most, most of what's happening to them is, is from shaitan and the nafs. What's that? Possession. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Possession is very real. Like people open up themselves to a gym to come in. Absolutely. You hear? Doing dhikr? They do what? Uh, group dhikr? Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, about group dhikr. Um, so anyway, this idea, this what fana is, is simply is that the, the, the experience of the self, uh, the person who's doing dhikr, uh, is, is no longer aware of the self. And, and uh, that can happen. And he's saying that is the highest of hukur. And this is why uh, when uh, Sayyidina Ali's son, not Hassan or Hussein, but one of the other sons, ha- was struck with an arrow and they wanted to take it out from him, uh, they waited till he went into prayer. And when he went into prayer, they pulled it out and he didn't feel it. And, uh, and that's somebody who's really in that state of the, the self is absent. Right? The self is completely absent. And there are people like in India, yogis, that can do very radical things through meditation. They can endure incredible uh, pain and things like this. So this is not uh, limited to the Muslims in terms of that there are, you know, the, the, the psyche has extraordinary powers. But what the, the Muslims recognize is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person is sincere, or if a person is remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can put them in a state of absolute uh, witnessing with Allah where they don't, they're not aware of their surroundings. And many, many of the, I mean the Sahaba obviously, uh, many of them were in that state. And this is the, one of the interpretations of the hadith that I, my slave does not draw near to me by anything more beloved to me than the far. And he will continue to draw near to me with the marathon until I love him. And when I love him, I become the eyes of which he sees, the, the ears of which he hears, the tongue of which he speaks, the hand with which he grasps. And if he seeks refuge in me, I give him refuge. If he asks me, I give him. That hadith in no way means that God becomes man, which is called hiru. Hiru is haram uh, to believe that. And if you believe that, you're outside of Islam. Hiru is the idea of incarnation. And that hadith in no way means that. And anybody that believes that is a zindiq, the heretic, out of Islam. So we don't believe in divine incarnation. We don't believe in that. We don't believe that God becomes creation. That, that's like Christian, Hindu, all those types. But we do believe that the human being can be in such a state of awareness of the fi'l of Allah because there is a fi'l of Allah that is, is part of creation. In other words, it's, it's actually uh, when Allah, like the, the whole world is a fi'l of Allah, but we don't say it's Allah. And, and there are people that go into a state of absolute witnessing where they see everything being the fi'l of Allah. In other words, they're seeing Allah behind all of creation. So they don't see otherness in the same way that other people are in this world of separation. And, and that's why they recognize that everything's from Allah, the good and the bad. And so they see it as all good. So and that's why for the mu'min, everything is good. That's what that hadith means. Even though it's good and bad, it's all from Allah. And because it's all from Allah, it has to be all good for the mu'min. Because even the bad, there's a wisdom in it for him to grow, to be purified, and to draw near to Allah. So he sees the bad even as good. 
And that's why Allah says, I say to Hibbu Shay'an, Wahiya Sharun Nakum. Maybe you love it and it's bad for you. Wa Asan Takra Hushan, Wahiya Khairun Nakum. And maybe you heard a thing, but it's good for you. And Allah knows and you don't know. So that, that's the idea of, of, of being in the state of Mushahada and Muraqaba with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. to do is just go through and that's you have that sheet in front of you now there, there obviously you're going to find many different versions of this uh, which is these are called al Sabah wal Masa and my recommendation for myself and all of you is to the best of your ability to try to do these every day um, if you can't do all of them there are certain ones that you definitely should do and I'll point those out now this particular one, we do not have a specific word from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In other words, we do not have anything that he left that says he did this and then he did this and then he did this. So whenever you see these, they are going to be the, the formulations of different shiuk. And uh, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq has one, Safina Tun Naja, Biman Ila Allah which is a very nice one. It's all from the book and the sunnah. And one of the things that Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says is that you should do the awrad that came down from the Messenger of Allah before you go to any du'as that are written by uh, other people. It is permissible to read du'as written by other people as long as they knew what they were saying. In other words, if they were known to be ulama and to be uh, people of Allah, then the du'as that they wrote, the sahaba had du'a, the tabi'een had du'a, uh, and they come down uh, to us. Right? So there are, are salawat that come from other mashayikh. But what Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, if you're not doing the du'as and the, uh, the dhikrs that the Prophet told us we should do every day, and you're preferring other people's over theirs, then something's wrong. That's what he said. And, and Saqabi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi said at the end of his book, Qanun al-Tawil, he said that you should, he said that shaitan's first and foremost task for the Muslim is to get them away from the remembrance of Allah. But he said if he finds them uh, doing much remembrance, then he will try to get them away from doing the remembrance of Allah that's from the, sun, the book and the sunnah. And to get them doing uh, remembrance that is from uh, other people. or other. So that, that's a strategy of shaitan. And so the, the nice thing about this is the word of Shaykh Abdullah al-Haddad, who is from the Sada, he's one of the Shurafa from Yemen. And he's considered a mujaddid also of the 12th century. And his grandson was one of my teachers, Sheikh uh, Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad, rahimahullah, who wrote uh, Muftah al-Jannah, which is translated into English. And uh, so I took this uh, from him, uh, and he took it from his father, who took it from his grandfather, who took it from the author himself. And uh, he begins it by Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and that comes from the hadith, that anything worth doing, if it does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, it's cut off with, from Barakah. So anything that you, that's worth doing, you should always do in the name of Allah, the Merciful of Passion. And then you can do it with Qadhu Allahu Ahad, three times. And this comes from a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, أَيَعْجِزُ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَخْتَمَ الْقُرْآنَ كُلَّ يَوْمْ uh, is, uh, uh, is one of you incapable of reading the Quran every day one time and, and they said who could do that Ya Rasulullah and they said uh, if you recite uh, uh, Ikhlas uh, Ikhlas Yu'adru Thirath Al-Quran it, it actually is the equivalent of one third of the Quran in its weight and meaning and so by reading it three times we hope for the reward of reading the entire Quran and so it should be read every day Preferably after every prayer, but at least in the morning and the evening. And then the next two are called the Mu'awwilatayn. And Mu'awwil means the thing that gives you refuge. Ta'wida. And Ta'wida is protection. So the Mu'awwil uh, gives you protection. And the Mu'awwilatani are Qur'a'udhu bi Rabbil Faraq wa Qur'a'udhu bi Rabbil Nas And you should do those every day And there's a hadith saying you should do them before you go to sleep 
right? And then you uh, cover yourself, which is a protection from the jinn, John and Shayatin. So he says to do that. And then, Rabbi, أعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بك ربي يحضرون Three times there's a hadith that says people should do that three times. This is seeking refuge in Allah from the hamazat of shaitan. And hamazat, wait in the kulli humazat in lumaza. Hamaza means like to goad somebody on. Like, go on, do it, do it. So the hamaza of the shaitan are those whisperings in the soul which is telling you to do things that you shouldn't do. And so you're seeking refuge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the hamazat of shaitan. And one of the signs of the end of time is takfir al-hawsat, that people's minds will become uh, uh, just where, where the, it's all whispering, that's all they hear, is whispering. And it's really interesting now if you think about this, is that so, much, so many people hear all the time music, uh, films, television, all these things, and all of that is from shaitan, I guarantee you. All that stuff is from shaitan. The whole lot of it, lock, stock, and barrel. And so what you're allowing Shaitan to do, day in and day out, is to literally not only whisper, but give you visual images as well. And those are all going into the heart. And so what you're doing by, by exposing yourself to that stuff is you're destroying your heart. And, and so people are walking around with all these images that come to their mind and all these songs and all these... Uh, jingles and advertisement jingles and, and music and everywhere you go now in stores and, and department stores all these it's all hausat just all this shaping constantly bombarding people so this dua is a protection from the hamazat of shaitan yeah the, the nafs have, have uh, impulses as well Three times. Rabbi, a'udhu bika min hamazat al-shayateeni wa a'udhu bika rabbi an yahbaron. So I seek refuge in you from the girding of shaitan or the insinuations of shaitan, of the shayateen, and I seek refuge in you, my Lord, that they should become present. Mm-hmm. You say those separately three times? Yes, separately. You, know, you, you say it, Rabbi, I would give you the hands of the Shaitan, and I would give you the hands of the Shaitan, and then go back and say it again. Like that. What's that? Hmm? Sports. Sports, you Well, most sports has aura involved in it. Uh, the, the majority of sports has aura. They have people's flesh that you shouldn't be seeing. Huh? You know? So like it's shorts, you should not see the thighs of another human being. Right? I mean this is all, this is their deen. Allah said, لَكُمْ دُونَكُمْ And Allah says, don't, don't, don't be with people who take their life as a la'ib wallahu, play and pastime. In fact, they call uh, baseball in this country the national pastime. Right? اللَّهُ وَالْدَوْنِ Huh? That's what it is. Allah al-Dawni. Huh? Al-Watani. Right? The national pastime. So, go out. I mean, if you want to, to go out and p- play some sports, at least you get some bodily exercise. But to sit on a thing, I, I'm sitting, and I'll tell you, I'm telling you, in all honesty, when I was growing up, baseball was like, I mean, that was like my life through high school. That was all I cared about was baseball. You know, and it's just, it's a waste of time. That's all it is. I can't even wa- I couldn't watch a game. You couldn't pay me to watch a game now. I'm really serious. And I used to, I loved baseball. You know, and football. I, you couldn't pay me to watch it. You know, and I went to somebody's house, uh, who, and they were watching the Iranian American soccer game, right? And I did, unfortunately, indulge a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but it was at the person's house. I wouldn't do that on my own. I would not waste my time. But it was a company. I was at somebody's house. But th- those type things, uh, it's just a waste of your life. That's all. And you need to decide how much you, how much is an hour of your life worth? You know, 
how much is it worth? How much is two hours of your life worth? How mu- if you could sell it, if I could buy a year from you. People will sell their kidneys now. You know, they'll sell their kidneys. If I could buy a year of your life, how much would you sell it for? You know, how much is it worth? It just, it just depends. You know, people, once you start realizing you're going to be accountable for your life, and not only for your life, but for every minute, and it's the greatest gift that Allah has given you after Iman is Haya, you know, life itself, and Afia, and, and health, then what, what do you do with what Allah has provided you for? We were created to, to utilize our time. Which doesn't mean you can't enjoy yourself, but it should be in Mubahat, because Allah said there's Mubahat things that you can do. Right? Muslim, and that's why the Prophet Wasallam, when, when there was a wedding, he asked them, did you bring some entertainment? And he, and they said, yes, and he said, because the Ansar, they like entertainment. And then he said, I like to show the Jews and the Christians that we have some fusha in our religion. In other words, we've got some room. We're not prudes. We're not people that, you know, don't enjoy ourselves and there are times for things. But what's happening in the life now, this whole country is just, it's one big low. It's all just for entertainment. The whole thing. These people, that's all they do. They work to be entertained. They work so that they can have money to go out and entertain themselves. And so you, you know, we all need to disengage from that. Wean ourselves from this society. We need to do it. Just wean yourself. Cut, cut the nipple off. You know, don't stop sucking from the breast of dunya and the breast of lahi. Right? And it's nice, you know, it's nice sit back, watch a good movie for a couple hours, and, and then what? And there's always the empty feeling afterwards, right? Like you just wasted two hours of your life. <laughs> right? I mean, everybody, it's, that's the end. In the end of it, you watch it, and then what? Why did I do that? Right? It's all a trick. It's just the trick you into it and, and that thing. So, have uh, I or have I And then the next one, أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثَ Do you see it right there? <laughs> Do you think we created you, Abbas, just for fun? Did we create you in vain? Right? And you won't be returned to us? And you're not going to come back to us? فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَرِكُ الْحَقُّ لَا إِلَىٰ إِنَّهُ رَبِّ الْعَشُرِ الْكَرِيمِ Exalted is Allah, the King, the truth. There's no God but He. رَبِّ الْعَشُرِ الْكَرِيمِ The Lord of the noble throne. وَمَنْ يَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرَ لَا بُرْهَانَ لَهُ بِهِ فَإِنَّمَا حِسَابُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يَفْرَحُ الْكَافِرُونَ That is an ayah of Qur'an, but it came that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to say it every day. وَقُلْ رَبِّ غْفِرْ وَرَحْمَةَ خَيْرُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And say another ayah, and this is a dua, Oh Allah, forgive, have compassion, and you're the best of those who show mercy. And then another ayah which the Prophet used to say every day, فَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ حِينَ تُمْسُونَ Glory be to Allah when you come into the evening, وَحِينَ تُسْبِحُونَ And when you come into the morning, and this is the idea of doing adhkar at those times, مَسَا sabah. This is the time to say, SubhanAllah. وَلَوْ الْحَمْدُ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعَشِيًّا وَحِينَ تُظْهِرُونَ And he has praise in, in the heavens and the earth, and in the evening, and at dhuhr time. And this is the proof for also the ayah that looks at the five prayers. Because the prayer of uh, Hina Tumsun is Asr prayer, Hina Tusbihun is Fajr prayer, uh, and then uh, Ashiyan Wahina uh, Tuzhirun. Uh, the evening prayer is the Maghrib and the uh, Isha prayer, Wahina Tuzhirun is the Dhuhr prayer. Mm-hmm. Is the, the dua for Forgive and show mercy and you're the best of those. I mean it's a general, but it's ifir li and you're asking this is this is rise for yourself. And then uh he brings the living from the dead and the dead from the living. One of the meanings uh, the Mufasir mentioned is uh like chicken comes from an egg, but you know the human being came from a dead, inanimate uh, source. Uh, but also, I meaning is he brings iman from kufr and kufr from iman. 
So that's also the spiritual meaning that dead hearts come to life with Iman and living hearts can die by becoming, uh, going into Kufa. And then the prophet, and he said, and, and you bring the earth back to life after it's died. And like that you will raise us up. So that's also an indication that the heart can come back to life. Because the Ard in the Quran uh, is used also in the Jazz and the Qalb. And that's a traditional tafsir. So Allah brings the, the heart back to life with the remembrance of Allah after it died from his forgetfulness. And then the Prophet used to say this ta'weezah uh, with Samir Alim. A'udhu billahi Samir Alim min al-Shaytan al-Rajim. That's one of his ta'weezahs, three times. And then this verse of the Qur'an was recited by the Prophet. It comes that he used to say this also in the morning and the evening. And that is uh, the ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبْلٍ لَرَأَيْتُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشْتِ اللَّهِ Had we revealed this Qur'an to a mountain, you would have seen the mountain humbled, shattered, from the khashya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And khashya is fear with knowledge, right? Unlike khawf. Khawf is fear like a, a rat can have fear, but a rat cannot have khashya. So the khashya, even the yakhshya Allah min ibadihi, the ulama are those who have khashya of Allah. And that's why the Messenger of Allah said, Ana akhshakum lillah. Because khashya is only the people who have knowledge. And he was also, Ana a'lamukum billah. I'm the most knowledge of you, of Allah. So he was akhshakum. So what Allah is saying is, this Qur'an has so much knowledge in it, that if it was even revealed to a mountain, which is an inanimate thing, that, a, that you would see that mountain shattered and humbled from khashya, from a fear that resulted in a knowledge that came from the meanings of the Qur'an. So that's why tadabbur of Qur'an will lead to khushu' will lead to humble awareness of Allah. And then Allah says, وَتِرْكَ الْأَمْثَادِ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ These are analogies or likenesses that we strike, similitudes that we strike for humanity. لَعَلَّهُ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So that they will reflect. Does the first means that the Jabal has knowledge? Some of the ulama say the Jabal is alim, because that's one of the words for an alim. Jabal, who a Jabal min al Jibal. Like they say, Imam Shafi'i kana Jabalan min al Jibal. He was a mountain from the mountains. So it means if it was revealed to anybody who, who was uh, powerful in their knowledge and understanding, that the Quran would shatter them. Right? But Allah also in the Quran He said in the Arabna Amana Ta'ala Samawati wal Ardi wal Jibad we we uh, gave this opportunity to the heavens, the earth and the mountains. And Allah they say Allah began with the heavens first because it's his greatest creation. Greatest in terms of its awesomeness. Uh, the Messenger of Allah is his greatest in terms of maqam. But in terms of the awesomeness the, the heavens are greater than anything. If, if, and only the astronomer is the only one that can really understand that. And then the next is the earth itself, and then the mountains. So Allah uh, said that, you know, where they, they, they all... And that refusal, they say, is not a refusal of Imad. And then Allah says, Who Allah alladhi la ilaha illa hu, He is Allah, there is no God in him. al ghayru wa shahada, the knower of the seen, the unseen, al-ghayb, or shahada. Shahada means the seen. It also means the testimony. And that's because all of the, this shahada, everything that you can see is testifying, la ilaha illallah. Right? That's why the poet, he said, ya ajim al-kiri, asur ilaha, al-kiri, jahadu jahidu How wondrous is it that a man can uh, disobey Allah, or a man can disbelieve in Allah. What a strange thing. Wa fi kulli tahrikatin. Uh, and uh, and in every movement and stillness always there is a shahid, a witness and everything in creation is, is testifying that Allah is one so the shahada 
is this world and, and the meaning of this world is la ilaha illallah that's what the whole world is saying to the human being and he is the one that can decode that right and that's why uh, Allah is alim al ghaybi wa shahada the shahada is the sinu wa huwa al rahman al rahim huwa Allah la ilaha illallah the miracle of Quddus the king the, the holy the sanctified Quddus as salam the complete it doesn't mean peace uh, peace, salam here does not mean peace. Uh, and it's wrong to call Allah peace. Like we mean in, that's not what it means. And mu'min and muhaminu, the believer and the overseer, the guider, right? Uh, the mu'min means really the one who makes others safe, right? Who gives them amen. And muhaminu, the one who oversees everything, is in control. Al aziz, inestimably precious, the great, the powerful, magnificent. Al jabbar, the compeller, the one who compels people and things to do what they do. Uh, المتكبر, the exalted, the magnified, the great. Subhanallah, amma yushirikun, glory to Allah above what they associate. And subhan in Arabic means tanzih. What you're doing is you're saying Allah is not like anything. When you say subhanallah, it's tanzih. You're saying Allah is not like anything. Anna yushirikun, huwa Allah al-khaliq al-bahu al these three attributes. Al Khaliq is the one who can, cons- the closest approximation, and I don't like to use these words because it's problematic in Tawheed. But Al Khaliq, the three stages of creation is Khaliq, Bar, and Taswir. Khaliq is that Allah decides to create. And He has the Qudra, the Ilm, and the Irada to do those. And when those three come together, then you get the tanjizia of creation. In his ultimate reality, Allah has that sulhiya. It's always there. His power to, to be khaliq is always there. When he decides to create, he is al-bari. In other words, the, the, the decision is khaliq. When he actually brings it into existence, that's al-bari. The one who brings it. And this is called bari'a. Right? Creation is like the Prophet is called khayr al-bari'a. Bari'a is the thing that the bari has brought into existence. Musawar is the fashioner. In other words, like for a, a fetus, you would see it that the khaliq is the one that determined that there would be a human life. The bari is the one that, uh, that formulated the semen in the man, the ovum in the woman, brought them together. And then the musawar is the one who uh, fashions the creation makes all the cells emerge, the liver becomes a liver, the brain becomes a brain, the backbone becomes, that's musawwir. Now, all of these, in reality, are, you're, it's, there's no linearity to Allah. So, Imam al-Ghazali says, these are only facets, and because human beings are, they can only look at things from, we can only see one part at any one time. Allah is telling us what He is, in the, in the multifaceted uh, reality. But it's only multifaceted from our limited perspective. In reality, it's all, it's all one. It's Allah. Right? So attributes are only approximations for human beings to understand because we're in time and our intellects are limited. And so these are just facets of the same creational process. That, that's, is, that, is that clear? Allah has the most beautiful names. Everything in the heavens and the earth, and ma there's لغير العقل, everything, even rocks, atoms, everything is, is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وهو العزيز والحكيم, and he is العزيز الحكيم. And then, سلام على نوح في العالمين, إنا كذلك نزل المحسنين, إنهم من عبادنا المؤمنين. Now I don't know if this uh, came in. I don't. I, I don't know if he got that from a hadith or uh, this uh, ayah in the Quran. But I don't know if he got it from a hadith or that's his own ishtihad. And one of the wisdoms I think behind this uh, this ayah being in the word is that in a sense we are for the moment he is like uh, this is an age of Nuh. In other words. There's a massive flood coming, really, and all of us know it, right? 
And when you start telling people, most people are going to laugh at you. And you start building an ark in this age, which is trying to get ready for the akhirah, people think you're a fool. So what Nuh was doing in his time, the movement in this time, it's very similar. People, if, you, if you're concerned about akhirah now, people think you're stupid. What do you, there's no, uh, why are you wasting your time? Do this work, and even Muslims, even though they won't say it literally, because they don't want to say they don't believe in akhirah, but all of their actions would indicate they don't believe in akhirah, because all they're concerned about is dunya. And when they see Muslims that are concerned about akhirah, they tell them, Ya akhi, why don't you do something, uh, you know, get, get, you know, for your dunya. Right? dunya abada. So, the, right, and then I forget the second half. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's using a hadith anyway. It's not a hadith, it's a saying. Some say it's in the said it. And then I told the interpretation of Sheikh Bashir, I remember Bashir told me, Rahimahullah, he said, if you, if you really took that hadith, uh, that word seriously, he said, if you have early, to live forever for your dunya, you'd put it off. Whereas if you only had one day for your akhirah, that's what you'd be worried about. <laughs> so it's like the opposite of the way people understand that. So, Nuh alayhi salam, you know, in the Kadaq, Nazir Muhsinim, that's how we reward Muhsinim, by saving them from the flood. Because they believed in Allah's wa'ad and wa'id, and they prepared for it. And, and one of the things Sayyidina Malik radiallahu anhu, the Imam, said that the sunnah is safina to Nuhim. The sunnah of the Messenger of Allah is, is the safina of Sayyidina Nuh for the flood of Bid'ah and Kufr and all these things. He's from our servants, the believers. And And then the next dua, you have to say this every day. If it's my, one of my shaykhs, Sir Hamid Abu Rabi, told me, if you don't do any dua, at least do this one, these next two, every day. If, if, if they're the only ones you do, do them. And there's a riwayah, but this, this is seeking refuge in the complete words of Allah, all of them, from the evil that, that He created, that Allah created three times. Whoever does that three times in the morning and three times in the evening, the hadith says that he will not be harmed or afflicted by evil in that day. So that dua should be said every day. The next one, Bismillah al-Ladhi la yabru ma'a ismihi shay'un fi al-ardi wa la fi al-sama'i wa huwa samir alim Three times, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says that three times uh, in the morning will not be uh, harmed by poison or uh, animals that bite and things like that. So it's a protective dua. And people know the famous story of Khalid ibn al-Walid, when some Christians, uh, he, he was telling them that in their belief, they did not believe that anything could harm uh, them with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Christians brought him some poison and said, well, let's see you prove it to us. Now, don't try this, right? Because <laughs> we're not Khadid even Walid. <laughs> but uh, Khadid, Rabbi Anu, said this dua and drank it, and no harm came to him. Right? And that's the iman of Khadid even Walid. So, that's a really important one. And then the next one, hmm? yeah, three times morning and three times in the evening. The next one, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says this every morning three times has fulfilled the gratitude of that day. In other words, if you just say, well, that's all Allah wants you to say. And if you just admit this, then you've done, you've given shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma inni asbahtu minka fi ni'matin. Oh Allah, I have come into this morning with ni'mah, in a blessing. Wa'afiyatin. 
وعافيه اللهم اني اصبحت منك ذي نعمه وعافيه ان ان عافيه جود هيلث وستر ان فيلد فروم ماي رونز باي يو فاتم اور اتمم بس تو روايه فاتم نعمتك علي وعافيتك وسترك في الدنيا والاخره So fulfill your blessing upon me uh, and your afia and your veiling in the dunya and the akhirah three times. Allahumma inni astahtu minka bi ni'matin wa afiyatin wa sitrin fa thumma ni'matika alayhi wa afiyatika wa sitrika fi dunya wa akhirah three times. The next one, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever recites that four times, it's as if they freed a human being from bondage. That's the equivalent of the reward of doing this. So, Allahumma inna astahtu ishiduka, O Allah, I come into the morning uh, calling you to bear witness. Wa ushidu hamadata arshika and the angels that carry your throne. Wa malaikataka and all of the angels. Wa jamila khalqika annaka anta allahu la ilaha illa anta wahtaka la sharika la wa anna muhammadan abduka wa rasiluk. So four times to say that, Oh Allah, I come into the morning calling you to witness and calling your throne bearers, uh, your angels and all of your creation that you are Allah. There is no God but you alone without partner and that Muhammad Wasallam is your servant and your messenger. And then... This one, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Hamda Yuafi Ni'amahu wa Yukafi Mazida. This hadith also, this is fulfilling all the hamd and shukr for all the ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, when Marat al Haj, uh, Allah, when, when we asked him for like a wasiyah to give to people, that's the dua that he gave. And, and he says that one, I've heard him say that a lot. Uh, الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا يوافي نعمه I praise Allah the Lord of all the world a praise that is appropriate to all of his ni'am when you talk to him and, and, and also uh, reciprocates this hand uh, is recompenses all of the increase that he gives us and then this one is a dua that the Prophet Sallallahu said that if you say it then it removes all of uh, the shirk and a protective dua which is Amin to Buddha al-Azim I believe in Allah the Magnificent wa kafartu bil jibti and I disbelieve in anything which is magical wa ta'huti anything that is associated or worshipped with other than Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala وَاسْتَمْسَكْتُ And I have clung بِالْعُرُوَةِ الْوِفْقَى to the firmest handle which is the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the Deer of Islam لَمْ فِصَانَ لَهَا And this handle will never break off As long as you cling to it then you're safe لَمْ فِصَانَ لَهَا It does not separate There's no separation that occurs وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ And Allah is سَمِيعٌ and عَلِيمٌ And then the next one the Prophet ﷺ said whoever says this uh, three three times, uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, this is uh, uh, Ridwan. So the, you get the Ridwan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what you're saying is, Rabbitu billahi rabba. I am content with Allah as my Lord. Wa bi Islam al and with Islam as my deen, wa bi Muhammadin, or bi Sayyidina, it's not in the world, but. Uh, the shiikh, this is mukhalifah to adduban, which we talked about. That it's permissible to add sayyid uh, out of to adduban. Like Sayyidina Ali refused to remove uh, Muhammad Rasulullah. Uh, so, uh, but you'll see them both. But, but the actual what comes wadid is the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nabiyya wa rasulah. So I'm content with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad as my prophet and my messenger. And then again, the next one is comes down in many of the Prophet Wasallam said that we should say this seven times in the morning and the evening. Um, and I can't remember there's a reward that goes with this, and I can't remember what it is. Hasbi ala ulaa ilaha illa wa arayta wa kalt wa hu rabbara ashta seven times. Uh, Allah is enough for me, there's no God but Him. I have 
uh, put my trust in Allah and He's the Lord of the Magnificent Throne seven times. And then Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. This is a very short uh, uh, dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a prayer on him. And we know in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Jibreel gave him Bushra that man salla alayya wahida sallallahu alayhi ashara. Whoever says uh, prayer on the Prophet one time, Allah says prayer on him, which is rahma, right? Allah gives his rahmah on him ten times. So he's saying to that ten times, which would be the equivalent of a hundred times of Allah's rahmah upon you. Uh, and it's, it's preferable you should at least try to do prayer on the Prophet a hundred times in the morning, a hundred times in the evening. Uh, and Sayyidina uh, Uthman ben Khodiyo for a bit long period of his life did it five thousand times a day uh, as a practice. Right? And, and, and Sayyidina you know, Jazuli, he used to do, uh, for 14 years he did Bilal Kharat twice a day and Khatam of Quran once a day. And 114,000 times Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim every day. He did that for 14 years. And they said when he came out of his khalwa, people made tawbah just by seeing him. <laughs> He lived in Fes at Madras Safarin for the people that were there. He was there, that was his room. And in fact, he was in that room so long, and he memorized one of the uh, really difficult books of uh, Madaki Fiqh there, which is several volumes. He memorized it by heart. He was a great Madaki scholar as well. He's a faqih. But he, uh, they, they, they were saying that he had a treasure up there that he was hiding. You know, people talk and they think, why is he up there? And he never leaves. He must have some gold up there that he doesn't want anybody to get. And so, they went to his father to convince him to go up there, because he wouldn't let anybody come up. And there was a ladder to get to it. So his father came out to come up, he let him up, and when he came up, he had written moat, which means death, all over the walls. <laughs> and there was nothing in the room. And he just, he said he realized, his father said he realized, some people in that valley and other people in that valley. You know, he was just in a completely other world. <laughs> yeah, like, well. uh, if you say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you would do it, if you do it like that, there, then it would be Sallama, with a Fatha. But if you did it, like that, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa sallim, like that. Uh, there are two different ways. This form in Arabic is a form of dua, even though you're using the past tense, it's actually a dua. Like when you say rahimahu Allah, what you're saying is may Allah have mercy on him. But you do it in the past tense, tafa'udan, that, that Allah has already done it, it's just accepted. So you say rabi Allahu anhum, sahaba in past tense. But you could also say, Allahumma ardi an Abi Bakrin wa Amra wa Uthman wa Ali. You could say ardi, you know, to do it in the, in the dua. That's a dua. So when you do it like this, salli, you're doing a dua uh, a different way. You're doing it with the sirat al dua or sirat al amr. This is sirat al dua. Okay? And so there you would say salim with a kasra. And that's the way he's doing it there. So you do that a hundred times a day if you want to say the whole yeah, you, there's different ones you can do. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad abdik wa rasulika nabira ummi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. That's a very common one. This one's easy because it's shorter. So you could do a lot of them. Uh, and this is actually the seerah, I think, that the shayhu used. And then after that, Allahumma inni as'aruka min fuja'at al-khayri wa a'udhu bika min fuja'at al-sharri. This is a dua to say that the Prophet used to say with me, Oh Allah, I ask you for good surprises and I seek refuge in you from bad surprises. Now, fuja'a is something that happens suddenly, like a surprise. So it's asking Allah for, to make good surprises happen in your day and not bad ones. And then, uh, Allahumma anta rabbi da ilaha illa anta. Now this is called Sayyidul Istirfar. And the Prophet said, and it's in the Sahih Hadith, 
that this istighfar is the Sayyid of istighfar. It's the lead lord of all the ways of asking forgiveness. This is the best way to ask forgiveness. And, and, so you say, Allahumma anta rabbi, oh Allah, you're my lord, la ilaha illa anta, there's no god but you. Khalaqtani, you created me. Wa ana abduka. And I'm your servant. Wa ana ala ahdika. And I'm on your ahad, the ahad of Islam. Wa wa'dika. And your promise to forgive and to enter me into Jannah. Mashtapatu. As best as I'm uh, capable of. So, in other words, as best I'm able, I'm doing what you commanded me to do. And then, أَعُوذُ بِكَ I seek refuge in شَرِّ مَا فَنَعْتْ From the evil that I have uh, perpetrated. مِنْ شَرِّ مَا فَنَعْتْ أَبُوءُ لَكَ بِنَعْمَتِكَ عَلِيَّ I uh, go... It's like I return in admittance that all my blessing is from you. So, أَبُوءُ لَكَ I'm admitting to you or returning all my blessings to you. They're all from you. And then, وَأَبُوْ بِذَنْبِ And I take full responsibility for my wrong actions. In other words, I did them. They're mine. I admit them. فَغْفِرْ لِي So forgive me. فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَغْفِرَ الْذَنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْ Because only you can forgive wrong actions. So that's Sayyidur Ishtafaq. And then, Allahumma anta rabbi da ilaha illa anta alika tawakadhu anta rabbi ra'ish da'adhun. This is another dua that's worded. Masha Allah kana, whatever Allah willed was, wa ma lam yusha' lam yukun, and whatever he didn't will was not. Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa bi mahr alayhi da'adhun. And this is sometimes to do when situation, musibah, calamity, you just, Masha Allah kana, wa ma lam yusha' lam yukun, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa bi mahr alayhi da'adhun. It's just admitting uh, that. And then, I know, I know, and Allah ala kulli shayil qadir. I know that Allah is powerful over all things. Wa anna Allah qada hafa bi kulli shayil ilma. And that Allah encompasses all things in knowledge. Allahumma inna a'udhu bika min sharri nafsi. I seek everything from the evil of my soul. Wa min sharri kulli dadda. And from the evil of every creature. Anta akhidun bi nafiyatiha. That you have taken by its forelock. Inna Rabbi ala sirat al mustaqim. So this is a reminder of Tawheed that every creature is has Allah has them by the forelock. So the evil is only because Allah brought them to you, because Allah has them by the forelock. So if you seek refuge in Allah from the evil of others, then Allah will protect you from the evil. What's that? Yeah. يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك استغيث من عذابك استجير. There are many hadiths that indicate يا حي يا قيوم is the اسم الله الأعظم. You get خلاف about it, but it's a powerful dua to call on Allah. يا حي يا قيوم. There's a hadith of doing it before Fajr, forty-one times also. So it's it's a powerful. Those two names are very powerful names. برحمتك استغيث I'm seeking سكور في يوم مرسي ومن عذابك استجير and I'm seeking إجارة which is safety from the punishment أصلح لي شأني كله rectify all of my affairs ولا تكلني إلى نفسي and do not leave me to my own soul ولا إلى حد من خلقك طرفة عين and don't leave me to anyone from your creation, even the blinking of an eye. So you be the one, my tiklan. Don't make me depend on anybody else other than you. This does not mean that you won't get help from others, but you'll only see that it's Allah. So what he's saying is, don't make me think that other... Ja'far al-Sadiq, radiallahu anhu, once a, uh, uh, an atheist told him he didn't believe in Allah, and Ja'bar al-Sadiq said to him, Have you ever been on the sea? And he said, Yes. And this was probably cut from him or something, but the man said, In fact, I was once on a boat, 
that uh, a storm came and it was such a heavy storm that the boat actually was ripped to pieces and all the sailors drowned and I was left clinging to a board and he said but then the ocean took the board from my hands until there was nothing left and then he said then what did you do he said I, I was flung by the ocean to the shore and I survived and so Ja'far radiallahu said to him when you got on that boat you put your trust in the boat and in the sailors and then when Allah took those away from you you put your trust in that little piece of wood that you were holding on to and he said when you lost that wood where did you put your trust then he said did you hope that you would survive and he said yes I hoped that I would survive he said who did you hope for where, where was the raja in other words you're there about to drown and you have this hope that you're going to live in, in what did you put the hope because hope has to have an object in the Arabic language there has to be an object to hope right rajotu it's muta'addi it's, it's there has to be so he was an Arab he, had, he knew they had, so he said من من كنت ترجو السلامة from who and then he said Ya Abdullah and he told him servant of Allah the one that took away all your means and then saved you in spite of, of all the means being taken away from you that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay. so that that's what he's saying that's a kinni ila nafsi wa la ila ahadun min kharqika tarafata aynan and there's a riyah wa la aqalla min darik and not even less than the blink of an eye اللهم إني أعوذكم من الهم والحزن. This is something that the Prophet and Sheikh Khatri told me that somebody came to him once and told him he didn't have a job and he gave him this dua and he got a job a few days later. And that comes from a dua in which a man came to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasul Allah, I have all these debts and I'm in him. I have all this worry and hazan. And the Prophet gave him this dua. And he said he started reading it and Allah took care of all his debts and then he, uh, he lost his grief. Right? So, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wa a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal So, in other words, I seek everything in you from ham is from the past. Or ham actually from the future. Ham is where you're worried about the future. So it's anxiety about the future. And Ham is where... Uh, ham is where there's a concern, and Ram is where there's no concern. Ham and Ram are similar, but one has an object and the other doesn't. There's no real reason. So Ham and Hizan, or Hazan, uh, Hang is for the future and Fizan is for the past. So you're seeking refuge of Allah from grief about the past and from anxiety about the future. And, and there's another in the Quran, Allah says, Ara in the awliya Allah, la khawfun alim wa rahum yahzanun. They have no fear about the future, nor do they have grief about the past. Right? So getting out of you know, this is about getting into the present tense. Because um, there's no past and future for Allah. Right? And, and so if you're in a state where you're in a state of awareness of Allah, the past is of no concern and the present of no concern. Because the past, you can't do anything about it. And the present's in the hands of Allah. You don't know if you'll... I mean, the future's in the hand of Allah. You don't know if you'll make it to the future. All you have is the present. So there's no point in worrying about the past or in having anxiety about the future. So this is seeking refuge from the hammi wal hazan. Wa a'udhu bika min al ajzi wal kasal. And I seek refuge in you from the ajiz is the one who is incapable of doing something. But he has irada. He has desire but he doesn't have qudra. So irada bila qudra. The kasman is the one who has qudra but, but no irada. He has the ability but he doesn't have the will. 
So the Lenzi Allah the Sigi Ramkin, both those can be you don't want to be an either one. You want to be somebody who has Qudra and Irada. You want to have the ability to do what 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 you, you need to do and you want to have the irada to do what you should be doing. So seeking refuge from ajiz and kasal are are two important things. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْجُبْنِ وَالْبُخْلِ And you seek refuge from Juban and Bukhal. Juban is, is, uh, Jaban is a coward. And, you know, the word in Arabic, Jubna, is curded. Like, a, a coward is somebody who, they, they're not firm when they need to be firm. They turn into, like, curded cheese. Right? They don't have stability. Sabat. So it's seeking refuge from the inability to give yourself with shaja'a when you need to. Bukhal is the, 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 the cowardice of money. So juban is the cowardice of your wealth, of your body. And bukhal is the cowardice of your wealth. And those are the two things Allah asked you, He bought from you. In Allah starah min al-mu'mineen, anfusuhum wa amwadahum bi amadahum al-jannah. Allah bought from the believers their selves and their wealth and against it is paradise, right? So, they have to do jihad with what? Amwadihim wa anfusihim. And let me know how they do He said, do the amwadihim wa anfusihim. If you're jadam, you can't do jihad with your body because you're a coward. If you're bakhir, you can't do jihad with your wealth. Because you're a miser. So, by having jubal or bukhud, you won't be able to fulfill what Allah has purchased from you. And that's why it's really important to seek refuge in Allah from jubal, min al jubni with bukhud. Wa a'udhu bika min ghalabat al dain wa qahr al rijal. And I seek refuge in you from overwhelming debt and from being overpowered by people, by men. And the reason these two are put together is because. Uh, if you look historically, in fact, one of the reasons of Allah, Adam, if you look historically, the Muslims, the way the Kuffar uh, overcame us was through debt. Uh, I guarantee you, anybody study the history, you'll see this. The first thing that the Kuffar started doing was loaning the Muslims money. And when they were incapable of paying, they got them to a point because they were interest loans. They got them to a point where they couldn't pay the loan and that's when they started demanding uh, concessions. Right? That's when they started demanding concessions. And so, debt is a way that people get control over you. And that's why in this country, this whole country is designed to get people into debt. I guarantee you, the tax laws are designed for people to be in debt. And, and the bankers did that because they want control and they know make people economic slaves and they were slaves. Because most people will not accept to be uh, uh, physical slaves, right? They'll rebel. People don't like to be taken into slavery. They'll rebel. But economic slavery, people feel guilt. And in fact, the word for debt in German truth is the same word that we get for guilt. Because when you're in debt, I'm indebted to you. We use it as a metaphor. I owe you something. So, by being in debt, people are felt to be, you know, weak and they become slaves. So this is a very important wisdom in seeking refuge from debt and from being overpowered by people because they go together. Right? And that's why there's a hadith, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْدَّيْنِ وَالْدَّيْنِ وَالْكُفْرَ Beware of debt and kufr. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, أَتَقْرِمُوا بَيْنَ الدَّيْنِ وَالْكُفْرَ قَدْ بَلَىٰ do you, uh, do you put debt and kufr together? He said, yes. <coughs> and then, there's a hadith of Ibn Abbas, anhu, of Abbas, his uncle, who said, Ya Rasulullah, he asked him of Allah for a dua. And he said, Isa lillah al-Afiyah, ask Allah for al-Afiyah. The ulama said, if there was anything after Islam better to ask for, and Afiyah actually includes Islam as well. But if there was anything better to ask for than Afiyah, the Prophet would have told his uncle Abbas. So, asking Allah for Afiyah, which is a, a well-being, spiritual, physical, economic, everything. It's a well-being, Afiyah. 
فاهم؟ اللهم اني اسالك العافيه في الدنيا والاخره ان الدنيا والاخره اللهم اني اسالك العفو والعافيه عفو الله عفو العفو فور فورجيفنس والعافيه ويل بيينج والمعافاه الدائمه ان كونتينيوز ويل بيينج ترى الله يعافيك دائما and there's another one I said okay tamam al-afiyah with dawam al-afiyah to complete the afiyah and to make it go on so asking for afiyah is really important fi dini wa dunya wa ahli wa mali so I ask you for this well-being in my being in my dunya in my family and in my wealth so it's really important the, all these dawas are amazing Allah mustur awrati oh Allah veil my nakedness awrati min ya uyub You know, like, they are my wrong action. وَآمِنْ رَوْعَاتِ And give me a security from those things that scare me, that frighten me. آمِنْ رَوْعَاتِ And this is why one of the things Allah gave to the people of Badr is He made them sleep at the time that they had the worst fear. Right? As a way of giving them this amin, this feeling of peace. So Allah can take your... Ra'a and he can make it so you're peaceful and you have no fear and one of the things that really affected me about somebody there was an article about somebody he's actually considered a real bad guy so I, I, I don't want to mention his name but he was uh, fighting in Afghanistan and he was in a battle where it was like pitch battle he said and they really thought that they were going to die and there were Russians all over and he was in this uh, trench And he fell asleep. And he said an incredible peace came over him. And then when he woke up, he was like completely, all of his fear was gone. It was a hero that day. And it was like a big day for him. It changed turning point was up but the point is that thing that he experienced is, is, is amen that Allah gives people uh, uh, from their ro'a when Allah asks for it you know and that's an amazing thing to do if you experience that it's very powerful so that's what you're asking for there and then Allah محفظ من بين يدي ومن خلفي وعن يمين وعن شمال ومن فوقي وعود بي عون التان واختار من تحتي so فوق أن تحت لما الشيطان right says he swore لا قد أن لهم شراطك المستقيم I'm going to wait uh, on this straight path ثم لا تيأنهم من بين أيديهم ومن خلفهم وعن أيمانهم وعن شمائلهم ولا تجد أكثرهم شاكرين I'm going to come for them on the right on the left, in front of them behind them on the left so you're seeking refuge from Allah you see from all these places where shaitan can come from and also where the adab of Allah can come from because it either comes from folk or tah right so you don't want these things so it says this is a complete putting yourself in a complete state of protection in this dua you're protecting yourself from you're covering all corners because Allah is muhitam bil ibad Allah is encompassing his wallahum min wara'i muhit Allah encompasses all of them. So, so putting, asking protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَعُوذُ بِعَظَمَتِكَ الْأُغْتَارَ مِنْ تَحْتِي And I seek refuge in your majesty and your greatness, magnification, that I should be assassinated or killed, غَيْلَةً like, like uh, by trickery from under me, which is amazing. And you think about that. اللهم أنت خلقتني وأنت تهديني وأنت تطعمني وأنت تسقيني وأنت تميتني وأنت تحييني Oh Allah, you feed me and you give me drink and you cause me to die and you bring me back to life. أصبحنا عرافة طرات الإسلام We have come into the morning and for the evening you will say I'm saying now. But next week I'm going to do another uh, one which is for the evening, which is different from this one. So, but if you want to do this in the evening, if you didn't do it in the morning and you do it in the evening, instead of أصبحنا you just change it to I'm saying now. Same place.
و على كلمة الإخلاص and on that pure word لا إله إلا الله و على دين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم و آله وسلم and on the deen of our prophet محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم و على ملة أبينا إبراهيم حنيفا مسلما و ما كان من المشركين and on the ملة of our father Ibrahim عليه السلام the father of, of our Tawheed our father Ibrahim عليه السلام uh, his ملة and uh, he was a Hanif inclining towards truth, a Muslim in submission, and he was not from the polytheist. Allahumma bika asbahna, O Allah, by you we have come into the morning, wa bika amsayna, and through you we come into the evening, wa bika nahya, and by you we live, wa bika namur, and by you we die, wa irakin nashur, and to you is our gathering. And if you do that in the evening, then you say amsayna, and then asbahna, and you change it to wa irakin masir. Right? In the evening, it's, you switch around, I'm saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you don't say, you. And to you is our end. No, you say, I'm saying that. You, first you say, if you did it in the evening, you say, Allah wa bika amsayna wa bika asbahna. You just reverse it. And then the next one, asbaha wa asbaha al-mulku, asbahna wa asbaha al-mulku lillah, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We came into the morning and the entire dominion came into the morning for Allah. And all praises to Allah, the Lord of the world. Allahumma inni asuruka khayra hadhi yawm. Oh Allah, I ask you for the good of this day. Fatahu, it's opening. Wa nasrahu, it's victory. Wa nurahu, it's nur. Wa barakatuhu, it's blessing. Wa hudahu, and the guidance in it. Allahum inni asaluka khayra hadhi yawm wa khayra ma fihi. Wa a'udhu bika min sharri hadhi yawm wa sharri ma fihi. And there's, it might be in there, Allahum inni asaluka min khayri hadhi yawm. Huh? Allahum inni asaluka khayra hadhi yawm wa khayra ma qabrahu wa khayra ma ba'du. Is that what it says in there? Huh? There's two different riwayah. One says, خَيْرَ مَا قَبْرَهُ وَخَيْرَ مَا بَعْدُهُ uh, Yeah, you're going to get, there's a few different uh, transmissions of this. I don't, I think that one's different from, slightly from this one. So don't worry about it. They're all valid. They're just different narrations that come on these. And then, uh, <coughs> اللهم ما أصبح بي من نعمة أو بأحد من خرقك فمن رحتك لا شريك لك فلك الحمد لك الشكر على ذلك أو الله uh, no uh, no blessing has come to me this morning or anyone from your creation except that it's from you alone you have no partner and to use the praise and gratitude for that سبحان and then the, the, the Subhanallah wa bihamdihi a hundred times, Subhanallah al Azim wa bihamdihi a hundred times, those all come from different hadith. Uh, and you can do those uh, if you have time, but what I would definitely recommend doing is the du'as. And if you do these for a little while, you'll memorize them. If you do them every day for a while, they'll, they'll, you'll just be able to memorize them. Because they're not hard. And you can learn a lot of Arabic through that for people that are studying Arabic as well. So those are all... Uh, those are all adkar that are wadded from the Prophet Wasallam, and I would encourage myself and all of you to do them every day uh, they're a protection um, and, and if you do them you, you, you're just you're putting yourself in the zimnatillah those hadiths say whoever does this he's in فَهُوَ فِي ذِمَّتِلَّهِ حَتَّى أَنْ يُصْبِحْ if he did it in the evening وَهُوَ فِي ذِمَّتِلَّهِ حَتَّى أَنْ, أن يُنْسِحْ if he did it in the morning he's in the protection of Allah so the, it's a protective uh, that you're creating. It's just a barrier of protection that you're creating in the unseen through these du'as that were given to us by the Messenger of Allah. And people now are in need of these things more than ever because there's, there's shayateen everywhere. Really. If we could see the unseen world, uh, I'm telling you, we'd all pass out because there's demons all over the place right in this area we're in. Really. And they're all whispering and doing all these things. They're everywhere. And what you're doing is you're creating uh, a space around you that they see it, they have to back away. It's all in the unseen world. But they see it, they have to back away. And there's other people that don't have that. So they can break in and get in and do their damage. 
So don't, don't consider this insignificant. This is really important to do because you want to have this protection. And I guarantee you, if you practice that, I know some of the people that I've already given this to, if you practice this, you will see the difference in your life. I, I guarantee you that. If you're consistent with this and do it, you will get to the point where you will feel horrible if you don't do it. You will not feel good. It'll be like, you know, going out without brushing your teeth or combing your hair or you just, you won't feel good. And, and that's a blessing because uh, you want to stay in dhikr and in protection from Allah. And first and foremost, we should do this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he told us to remember him. But Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says, the fact that the Prophet has given us targhidat, you know, these reasons to do it, that should also be an encouragement. But ultimately, we should do these as a way of remembering Allah and showing gratitude to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without even seeking the reward and the benefits that come from them. But there are rewards and benefits that come from them. And if you do them, uh, you'll, you'll get them inshallah. So, mm-hmm. I just, I just have not to consider it significant. I and mean, one of the things I see a lot is that I mean, this type of thing is, is really not possible. It's not, it's, what is this way of you know, Muslims used to do these things all over. If you go, yeah, now, because the kuffar took us away from the remembrance of Allah. That's what they did. Shaitan wants to make you forget Allah. And we're in bad shape. I mean, that, that's the point. We, we've lost our deen. Right? I mean, people now are considered good Muslims if they're just clinging to the prayer. I mean, there was a time when, I mean, many could not do the prayer. It wasn't an, a societally acceptable, it wasn't an option. Everybody did the prayer, you know. So things have changed a lot. But I've been to places where people do these things every single day. The women, the children, if people just do, this is part of their life. And, and you can still go to places like that, in the Yemen, in the Sudan, in places, the places where colonialism had the least impact, you will find these at most practiced. I guarantee you. And the neurosis of this society is they don't leave time. Everybody's in a rush. They get up in the morning, they're in a rush. In Islam, the morning is a time of tranquility. It's sakina. You start your day with sakina. Oh my God, I'm late. You know, I have to get up and rush and jump in the shower, get out, go out, get the hair, run out of the thing. This is what they want to do. They're in this ajala. And this is the age of ajala. If there's one word that defines the modern world, al ajala too. And we know what the source of ajala is. And the kuffar used to know that as well. They have fast food, fast computers, fast cars, fast airplanes, fast railway, right? Fast television, zappers, you can do. Now even movies are fast. They're like, you know, watch, don't watch. But in the old times, really, in the 1930s and 40s, things were very slow. You know, there was conversation, there was actually dialogue. And people would sit in the room. Right? And there were films, some, like uh, one of Hitchcock's films, which was considered one of his best films, takes place in one room. And they just talk the whole film. What's that? <laughs> the, uh, now, it's all MTV. Right? <laughs> you, you, you know, you'd be trying busy. What happened? What, what? You know? It's like they want people to watch it five or six times to kind of work out the plot or work out, and then they find there is no plot, and that's the whole point. They just wasted your time. So, the, it's all speed. Really, it's all speed, and that's what Shepard's doing, just speeding it up. Go faster, faster. Right? Faster. Can you, no, Pentium, it's not fast enough. Invent something faster. What? That only does 180 copies a minute? No, no, get it 200. Right? This word is an obsession, complete obsession, right? And that's shaitan. Haste is from shaitan. That's a, haste is the devil's work. That's an old English proverb, right? Haste is the devil's work. So, this is, you know, take time with Allah. Be with Allah. Take time with Allah in the morning and in the evening. Just take some time, sit down, uh, do your wudu, sit down and stir your soul, literally, and do this thing and do them in a state of sakina and you'll get the benefit from and then you won't you know you'll probably end up not being able to work for a computer company so then you have another problem I don't know what to tell you
uh, this is the problem, right? They think I'm going to make everybody these Daraish or something. <laughs> There's a difference of opinion about that there's one valid interpretation is that you can enjoy a portion of the world. Another interpretation, which was a very traditional one, was don't forget what Allah has given you and use it for Allah's sake. Layatan sama asibat min dunya means don't forget what Allah, because it was revealed about Qarun who was one of the richest uh, of Bani Israel, and, but he was arrogant and he, and he, so the point was, don't forget what Allah has given you. Use it for the sake of Allah. That's, they were doing it as a mo'idah to, to him, to warn him. And I'm not saying, you know, the Buddha, we're not, we're not Puritans, and we're not, uh, you know, really. This is, Christianity is that whole thing of deny the world, deny. The Muslim, he wore the best clothes, he lived in a very nice house, he had the best perfume, he had the best horses. That was Imam Malik Rabbilana, and nobody faulted him for that. One man, you know, complained he was a Zahid, and Imam Malik said, everything I'm doing is, is, uh, is acceptable. And, and so the Muslims traditionally are well, not people that deny themselves. In Allah, Allah loves to see traces of His ni'mah on His servant. So if Allah is giving you wealth, then Allah likes to see you, uh, you know, in, in a good state. And if Allah is ha- like Shaykh Khatri, one of the things about Shaykh Khatri, uh, he's not a wealthy person. He can't, I mean, people who, who know where he lives, where he's, he's a, but he has a izzah. And Shaykh Khatri, he wears good robes. Right? The robes he wears, many times those robes he wears, those are the robes of rich people. The reason that he does that is not, he, he, it's not like he cares about the robe. It's muru'a. Because if you don't dress like that, people treat you uh, low. And, and so the ulama actually said, initially in the early part of Islam, they used to wear uh, very rough clothes. And this is something the Sufiya took on, muraqa'a. And this is why when Sayyidina Omar went to uh, Sham, Sayyidina Mu'awiyah was wearing a very excellent robe, a shami robe. And it was all ornamented, and Omar got upset about him. And Sayyidina Omar, Sayyidina Uthman, what Allah wanted, said, these are people, if, if you wear what we, we're used to wearing in the desert, they'll treat you like uh, you're nothing. So what he, what he was indicating there, there's a hikmah in that. Now Sayyidina Omar did take off his robe and put on a good robe, and then he, he was on a donkey, he got on a barzun, and then when he got on it, he, he, he got off and he actually put it back on his, his, his other robes he, he refused to do it and he just said أَعَزَنَ Allah bil Islam وَإِذَا تَرَضْنَ الْعِزَ فِي غَيْرِ الْإِسْلَامِ أَذَلَّنَ Allah. Allah gave us dignity in our Islam not in all this outward trapping and, and if we seek the Izza in other than that Allah will, will humiliate us so that I mean Allah and interesting when we went into uh, Ayla the Jerusalem in their books, they, they knew that the man who victory would open it up had, I think, 73 patches on his robe. And they counted the robes on Sayyidina Omar, and he had, 70, he had 73, the number that was in their book. So, how 72? 17? Uh, maybe. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm doing that. Uh, just about the last thing, somebody asked me about Vikar in the uh, group. Um, there's a khiraf about dhikr in jama'ah. The uh, Imam Ma'ala considered it to be a bid'ah makruha. In other words, it wasn't haram, but he, the, only, the thing that troubled him was uh, that he did not have a nas that indicated that the, prof, the Messenger of Allah or the Sahaba did it. Imam Shafi considered it to be permissible and there was nadab in it. And he used the proofs uh, from hadith that indicate that there was, uh, uh, even though it doesn't, ha- there's a weak hadith that the Prophet came in and there was a group doing dhikr and a group uh, te- learning. And he sat with the people learning and he said, Inna I was sent a teacher. But he didn't make inkar out of the other group. Because of the weakness of that hadith, it's hard to get a, a hukum on it. But there is another absolutely sound hadith 
which says that Allah has malaika sayyara, traveling angels, that look for hilaq al-dhikr, yaltamisun hilaq al-dhikr, they're looking for the circles of dhikr. And when they come upon them, they descend on them, and then when they go back to Allah, Allah asks them, how did you find my servant? And, 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 and then the hadith said, Wallahu a'lamu bihim minhum. Allah knows better. He's just, this is to teach us. And they said, Wajadnahum yusabbihunaka wa yuhallilunaka wa yahmadunaka. We found them saying, Subhanallah, la ilaha illallah, alhamdulillah. And it says that they were in a halaqa. Now, some of the ulama say it's permissible to come together, but not to do it on one voice. Right? Because the hadith does not indicate that there was one voice. Other of the ulama said, there's no prohibition of doing it on one voice. وَأَصَلَ الْأَشَاءَ الْإِبَاحَةَ And dhikr is permissible, and so they don't see that there should be any prohibition, because there are definitely uh, hadith that indicate that they did say things together, uh, like takbir and things like that. So you're going to get khilaf issues. The majority of the scholars, particularly the later scholars, permitted it. The Mahidun actually encouraged it in Morocco, and they actually encouraged reading the Quran from one voice together, and they, they created a, a, a sunnah in Morocco that continues on to this day, which was having the Quran completed every, every month in the Masajid of Morocco. Um, and they do that to this day. And the Wahidun started that. And the reason they did is because they said people have stopped reading the Quran and if we have a hizb in the masjid, then there will be many people that will read it just because it's there and it's a good thing to do. So it's like encouraging them to do it. And so they said it was better that people read and do khatam of the Quran than that they don't read it. Ibn al Hajj disagreed with them in his madkhal and said it's still a prophet he liked uh, to hear poetry and he did say tell people to recite and this is many hadith sahih and he used to listen to it and say Ee, let's hear some more and they used to sing their poetry the, the al-han al-arab they used to sing it in, in things so anashid like some of like in Palestine Syria they have and in Morocco they have ways of singing poems about Allah about the Messenger of Allah things like that, that's permissible. And that's a, that is a type of, uh, of uh, entertainment even that would definitely be uh, permissible. Because it's, it's very beautiful to listen to. You know, if, if it's done well and they have good voices. It's, I mean, that is, you know, people should listen to that and not listen to music and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know what, uh, I don't have one. But I, I just gave you one pretty much. So it's on tape. I mean, it would need to be worked on because I did that just. I would learn the meanings, but they're beneficial even without the meanings. I don't know. I mean, as far as I know, I think Abu Hanifa Rabbilanu, uh, his madhab accepts uh, the current group. You know. So, and, and traditionally Muslims did it, if you study the, the early books, they, they definitely did group the Quran. Murad al-Hajj doesn't do it. But Murad al-Hajj is like Ibn al-Hajj in the Madkhad. He, only thing that even smells of, uh, of uh, bid'a or something that's not, but he won't make inkar. He doesn't make inkar, because he's an alim and he knows the hukam. But he himself, yatawarra, that's all. But if you spend time with him, all he does is dhikr. So he doesn't need to do it. <laughs> you know, being in his company is in group dhikr. Because everybody's in dhikr. You know, so alhamdulillah. You know, but uh, people, the point is, remember Allah. Qiyaman qa'udan wa ala jinu. Al-lazim yadkurun Allah qiyaman wa qa'udan wa ala jinu bihim. Those who remember Allah standing, sitting and reclining on their side. And there's a hadith which he mentioned, Shaykh Khatri, you know, that the Prophet ﷺ said, shall I tell you what the best of all your actions is, and the most pure with your Lord, and better than you that you should go out and fight, you have peace of you, striking the necks of the enemies and then killing you, 
They said, tell us, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Dhikrullah. Remembrance of Allah. And, and the ulama stipulate that if, if, the, if the city is being attacked, then jihad is over everything. So again, you have to see those things contextually. In other words, you know, if, 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 if there's people out defending the city and there's a group saying, oh, it's better to be vicar, don't you know that hadith? <laughs> that, that's just uh, stupidity and ignorance. So everything is contextual. But vicar is the highest thing. And that's why hajj, tatawwan, is better than jihad according to the ulama. In other words, to do hajj uh, voluntarily and fulfilling the fard kifaya is better than uh, going out on voluntary jihad. Because, see, the point is, jihad, don't forget this, jihad is a means to an end. But the end is worship of Allah. So an end is always over the means. And that's the point. We weren't created to, to kill people. We were created to remember Allah. But if there's people stopping us from remembering Allah, and they're killing us because we want to remember Allah, then we have to go out and stop them, and that's the point. So jihad has the high status that it has. And Allah says in the Quran, Ya Ibn Medina Aminu, Astajibu Lillahi wa Lil Rasul, Iza da'akum lima yuhyikum. Answer Allah and His Messenger when they call you to what brings you back to life. The ulama almost by consensus say, the tafsir that I is jihad. That that's what brings this ummah back to life. So in no way should we belittle jihad or the maqam of jihad. You know, really. And the mujahid is honored in this ummah. You know, and, and all of us should have a desire uh, for shahada. And the Prophet said, whoever dies and he's never even inside himself uh, had an inner discourse of saying, I, I wish I could go on jihad, he dies in Africa. Yeah, so you know, jihad is big. So I'm not in any way belittling jihad by that. But, uh, I, you know, I just think people have really forgotten. And the other thing about it is, what will give the Muslims the yaqeen when they go to fight, and also uh, what will give them the ability to fight for the sake of Allah is dhikr of Allah. Because there's a lot of Muslims that want to go out and fight just because they're angry. Seriously, they're just angry. They're angry at the world, they're angry at the Americans, they're angry at this, and there's a lot to be angry about, but that's not, that's not spirituality. That's not, it's not for the nafs. Right? So, and that's, and, and when, by doing dhikr, that's what you'll do to your heart. You'll put it in a state where it will be for Allah, not for its own self. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, uh, the mandate is a khidaf. I mean, I personally uh, think that we don't see it. The Ulama have resolved those issues centuries ago, and it's really sad that we're even talking about it anymore. Um, the mandate is... Uh, the celebration of the mandate was not something that they did in the first community. But they were celebrating it every single day of their lives. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they were celebrating it every day of their life. And there's a sahih hadith that the man asked the Prophet Sallallahu can I fast on Mondays? And he said, Fihi we did too, I was born on Monday. In other words, that's an excellent day to fast because I was born on that day. And that's a sound hadith. There's another hadith in which the Prophet said that Abu Lahab is given a tiny bit of water, what's between his thumb and his forefinger, in every Monday in the because he freed a slave girl the day that he was born. Right? So Abu Nahab gets repose in, in Jahannam every Monday because he celebrated the Prophet's birthday by free. So I would never say we don't celebrate the Prophet's birthday. And I've heard people say that. And there's a hadith says, uh, a man will say a word and he doesn't even think about it. And I've heard people say, we don't celebrate the Prophet's birthday. I don't believe that. You should never say that. I mean, if you want to put it into a fiqhi context, you can say, to celebrate his birthday on a specific day is something the Salaf didn't do. But to say we don't celebrate his birthday, 
You know, no, we celebrate his birthday. We should be happy every day of our lives that he was born. Because it's only through him that we got to know Allah. It's only through his sacrifice that we uh, have the being today. So we celebrate. We should celebrate every day that he was born. Doing it on the 12th of Rabi al uh is, that is uh, a later innovation. Most of the ulama said it was a Buddha Hasana. That's what they said. And they are Buddha Hasana. They, uh, there are some ulama that were against it. And that's the truth. They were. The majority of them weren't. Imam Sudi read a fatwa and said it was a good thing and that people should do it. You can look at the fatwa in al Hawid al Fatari. It's in his book of fatwas. So, if you don't want to, that's fine. But mostly people who do halala and don't pray and don't do and then they celebrate the birthday of the Prophet, his priorities are all wrong. If you want to celebrate the Prophet then do what he told you to do. And that's what's going to make him happier than anything. But once a year, getting together and celebrating his birthday and then the rest of the year you don't do anything he told you to do, uh, you know, that, it's just shameful. <laughs> to hear the seerah is good. And traditionally that's what they used to do at the moment was recite his birth and his manaqib. They would recite the noble qualities of the Messenger of Allah and that's a good thing to do. Even, uh, that if we celebrate the Prophet's birthday on the that's one of the arguments against it. Yeah. So the Time magazine had an article about that and um, they showed a picture of um, a guy celebrating his birthday yesterday in Lisa. We should pray the Asa. That's good. That's good. That's good. الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم افتح لنا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم I think it, it's a blessing that we uh, came to an end of the Maqhara um, for most of us I think it's the first day of Ramadan uh, which Ramadan really is the month of Mathara. So it would, it's fitting that we should end the study of the Mathara al on the beginning of the month, which is, is really the greatest practical month for implementing all of the things that we've learned over the last 12 weeks about the heart. Because the purpose of Ramadan is to purify the heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that, is, that is the purpose of Ramadan that's the blessing of Ramadan and the secret of Ramadan is that it's there to purify the heart and I want to say uh, something about uh, I don't know how many people were here last night but how, how many people saw the uh, moon last night how many people went out to look for it about the same number so uh, I think for the people that were here last night, I, I think all of us had a very wonderful experience. Um, were you here? With us? No? no. Who was here? I mean, wasn't that wasn't that a great experience? Yeah. And I, 
I was thinking also like this morning about uh, just yesterday and, and seeing the Hilal and one of the things that came to me and struck me about it and I, and I actually think it's, it's a very interesting perspective and that is that when we saw the Hilal last night for the first time what was happening was for me when I first saw it uh, I didn't know if it was there or not and I actually thought my eyes might be playing tricks on me because it was it was coming into existence and, and then disappearing it was it was coming in and out like and, and I realized when we first went out there there was nothing there but the light of the sun and we had to wait and then Venus showed up and then after that uh, it took some time before we could actually see the small sliver and what I realized is uh, Allah says with Arunakan of Ahinda that they ask you about the new moons and Allah responded to the message of Allah to tell them that really they're there just to tell time but the, the Mufassirun say that the reason they asked about the Ahinda is they were trying to understand the mechanism how is it that this new moon came into being and, and the reason for that is that the the uh, the ancients actually believed that every moon was a new moon, but it wasn't the same moon that was... It was literally a new moon, that it disappeared and then it started again. And they wanted to understand how that was happening. And what I realized is, Allah didn't tell them. In other words, He didn't negate their belief. He just explained why the moon is there, which is, it's malakit, the mess, right? It's, it's just a way of, of telling time for people with Hajj to tell the time of the Ramadan and Hajj. And one of the things that Qadir al-Bakr ibn al-Arabi said in his tafsir is that the secret of this Ummah using a lunar calendar as opposed to a solar calendar is that the sun is used for worldly benefits, but the moon is used for other worldly benefits. So the focus of time of this Ummah is about other worldly time, not about this world and and what I realize is what if you look at it from a uh, a completely non-abstract perspective what you're seeing when you actually witness the the new moon is you are seeing what's known in philosophy as emergence and this is what this is the real problem in for these people is how things come out into existence out of nothing right how does that happen this is their problem in other words why is there something as opposed to nothing and what you do if you sit there and you're looking at the sky and suddenly this thing emerges out of out of nothing right before your eyes because you can't see it initially and the reason you can't see it is because of the sun the sun's light is too strong and the reason you're able to see it is because the sun's light has dimmed and what emerges is reflected light. So what you can see is the reflected light of the moon. And really what that means is the entire creation is reflected light. Is Allah. I mean it's uh, Allah is the entire creation is reflected light from Allah. The only reason we can see it is because Allah allows it to exist and He's the one that brought it into existence and He's the one that takes it out of existence and so really what you're witnessing is this incredible event which is Allah is letting you see reflected light come into existence and that is the new moon that's why it's istihlal it's, it's the birth right it's the same way that you have for a child to be born it's, it's, it's the birth of reflected light which is that is creation because it's all reflecting Allah you know, the whole thing is reflecting Allah كيف يجحد الإله وكيف يعجب كيف يعصر إله عن كيف يجحد الجاحد ولله في كل تحريكة وتسكينة أبدا شاهد وفي كل شيء آية تدل على أنه واحد how strange that we can disobey Allah or even stranger that people can disbelieve in Allah when for Allah in every movement and stillness there's a clear sign and in everything itself there's a sign 
right? So the creation of these meanings, right, set up in these images, and 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 what we're doing is we're there to decode what these meanings are, and and it's a real gift to actually see the birth of the new moon. And it's a real, it's a gift, right? And I think people felt that last night because one. You have instead of Ilm al you have Ayn al and the Quran says that there's Ilm al Yaqeen, Ayn al Yaqeen, and Haq al Yaqeen. Ilm al Yaqeen is when you hear somebody. Uh, Imam al Ghazali's example is when you hear somebody uh, tell you that there's a, a, a fire in the forest and you trust that person. That's Ilm al Yaqeen. But it's not the same as seeing the fire yourself. So you go there and you see it, that's Ayn al Yaqeen. And then he said, if you go and actually touch it, that's haq al right? So you actually touch it. So it, 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 it's an amazing thing, the, the, the new moon. And, and that's Imam al-Hakim, Rabbi Allah, who made the hadith that the Prophet was referring to, said, خير وعباد الله الذين يراعون الأذلة والأهلة ذكرا لله. The best of Allah's servants are those who are vigilant about new moons and shadows for the prayer times as a way of remembering Allah. Right? And I think for us last night, the, the, the natural impulse when, when you saw it was to remember Allah. Right? To be to kabir Allah ala mahadakum. Allahu Akbar. You know, it's Allahu Akbar. And then, uh, for me personally, you know, there was like a real nashat of Ramadan came into my heart, just of a feeling, you know, of a lot of energy. Because it was Zayn al Yaqeen that's the Ramadan moon so it's, it's, it's a real gift the Ramadan anyway I just wanted to share that with you so um, we went through the diseases of the heart uh, we looked at Bukhal first of all we looked at the uh, he talked about Adab and the importance of Adab and then we talked about uh, the hukam of knowledge of the Amrad al Qulub and the, and the treatments for it which he said, according to Imam al-Ghazali, Rabbi Ma'anu, is Farba'in. And then he went through alphabetically the diseases of the heart, and he obviously gives the most, uh, these are really the most important ones. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq and Qadayyab actually know them down to about four uh, or five ones, that if you can control those, all the other ones actually are removed easily. But he began with a Bukhal. And Ramadan is a month uh, to, uh, to really... Uh, to cure your bukhal because they said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was the most generous of human beings and he was more generous than ever in Ramadan and they described him karih and mursida like a wind that brings uh, uh, gifts fecundating wings uh, so bukhal uh, and then batar batar is batarat ma'ishatun is to be happy with your the dunya or the livelihood. Nusainu farhatan. Right? His farha is hilma yufturu wa hilma yalqarabhu. When he breaks his fast and when he meets his Lord. And so it's kind of the opposite of that idea of ratar. And then bughab, uh, Ramadan is a time where you're supposed to actually, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, abbaru sadaqa fi Ramadan. The best sadaqa is in Ramadan. And then in another hadith, أَفْضَرُ صَدَقَ يُصْلَحُ ذَاتِ الْبَيْنِ The best sadaqa is rectifying between people. So the best sadaqa would be rectifying between people in Ramadan. That would be the best sadaqa. So this is a time to remove bughat from your heart about people. And then baghi, uh, oppressing people. This is a time when you can't do any, any it's... You're, you're fasting, and the Prophet Sallallahu told us that if somebody tries to, إِذَا قَاتَرَكَ Right? وَأَنْتَ سَائِمْ فَقَوْمْ اللَّهُمَ إِنِّي سَائِمْ If somebody's fighting you, you say, I'm fasting. In other words, let's agree. Don't fight with them. Say, I'm fasting. Tell them you don't want to do that. And then حُبِّ الْمَنْزِرَةِ Love of position. Right? Ramadan is about gaining a position with Allah. Because the reason, the secret of fasting is it's the only act of ibadah that nobody can tell you're doing it, when you're doing it. You see, like if you give charity, it's, it's an act. Right? It's an act. If you do prayer, it's an act. If you make hajj, it's an act. All of the ibadah that Allah has given us are things that can visibly be seen. Fasting alone is, 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 
You can be standing next to a person who's not fasting and a person who's fasting, and the only one that knows is Allah. So you're out here with all these non-Muslims, they see you, they don't know you're fasting. You look like everybody else, right? So the point is, is that Hubbin Menzida, the Menzida that you want is with Allah, it's not with people. And then Hubbin Dunya. Ramadan is, is also weaning yourself from Dunya, right? النفس كالطفل إن تهمره شد على حب الرضاء وإن تفتمه ينفطني النفس is like a, a child that if you neglect it it grows up loving to suck meaning love of dunya but if you wean it then it becomes weaned so Ramadan is the time of weaning the soul from dunya and love of dunya and then حب المدح بما لم يفعل to love to be praised for things that you don't do uh, Ramadan is a time when you're supposed to witness the shortcomings of your actions and to really to recognize that you've wasted the whole year and now it's time to catch up. The ibadah, the qiyam al you didn't do in the previous year, it's time to catch up in this month. Uh, all of the things that you neglected, the sadaqah, all those things. So what you're trying to do is do actions so that you weren't praise. Right? So it's a cure for that. al uh, hasad Right? Envy. To purify the heart from envy. But if you can conquer, uh, the envy comes from uh, desire. Right? If you can conquer desire, then you can remove envy from your heart. And desire is based, according to Imam al-Ghazali, on Qasr al-Shahwatayn. Destroying the two, the thugs and the batan. If you can destroy those two desires, conquer them, not destroy them, but master them, then all the other desires become easy. And then al haya al madmoon Shame that's not uh, praiseworthy. This is a time to uh, have haya with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So haya for people uh, without seeing Allah is, is uh, blameworthy. Right? So this is a time to have haya with Allah. Khawb al-qalb fi ma la yambay wa khawb fi. One of the secrets of Ramadan that I'm going to go into from Imam al-Ghazali in a second is the fasting of the heart. Part of the highest fast in Ramadan is the fast of the heart. Not just the, the outward fast, but the inward fast. Khawf and faqar. This is also a time to, uh, when to recognize provision is from Allah. And not to worry about your provision and to give up your anxieties. And recognize that food is not something that you should uh, be under the control of. But in fact, you should recognize it for what it is. It's a ni'mah from Allah. It came from Allah, and that's why you praise Allah when you break your fast. You praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and recognize that that's coming from Him. Mudahana. It's things like this when you're fasting that you can't tell lies. And mudahana is a type of lying. And you can't tell lies anytime, but in Ramadan it's much worse. Riya. This is the time one of the blessings of Ramadan is even the worst Muslims suddenly become like Aliyah. So uh, it's, it's, it's more difficult to have riya in Ramadan because everybody's at the masjid doing qiyam and every, so you actually don't feel as significant as you would at other times of the year when you're doing ibadah because everybody is, is this is the time when everybody's doing ibadah and so that's uh, another important thing is to remove that desire to be seen by others and desire to be only seen by Allah خوف غير الله والرغبة في Fear of other than Allah and desire of other than Him again relates to the same idea. Sakhab uh, al-Qadr, displeased with the Qadr of Allah. As your iman increases, you become more content with the Qadr of Allah. And one of the things that increases in Ramadan is the iman by the nature of the month. Your iman will increase, inshallah, in this month if you do what, what the month entails us to do. And if we practice what is the want of the people that desire Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sum'a, the same, tama, uh, sum'a is desiring reputation amongst people, things like this. A tama is this desire. Pain and amal, one of, again, إِذَا لَإِشْرُونَ مِنْ شَعْبَانَ وَلَّتْ فَوَاصِلْ شُرْبَ لَيْلِكَ بِالْنِهَارِ وَلَا تَشْرَبْ بِأَقْدَاحٍ صِغَارِ فَبَاقَ الزَّمَانُ عَلَى الصِغَارِ One of the things about Ramadan is to remind you of pain and amal. You don't have much time. This is why when Allah says in the Qur'an, أيام المعدودات He uses according to the ulama, جمع القلة, معدودات it's, it's a plural that's used for few Because He's reminding us we only have a few months 
And these are a few days. And these days are precious days, so don't waste them. Don't waste them in hold. Don't waste them in empty talk. Don't waste them in right. Uh Hadar. Hadar is is uh, empty talk and and uh, excessive talk. It's, there's no benefit in it. And then uh, a piyara. Piyara is a bad omen. Everybody will have bad omens. The Prophet said, I gave us the cure for it. You got papayarta from B. If you have a bad omen, just do what you're doing. You come, like in this culture, you come to a ladder. I grew up thinking it's bad luck to, uh, to walk under a ladder, right? And before I was Muslim, I would have walked around it. Now you come to a ladder, still walk around it because something could fall from the top. But don't do it because it's a superstition. Do it, you know, don't worry about things. Black cats, whatever, the Burma, right? The Arabs have the Burma. Do they have that in Tunisia? Burma? So, really? No, no, no. It's amazing. It's a Jahadi thing. Because the Jahadi Arabs, if they saw an owl, it was a really bad sign. So, if you see an owl, you say, Subhanallah. You know, don't you? Huh? A seeing a lion? The Arabs? Oh, well, a lion is shaja'a, according to the Arab. The Arab, whenever they use a lion, they mean courageous. Asadullah, yeah, I mean shaja'a Allah. It's a metonymy for, for courage. And then, uh, one, which is suspicion, you shouldn't have bad opinions of other people, especially in Ramadan. And then, rush, which is cheating, Saying, Rajab, being impressed with the self, vanity. Ghabab, anger. One of the things of Ramadan is to learn how to control anger. Ghafla, heedlessness. Ramadan is a month to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should remember Him all the time, but more particularly in this time. Uh, rancor towards other Muslims. One of the worst diseases. Fakhar, boasting from Jahadiyya. Kibrun, which is arrogance, pride. Karahat uh, al dislike of being blamed or censured. Karahat al fear of death. Again, that hadith, من أحب لقاء الله, أحب الله لقاءه, whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah needs to love him. إِنَّ لِلصَّائِمِ فَرْحَتَيْنِ إِنَّ لِلصَّائِمِ فَرْحَتَيْنِ The Usaim has two uh, joys. فَرْحَتُونَ حِينَ لِيَفْطِرُونَ وَفَرْحَتُونَ حِينَ لِيَرْقَى رَبَّهُ He has a joy when he uh, when he meets, uh, when he breaks his fast and when he meets his Lord. And then, Nisyan uh, al This is a month also to remember the ni'mah of Allah. When ta'iddu ni'mah Allah la ta'suha. Wa ma bikum min ni'matim fa min Allah. There's no ni'mah except it's from Allah. And this is a time really where we should be really reflecting on all of the blessings Allah has given us. And huzur. Making fun of people, mockery, these type things, haram, and more, more importantly than it. So those are all the diseases of the heart. What I want to do now, uh, just as a closing, is go, go through some of the things that Imam al Ghazali in his Ihya, Rabbi Allah Anhu, mentions about fasting. Uh, Kitab Asrar al Siyam is the book, which is the book of the secrets of fasting. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So he says that one of the greatest blessings that Allah has given uh, uh, us is, uh, and that he has uh, given to protect us from the plots of shaitan and the, the artistry, the, the clever machinations of shaitan and to destroy shaitan's hope and, and really uh, make him despair is he made fasting a fortress for his awliya and a jinnah, a shield to protect himself from shaitan a siyam, a som, a siyam or jinnah fasting is a shield right, you hide behind it and 
he said that he also has explained to us uh, in many many verses in the Quran and Hadith that the means by which shaitan takes control of the heart is hidden shahawat the human being is destroyed by two things shahawat and shubuhat shahawat are sensory they relate to pleasure excessive pleasure the, the stomach, the genitals all of the things that go with shahawat and shubuhat relate to the heart how somebody understands things so shaitan works on uh, shubuhat first right? he, it's actually better for him to have uh, somebody who's a, a Christian, a Trinitarian or something like that because then he doesn't care, they can do all they want but if he can't get to you if you have been given uh, mana'a like a protection, immunity from the shubuhat and that's done by following the rightly guided imam by having your, your creed correct so you follow the aqidah of the Muslim and anything that has shubha in it you flee from it and the, and the second by making your ibadah in accordance with the sunnah so you don't allow bid'ah to come into your ibadah with those things you're protected from shubhat and actually shubhat are easier to protect oneself if he sees that he can't get you from there if you're protect, then he'll come with shahawat and try to destroy you through shahawat and uh, and then the next thing that uh, he mentions is the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, it's a Hassan hadith from Abu Huraira in which the Prophet ﷺ said, As-Sawmu nisf al-Sabr Fasting is half of patience. In other words, it's half of how you learn and acquire patience. By being able to fast and be patient about food, which is the primary earth, and sex, which is the secondary earth. If somebody can control those two uh, aspects of itself that he can be patient about other things if he can't control those everything else will be out of control but then he mentions the other hadith which says that a sabru is from iman and he derives from that uh, that therefore fasting is half of iman because uh, one quarter of iman thank you um, these engineers are useful <laughs> <laughs> that uh, if Iman is half of uh, Sabr is half of Iman and fasting is half of Sabr then it's a quarter uh, of your Iman if you, ha- if you fast and then he also said which is very important that the message of Allah said كُلُّ حَسَنَةٍ بِعَشْرِ أَنْفَارِهَا إِلَى سَبْعِ مِنَةِ يَبَعْرِ إِلَّا سِيَّانِ this is a hadith Qudsi every good action is ten multiplied by ten to 700 except for fasting except for fasting fa innahu li wa ana except for fasting fasting is my own and I reward it now some of the ulama actually said that the meaning asiyamu li fasting is mine in other words Allah is the only thing in creation in, in, in reality that this is absolutely independent and needs nothing everything else in creation needs something and so fasting is of all the acts of ibadah we do, it is the most godlike. It is the most godlike because Allah does not uh, eat or drink or any of the actions that go. That. So uh, fasting is Allah, and He rewards it. And this is again uh, taking on this the akhlaq bi akhlaqillah, take on the qualities that Allah has described Himself with of al karim, al sabur. Right, all these uh, Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahman and then again the, the ayah in the Quran إِنَّمَا يُوَقَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Allah tells us in the Quran that the patient people He gives them reward without any reckoning so again fasting and patience are, are deeply related and another thing about fasting as-siyamu uh, is if it's half of patience وَصَبْرُ مُفْتَحَ الْظَفَرِ or مُفْتَحَ الْفَرَجِ and patience is the key to openings from Allah and this is why the greatest uh, victory of the Muslims was in Ramadan which is al Badr. and it is in Ramadan and also the Fath that Allah gave the Messenger of Allah was in Ramadan so there's great and many great victories in Ramadan in the history of Islam many many great victories
And then he, he said it is enough to know the blessing of the fact that Allah swears when the next uh, that the messenger of Allah swore when the next is with me, the Khalifa from the Sahih Abu and the Ma in Ri al Musk. The fast smell of a pastor coming from the mouth of the pastor is more pure with Allah than the scent of musk. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, He has given up his drink, his food, his drink, and his shahwa, his desire, for Allah's sake. So, fasting is mine, and I will uh, give it. And then, the farahatan, farahatun and iftarihi, wa farahatun and liqai rabbihi. And then he said, the hadith uh, which has some weakness in it but it says we could be shown in bad and we went through the abwab al in the in the uh, when we covered that section on there we could be shown in bad wa bab al ibadati wa saum everything has a door and the door of worship is fasting and and this is another hadith indicate that is in the, uh, that the, the one who prevents us from worship more than anybody is shaitan and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the message of Allah said inna in the shaitan and the yajiri to bni adam majari adam that shaitan flows in, the, in, in, in man with the blood the flowing of the blood which is a proof that for, for me is a proof that long before Thomas Harvey ever came up with circulation of blood that the message of Allah knew about circulation of blood because majara is a place where something flows and he said, in the shaitan la yajiri, he them. He flows in man, at, where, in the places the blood flows. So, uh, shaitan gets in through the blood. And that's why uh, alcohol and haram food is an easy inroad for shaitan into the, into the heart. And uh, the more pure your food is, the purer you become. Guarding your food from shubahat. So when you fast because you don't have food in you, you're actually making, uh, to, uh, I mean there's a, uh, an addition to that hadith, which is Mubarak's probably from later, not from the Sahaba, but فَبَيِّقُوا عَلَى مَجَارِيَ shaitan Constrict the, the ways that shaitan can flow in you, بِالْجُوَى by hunger. And then another thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the message of Allah, a, it's a weak hadith, no muqsa'in ibadah. The sleep of the pastor is worship. Because if he's fasting, he's in worship. So it's true, even if the hadith is not strong, the meaning is true, in that if you're fasting, you're worshiping, and sleeping while you're fasting is mubah. So even a sleeper is in ibadah when he's fasting. So that's a, something that no other... Uh, no other uh, ibadah has. And also, إِذَا دَخَلُوا شَهْرُ رَمَضَانِ فُتِّحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ وَصُفِدَتْ الشَّيَاطِينِ وَنَادَ مُنَادٍ يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ هَلُمَّا يَا بَاغِيَ الْشَرِ اقْصِرْ That when Ramadan comes, the, the gates of paradise are open, the doors of the Hinnam are closed, and the shayateen are locked up, and then a, a, a caller calls from the angelic realm, O oh, seeker of good, come for this month. And O oh, seeker of evil, uh, stop. You know, don't desist from your evil. What uh, Tia, who is the teacher of Imam Shafi'i, Rabbi Ma'ani said, about Allah's word, Kulu wa sharabu hani and bima asrafin fil ayyam al-khaliya, the ayam al-khaliya, the past days, are ayam al-siyam. So Allah says in paradise, eat and drink because of what you were doing in those previous days in the world when you were fasting. Now, eat and drink, enjoy yourself. So, you're giving up here. Uh, and obviously, uh, for a person, you know, if you're told, uh, in, in fact, that was the test they used for emotional intelligence, was to give children, like, tell them they could have you know, <coughs> two cookies later or one now. And always they found the intelligent children would say two later. So a sign of aqal is putting off a, a short-term pleasure for a greater long-term pleasure. That is a sign of intellect. 
And so that's why Allah says that these people that do this are evil and bad. They're the people of intellect that recognize putting off doing your pleasure for uh, the sake of Allah is, 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 is uh, intelligent. And, and then another thing which is really important, which he says is because this is such, uh, you are really uh, defeating the enemy of Allah, which is shaitan, by taking control of all the things that shaitan uses to uh, to fight you and to fight Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, his irada for human beings his, his will for human beings which is to believe in him and follow him and that's why he mentions that Allah says in tongues that Allah in furqam wa yusabbit aqdamakum if Allah if you give victory to Allah through fasting and conquering shaitan Allah will give victory to you and make you firm and that's one of the things you want. Sabr is part of sabat, right? Sabr. So we're learning that. And then he and then he said, and by doing that also, Allah says, "Well, let me get to see that. Let me have them. Subhanallah. And Allah is with the Muslims. And then he also mentioned that in Allah, there is no other Muhammad except the Muhammad and the Muhammad. The change of 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 the change that's one of the interpretations of that ayah. That Allah will not change the people by taking away their blessings until they become preoccupied with their shahawat. So they, they fall into, like this society is, I mean it's the best example of a pleasure culture. Everything is, is geared towards pleasure. There's no, people here, the idea of fasting is so alien to them now because they eat all day long. And that's not something in even not that long ago people did not eat you didn't snack all day long there weren't snack machines everywhere this is all the grazing culture right and, and I'm the cattle people right seriously it's like cows that just graze out and this is life grazing mm-hmm. no yeah the shayateen it's only shayateen because there's one hadith that says maradat al jinn the, the bad zin. So it's, it's not the shaitan and ins. I mean, uh, and, and also some of the ulama, like Imam al-Qadisi al-Fasi, who is a Maliki scholar, he was asked why is it that people still get bad thoughts in Ramadan? And his explanation was that, he said the hadith indicate only the kafir uh, jinn are locked up. The fasak from the believing jinn are not locked up. Uh, but Allah knows that because there's no hadith. He doesn't have textual basis for that. And he admitted that at the end. He said that that would seem a, a high probability there. And Allah knows this. But also you have enough uh, that's there. I mean, I think it would be interesting to, to do, I mean, this is when you have a khilafa and you're controlling the world and there's no wars. Uh, and you can actually occupy Muslims being intelligent statistical studies. It would be interesting to see studies done about crime rates and things like that if they do go down in Ramadan. I mean, I think that would be kind of an interesting thing to do. <laughs> so there's somebody who has a PhD thesis there. Uh, convince a university to give you funding for that, huh? Now, a couple of things here. Imam Al-Ghazali uh, mentions, he goes into the fiqh issues, and we covered that la- last night, about the fiqh of fasting. There's two fiqhs of fasting. There's the fiqh al-Zahir, the fiqh al-Batin. There's the outward fiqh, which is the concern of the fuqaha, and then there's the inward fiqh, which is the concern of the qawm or the sufiya. And the outward fiqh, is to make sure that your outward fasting is, is acceptable, maqbul. The inward fiqh is to make sure that your inward fasting is acceptable. And this, there is a hadith that indicates this very clearly in which the Prophet ﷺ said that many people who fast, right, come in sa'imun, laysa rahumun sa'imun, illa al-zu'a wal-aqad. 
How many factors gain nothing from their fast except hunger and thirst? So it means, in other words, outwardly the fast is correct, but inwardly they're breaking their fast constantly. Because if you're backbiting, if you're doing all these things. Now, uh, just a few things about that. He says there are three types of fasters. Psalm al the fast, the general fasting. Psalm al and then the elect fasting. Psalm al al and then the fasting of the elect of the elect. He says that the fasting of the common people is basically leaving the kaf al batal wal farz an qada al shahwa. It's just preventing the stomach and the genitals from uh, gaining pleasure during the daylight hours. That's the fasting that any Muslim is capable of doing. He said the fasting of the elect is the fasting kaf al sam'a wal basar wal lisan wal yad wal rizal. Because remember Ibn Asher Rabbi Ma'ani talks about the seven, right? You have to protect the seven jawarih, right? We're responsible for them. You have to protect the eyes. In the sama'a wal basara wal fu'ada kulli ula'ika tana anhu mas'ula. You have to protect the ears. You have to protect the tongue. You have to protect the hands, the, the, the stomach, the genitals, and the feet. So, three of them, two of them are covered in the outward fasting. So a person who's fasting and they're, they're not eating or having sexual relations or any type of sexual behavior, whether it's you know, masturbation, any type of that, that that person has taken hold of two of those seven, and those are called the Nadakhir al-Shaytan, Suhoor al-Shaytan. Those are the entrances of Shaytan. Some of the ulama, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, mentioned that the, 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 the body of the human being is like a country and the capital is the heart and the, the, the uh, borders, the boundaries are the seven limbs and you have to guard the seven limbs with vigilance and the heart is the one that sends out the command to guard the, 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 the limbs sends out the armies to guard them so shaitan comes in to the heart through one of those seven things. So the point of the fasting is to protect the boundaries during Ramadan and guard them so that the heart has a chance to draw near to Allah. It's in order to learn taqwa. And taqwa is... نَحْلُ التَّقْوَى هَا هُنَا وَأَشَارَ إِلَىٰ قَلْبِهِ The place of taqwa is here in the heart. The Prophet ﷺ said, التَّقْوَى هَا هُنَا وَأَشَارَ إِلَىٰ قَلْبِهِ ثلاث مرات. So taqwa is in the heart. So you're trying to learn taqwa. And the taqwa is the heart. So what you're doing is you're protecting the heart by stopping, uh, by protecting the inner into the heart of shaitan. And Allah has helped you by locking up the shaitan. So he put constraints on the shayateen. So Allah is giving us a great assistance in this month. And then he's helped us by making it a form to, to not eat. In other words, the two sources of, of the, uh, all the troubles, the most basic ones, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has commanded us. But then he left us, it's up to us, because it can't all be, right, there has to be some mujahada. Allah left it up to us to guard the eyes, the tongue, the ears, the hands, and the feet. And that's the, the fasting of the elect. So they're fasting from all seven limbs. Right? So you're guarding your tongue, you're guarding your eyes, you're guarding your uh, hands, you're guarding your feet. That's what you have to do. Don't worry about it. Don't look at the haram. Don't speak the haram and don't listen to the haram. Allah will nisa'in. Somebody starts to backbite, Allah will nisa'in. You have to protect yourself. Don't, don't ruin my fast. The du'a of the Prophet is about Ramadan. Allahumma sallimna Ramadan wa sallim Ramadan minna. Allah give us Ramadan and protect Ramadan from our evil. 
You know, you don't want Ramadan to get a curse of you either. You want to get a portion of Ramadan's good. And you don't want to give Ramadan anything bad. And this is why it has what's known as karma zamaniya. It has a, a, the sanctity of time. And that's why long action in Ramadan is greater than long action other times. Because Allah has given us a karma, a sanctity. And you have to guard the sanctity of the month. And you guard it by not doing what Allah tells you. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the things that Allah said to the human being is that He told us that we had to, uh, to, to give the amanat ila ahdiha, to give the amanat to its people. That's one of the signs of the believer. Right? The believer gives trust that has been entrusted with him to those who own the trust. So if you're given a trust and somebody tells you, I'm leaving this, I'm entrusting you with this, but this is mine. I'm entrusting it with you, but this is mine. The mu'min is the one, yu'min comes from the same root of amana. La imana, meaning la amana talahu. He has no iman, the one who has no amana. Allah has given us a trust. In the sama, wal basar, wal fu'ada, kullu ula'ika kana anhu mas'ula. Those things, the, the sight, the sound, the hearing, and the heart itself, which generates all of the actions of the other men, you are mas'ul. In other words, the amanat that Allah has put you in responsibility for. And you have to bring back the amana on Yom Qiyamah. Yom Alayhim the amana, manun, wala banuna, illa man ata Allah bi qadrin salim. He brings back the amana sound. He hasn't destroyed it. Qad khala min basaha. Right? He's been destroyed, the one who pollutes this trust that Allah has given you. Because the nafs is a trust. And like that, children are a trust. Your children are amana. Right? So these are all trust Allah has given you. And fasting, Allah is teaching us how to honor the trust and give it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way Allah wants it. Which is, He wants your tongue to be free of slander. Kibit, Manina, Ghiba, Zor, all these things. He wants it to be free of that. He wants your ears to be free of hearing the haram. He wants your eyes to be free of seeing the haram. He wants your hands to be free of doing anything haram. Your feet to be free of going anywhere haram. And your genitals free of going to a place that's haram. And your stomach free of taking in, imbibing anything or eating anything that's haram. That's what Allah wants. He wants us to protect these trust that He's given us. And the way He's teaching us to do that is fasting. That is, this is the madrasa to learn these things. And then finally, the fasting of the elect of the elect. And he says, It is the sham al-qalb an himam al-daniyya wal afkar al dunyaniya It is the fasting of the heart on no aspirations, from no aspirations or from worldly thought. So in other words, the fasting of the elect is that your aspiration is not for dunya. And that's why in Ramadan, in faq. Because giving out is for akhirah. Whereas in the other months, you're busy trying to acquire wealth. In Ramadan, you should be busy trying to get rid of wealth for the sake of Allah. You're not in a dunya mode. You're in an akhirah mode. Right? You're in an akhira mode. You, you have to change. In this month, you have to change the way you're thinking. And then, uh, afkara dunyaniya. Uh, uh, one of the things about the people, uh, 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 one of the uh, scholars of Andalusia said 
that the first degree of wilaya with Allah is muhasabat al khawata is to begin to take thoughts to account right and that, that's the beginning of it yazin al khatara bil qistasi that he begins to to measure the thought based on the mizan of the sharia that, that's what that's what the wali does and that's why he's a wali Ramadan is a time to do muhasaba of your heart in other words if you begin to think about things that are dimly things because you don't want to be none of us want to be uh, with Allah and Ammi uh, in Arabic Ammi means Suqi right do you say that in Iraq Suqi Suqi they say that in Sham Suqi somebody who's like the, the himna is in the marketplace you have to rise above that and the thing about Islam an Ammi does not mean that uh, you know there's a lot of scholars that think because they're learned they're not the awam but they're awam because the Ammi can be the street sweeper who only knows Fard Ayn and knows a few surahs from the Quran but his heart is with Allah so and that's why he asks how many people are not fasting but with Allah they're fasting and how many people who are fasting but with Allah they're not fasting because those people during the year who aren't they're guarding their eyes their ears their tongue their feet their genitals their stomach their, so in reality they're, they're doing the purpose of fasting because fasting is just an exercise to learn how to do it properly whereas other people they're fasting physically but with Allah they're not fasting so, so that's the point so when you're talking about the khusus don't think that somebody who knows uh, Imam Sibari's Al-Kitab and he's a great grammarian or he knows all the tafasir or he knows that's not what he's talking about these people can be almost illiterate if the heart is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I mean look at uh, Imam Sahnoon Imam Sah- uh, Muhammad bin Sahnoon who's the son of Sahnoon who wrote the Mudawana he had a majlis in, Qar- uh, in Al-Qarawan and in this majlis every day these uh, he, he said a, a man would come into the majlis and walk over people's shoulders and go up to the sheikh he was teaching in the chair and he'd start whispering into his ear for a while and then he would leave and he was doing this every time the sheikh would teach the sheikh actually told people to move away so that he wouldn't have to go over there helping out one day the man stopped coming and Imam Sahnoon, uh, Muhammad bin Sahnoon asked some of the people, where's that man who used to come here every day? And they said, uh, we don't know. And he asked somebody to go find him. He found him and he came and he said, what happened? You stopped visiting me. And the man said, subhanallah, you know, I have to explain myself. Some people who envy you, I'm a very poor man and I have uh, a lot of daughters that I need to get married. Some people who envy you, because he was a, a qabi and they said they came to me and said go and bother him every day in his majlis and if you can make him angry and, and humiliate him in front of all his students we'll give you money so you can marry your daughters so I used to come every day and I would curse you in your ear and I would say all those horrible things and I realized it wasn't having an effect on you and so I just gave up and Muhammad ibn Sahnin said why didn't you just come and ask me for some money yeah, I would have given you. <laughs> but I mean, that, that is, that's where you want, that's a thing that you want to learn from fasting. Is that, that is the sabr of the people of the Messenger of Allah. That's the sabr of the family. That's the sabr of Salman and Minna al You know, Salman's from my family. Salman did, he, he was patient. He was a Zoroastrian. He used to see them blowing out, uh, the fire would get blown out and they'd light it and then they'd tell the worshippers it never goes out. And he, his father was in charge of it, so he knew it was a lie. So he, he wanted to find where was He went to the Christians. He was with a monk serving him for years and he saw the monk stealing all the people's money and burying it in his backyard. And then he went to another monk and he saw that he was actually a good monk. He told them that there was a prophet in the end of time coming to Yathrib and that's where he went and he had the sign but the thing is he was patient through this entire journey he was just seeking the truth yeah. 
And if you look at the patience of the Prophet and all through that tribulation that we saw, that's, that is what fasting really is about. It's about learning how to control uh, the, the, the heart and gaining this uh, ability. So, uh, basically, in terms of this month, here's my suggestion to myself, uh, first and foremost. Yeah, yeah, you should. But I mean, I'm saying in Ramadan that that would break the fast. That's all I was saying. I know, but so is lying and people lie and so is, you know, people do things that are haram. There's a khilaf about it anyway. According to the Malikis, the dominant opinion is that it's uh, prohibited. According to uh, Ahmed ibn Hamdan, uh, it's considered mubah without any fantasizing. Uh, he considered it like hijam or something like that. So it's a khilaf issue, but I was just using that because some people might think that fasting is just, right, from... Uh, sexual relations with somebody else but it includes that so any type even tafakkur right fantasizing uh, you know that, that would lead to that all of that haram um, so anyway during this month and then inshallah I'm going to close this on this group of people that's leaving at 2.30 but uh, during this month my recommendation to myself and all of you is don't uh, do a lot of talking utilize the time Everybody should be appreciating that, all the other Muslims. Don't waste your time. This is a month that the Salaf used to, for six months before Ramadan, they would beg Allah to let them see the next Ramadan. And then six months after Ramadan, they would beg Allah to accept the previous Ramadan. So this is not a time like other times. We all have to understand that. And the other thing is, none of us knows if this is our last uh, Ramadan. And none of us even knows will we make it to the end of this Ramadan. So this is, this is seize the moment. You really utilize this time, all of us. Uh, don't let the month pass and then the last few days and you're regretting, I should have done more. I, should. I mean, we'll do that anyway. But hopefully it will be, uh, it won't be as bad as some people who will have done very little. I mean, hopefully we'll do a lot and still there's going to be uh, a sense that we didn't do enough because human beings uh, Imam al-Ghazali said the greatest proof of the deficiency of man is that he never does anything except that he realizes afterwards he could have done it better than uh, anything so I mean, there's always improvement but the point is utilize the time uh, utilize the night right? take some portion of the night um, it's mandated to do khatam of the Quran uh, in the tarawih but even one surah is is uh, Effectual. So if, even if you did your tarawih with Qur'u Allah Wahad, if that's all you know, and you did your rakat, that, that counts as qiyam and layam. So you want to do the qiyam uh, every night. Even if you're going to just do 20 rakat with Qur'u Allah Wahad, do qiyam and layam. In fact, the other al-Khadim says, towards the end of time, it's good to do night prayers with, with like, Qur'u Allah Wahad, إِذَا زُلْزِرَةَ الْأَرْضِ زِلْزَارَهَا The surahs that have a lot of reward mentioned in them, just because there's so little time and uh, most people don't have the himma to do a lot anymore. So utilize the time. Uh, try to do uh, the, uh, the duha prayer. Right? So I mean, basically try to get up before the fajr, do some uh, qiyam before fajr, and then utilize the time after fajr. Try not to sleep after that time. It's makru in any case. But in Ramadan, that's, uh, we should be, be ga- gaining that time even more so than other times. And then uh, try to do the duha. The Prophet ﷺ told Abu Huraira to do uh, the duha, not to leave it ever. And so you should try to do it. It's a mandub and it's a very strong, uh, it has strong method because the Prophet did do it uh, continuously. Two, four, six or eight rakats before the zawal, all the way up to the zawal for the Malikis and the Hanafis. They have the, uh, during the time of the Hajra that they can't pray the Nafida. And then uh, prayer on time. Prayer on time should be uh, any time. You know, Malik Rabbi Wa'ala relates in the Wa'ala in the Aramin Ahamu Amurikum As-Sara. 
The most important of all your affairs is your prayer. فَمَنْ حَافِظَهَا وَحَافِظَ عَلَيْهَا فَقَدْ حَافِظَ دِينَهُ Whoever guards it and is vigilant about its times has guarded his deen. وَمَنْ بَيْعَهَا فَهُولِنَا سِيَاهَا أَبْيَعَ Whoever uh, is negligent of it, then he's negligent more so about other affairs in his life. So prayer, and then we heard earlier that the Messenger of Allah on his deathbed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his wasiyah to his ummah, as the last words were, as salah as salah Prayer is over everything. Guard your prayer. And use this time to, to discipline yourself to be praying on time. Right? Really use it to discipline yourself. If you, if you weren't praying on time before Ramadan, and you should have been, but if you weren't, then use this time to discipline yourself to pray on time. If you're working, just stop. You know, because your prayer is more important than your job. I guarantee you. Prayer is more important than your job. Do your prayer. And then, uh, particularly the time between Asr and Maghrib is a very strong time during, throughout the year. It's the time of dhikr, but during the time, uh, when Asr in the insana lafi khusr. It's a very special time. Illa ladina amanu. Except for the people who believe. That, that, it's a time of law for other people. And that's why in this culture you see people at the end of the day, they're worn out. They have to go and go drink, and they call it happy hour in this culture. Right? No, it's easy. They call it happy hour. They go and get, uh, have to have oblivion so that they don't have to think about how meaningless their lives are. That's a time when, when we're preparing for sunset, which means death for us. Sunset is a metaphor for death. And, and, and Asr, from Asr to Maghrib, that's your, your later years. In the, in the lives of man that period is representative of the, and, and the fasting breaking the fast is like the messenger the Sha'ini Farhatan there's two joys Farhatan and the Iftarihi a Farha when he breaks his fast or Farhatan and the Liqa'i Rabbihi or Hilal Yarqa Rabbihi so there's a there's an analogy being uh, made there that the breaking of the fast is, is similar to meeting your Lord. In other words, when, when, when the day is over and death is over, you go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after, after you break your fast, the best thing break it on Urutab or Tamar or Hasayat min al If you don't have any of that on anything, you can just uh, break the fast. If there's no food around, then you pray anyway. And the delaying of it is only uh, makru if, uh, if it's delayed out of uh, thinking that it's better, right? Then it becomes a bidah. But if we had a valid reason to delay breaking the fast, then it's perfectly fine. But um, don't eat before you pray Maghrib. And if you go to Muslim houses, the, a lot of times they'll ask you, do you want to eat first or pray? Tell people, let's pray first. Really, don't be shy about that. Because people will eat and the prayer, Maghrib goes out of the time. Right? Maghrib is a very short time window and you don't want to delay it because it's, 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 most of the ulama are that it's a barori time. Right? After... It comes in, time for Adhan, to do wudu, to find a pure place, khalaf. During the fasting, you're given a little window of breaking the fast with dates and water. Do the dua, right? Allahumma raka sumtu, wa bika amantu, wa ara rizqika aftartu, faqfili ma qaddamtu, ma khartu, ya rabbil alameen. And then when you finish it, zahab al-dhama, wa tallat al-uruq, wa thabat al-ajar, insha'Allah. Uh, that's a good thing to do. If you eat at somebody's house, أَطَّرْ عَنْدِكُمُ الصَّائِمُونَ وَصَلَّتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَأَكْرَطْ عَنْكُمْ الْأَبْرَارِ وَصَلَّتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَذَكُرْكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدِهُ These are good things to learn and to practice them and to learn the du'as. And then uh, uh, the Isha prayer, if you have a strong azimah, then it's better to pray in your house. In other words, if you're going to do night prayers, it's better to pray in your house. If you don't have a strong azimah and you know yourself, or the, there's a Muqri uh, who's going to do Khatam of Qur'an and uh, you want to do the Khatam with the... It's Mandu, right? So if you, if you want to do the Khatam in the Masjid, that's uh, 
are a good thing also. Um, avoid what, unfortunately, uh, a lot of our brothers are afflicted with um, is this idea that the tarawih has only eight rakats. And so they say, after the eight verses, they say, you know, alhamdulillah, we're following the sunnah. Right? And then they go outside and talk for the next hour. Right? Outside, of and mischief. Be, you know, just admit, I'm lazy, you know, or hey, it's really 20s long for me. You know, but don't start justifying, you know, sunnah, brother, I'm following sunnah. Because sunnah is not to sit around at the door of the masjid and talk. I guarantee you that. The Prophet he did not waste his time. An empty talk at the door of the masjid is, that's, that's suqa. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's ammi, really. And we don't want to be part of that. And don't belittle people, don't look down on people. I'm not, you know, don't want to get judgmental about people. Everybody's where they're at for why, for whatever reason. But the point is, don't see yourself as better than them. But thank Allah that He hasn't afflicted you with that affliction, because it's an affliction. And when the Prophet saw afflicted people, He said, Alhamdulillah, Alladhi Aafani, Mimma Tarakum Bihi, Wa Fadbadani Ala Kathira Mimma Kharaka Tabdira. That's not arrogance to recognize a ni'mah that Allah has given you. It's arrogance when you think that you deserve it more than they do. Because it's just a fadl that Allah has given you for whatever reason. And He knows. And He knows. A'udhu Billah, Nasallah, Al-Thabat, wal Khatam, al it has him, but he could take that away from you and, 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 and give your state to that person or better and put you there sitting at the door of the masjid talking. And one of the men who accused Mu'ad ibn, ibn Jabal uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, doing something haram, he made a dua against him. And Mu'ad was Mr. Jabal dua. He was known for that. And this man was seen in his old age pinching girls on the streets of Medina. With, with his, they said his eye, his eye, uh, over his eyes had fallen over. You know, like the eye brow had literally fallen over his eyes. And he'd like pinch, and that was the ibtila that Allah gave him in his old age for, for, uh, falsely condemning Ma'ad ibn Jah. So, you know, don't, don't, I don't, you know, want pe- people to get self-righteous or anything like that, myself included. But the point is, don't really. If people are talking, you know, greet people. It's a it's a joyous time. It's a time that we should do that. And then the other thing to remember is our brothers and sisters who are, who are in great tribulation now. The people of Palestine, the people of Iraq, the people of Algeria, the people of Bosnia, the people of India. I could go on and on and on, and I don't want to. Those people really are suffering, and so temper your joy with some gravity as well. So don't... One of the things about light that I learned a long time ago and I think it's really true is that uh, sometimes a people's reaction to a lot of spiritual light is to get giddy and, and laugh and get frivolous. And, and you can see that in people. And, and it's a way of spilling light. And Ramadan can do that to people. They'll, they'll get... Because there's so much light that they'll end up kind of like laughing the whole month. And seriously. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm really mean this. People will end up like just kind of spending it, having a good time. And what they're doing is because they haven't learned how to contain, you know, the benefits, they just spill it all out, right? So try to contain the benefits of that. Um, I think we're going to... Uh, is the bus here? Is it, that class going to go? Yeah, I'm going to come back after the Tahar. I mean, after the Asar. But are they going to leave now? Okay, then what I'll do before we pray, because there's still a little bit more time, I wanted to read from the, the section on fasting from the Mu'atta for the Baraka of it. And, uh, what's that? Okay, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, the other thing, Imam Marik Rabbi Ma'ano, during Ramadan, uh, he did not like storytelling and didn't like... He said this is a time of qiyam and qira'ah. Uh, so the best dhikr during Ramadan is uh, Qur'an. Uh, that you should still do the, uh, the sabah and masa. Those are really important to do in Ramadan as well as any other time. But uh, you should have uh, your word of Qur'an. 
Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu said that Quran, if, if you read it at least twice a year, uh, then you're not considered jati. Uh, in other words, th- there's an ayah in the Quran, you know, where Allah, the Messenger of Allah complained about the, in the Qawm al-Takhidu al Quran, Mahjura, that, uh, that his people have uh, just neglected or left the Quran. And Ramadan is a time where, where we should be trying to uh, spend a lot of time with the Book of Allah and so preferably uh, if you can do uh, more than one khatam that would be good there are people and I know somebody personally that uh, he did I think 26 khatam in Ramadan but that's mostly what he was doing obviously people that are working and things like that so uh, it's difficult you know to do that um, if you're not as proficient with it, you know, there's the, uh, also the listening to the muqri, if you have the tape. In other words, when you're driving, if you don't memorize a lot of Qur'an, it's better to read w- when you memorize, but when you're driving. But if you don't, then just listen to the Qur'an, the recitation, and also do some tadabbur of the Qur'an during Ramadan. In other words, don't just do the ta'abbud of it, but do some tadabbur. Um, uh, you know, if you can do, uh, there's a seven-day uh, word of the Quran which is reading. It goes three, five, seven, uh, nine, eleven, and then the mufassal. Uh, you go, you read the first three surahs, and then for the first day, the and then the, the the first three, and then the five, the next five surahs, and then the next seven and then the next uh, uh, 9, and then the 11, uh, and then uh, 13, and then the Mufassal. So in 7 days you could finish. The Mufassal is from Abasa to the end of the Qur'an, or Hujarat. Uh, and it, with the 13 I think it goes to, not Abasa, uh, Qaf. So the point is, is that that's the way a lot of Salaf did the Qur'an. They would do it by the odd 3, 5, uh, 7, 9, 11, 13, Mufassal, like that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't pray, if you are a fard, I would not pray Tarawih. You should do the fard. Use it as a time to gain all your fard back. Yeah, I would do, instead of Qiyam, do all the fard. Because the only, if you owe prayers, I mean, in Hanbar and Madhab, they don't make them up. Right, but Malik and Hanafi and Shafi'i do. If you owe prayers, then you have to, uh, the, uh, in the Malik and Madhab, you'd only do uh, Witr and the Raghiba. You'd do the Witr prayer and the, dawn, pre, the pre-dawn prayer. Other than that, you do, and you should do, according to you know, Al-Akhbari, if you do less than five at every prayer, then you're Mufarrat throughout the year. If you have prayers and you do less than five, then you're mufarrat. You, you, you're not doing enough. Less than five with every prayer? Yeah, with every prayer. And what you should do is do the minimal amount. That if you have a lot, if you don't have that many, I wouldn't do this. If you have a lot, like years, then do the minimal amount uh, for the prayer to be valid. Uh, it's a debt that you owe, you know, and, and inshallah Allah, Allah will accept the, uh-huh. I think, um, in light of what the brother was speaking of, if you're in a situation like you say, you, you uh, owe a lot of prayers, what would one do if he doesn't remember from you? Then, what the ulama says is that you should uh, do the best to estimate. In other words, if you left the prayer, say, in you remember that you were 17 or something like that. I mean, people should know around when they stop praying, hopefully. Um, it probably is a point they've started going seriously astray in their life, so that should be, most people remember when they go astray. Can you clarify what you meant by the minimum? By the minimum, in other words, what you should do is do the arkan and the basic uh, uh, sunan that are mu'akkada, right? And, um, and, and, and that's it. So there's, you know, the 16 arkan and the 8 sunnah mu'akkada and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, mm-hmm. Um, well, also, like, if you're learning fiqh and then you 
Yeah, I mean, I, that, you know, I think, you know, you just have, I know there's some people uh, that would say you should make them up, and uh, uh, I think that you just, if you're learning fiqh now, then that's something you just make tawbah and ask Allah. If, if in other words, you had a farbaim that you didn't learn, and now you're learning it, I would just, you know, ask Allah to forgive you. Some people... You know, for a lot of Muslims, they were not aware that Farbaim was in an obligation. <laughs> in other words, their parents never told them. They really didn't know. And so in a sense, I mean, this is an ifm that really is going back. Right? Because a, a Muslim, is the child is an amana. And one of the amanas that you're supposed to do is teach them the Farbaim. So I know a lot of Muslims who were not told any of these things. And they just thought they were praying right. And, and I think those people, inshallah, I would just, you know, I would say, make tawbah, just ask Allah, inshallah, to excuse you for your ignorance and, and to accept those prayers. But, I, you know, I wouldn't, uh, Allah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I think that might be, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Rahiba is the, no. Some of the ulama say you, you do the, 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 the nafida of one, at least two rakats of maghrib. You know, there's a khidaf about that. Huh? Do you know anything? About it. Uh, yeah, about the rakat after maghrib. No, no, no. To make them up if you... Not to make them up, but if you should continue doing... I think there's a khidaf, I'm not sure if it's mashhur or not, but... But definitely the witr and the rahiba should be done in spite of, of far prayers owed. Uh-huh. What do you mean? Yeah, if you have time to make up your prayers, that's what you should be doing. Ibadah should go to the fault. You know, not قرب إلي عبدي بشيء أحب إلي أو أحب إلي مما فرطت عليه. My servant doesn't. Uh, draw near to me be anything more beloved to me than the farb. So farb is over everything. You know, really. If you're doing nafida and you're all farb, you're wasting your time. Um, do you, uh, like, do you have to do your farbs in order that you miss them? Like, do you need to put over on some other than that order? Or do you do, like, five? No, if, if, they're, if they're less than five, then you should do them in order. Right? If they're more than five, then, then, uh, then you should, uh, you, you, you just do them at the time, like, uh, for instance, if you owe, uh, tartib order is obligatory if it's less than five. If it's more than that, then you don't have to do them in order. And some of the owners say if you owe a lot, then what you do is you just pick a certain amount, at least five. Uh, so you do five prayers at Dhuhr, five prayers at Asr, five prayers at uh, Maghrib, five like that. So you don't have to do them in order. Who is the best here? Yeah. Okay. And the uh, Zakhir Allah Khair. Can I go to the city for a second? Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, inshallah, a couple of, one, I want to, this, because this is the last class, um, for people that are going on the uh, intensive, Jazakumullah Khairan, and Tawfiq, inshallah, and I want to thank all of you uh, for the attendance and, and the, the respect and, and, and the, uh, just the general good spirit that's been uh, present throughout the whole uh, course. And, uh, you know, excuse me for any shortcomings or uh, any breaches of courtesy. Um, and make dua also. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. By the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we were able to go through this text to complete it and 
we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah to give us the ability to implement what, we, what we've learned and in ending this text I would like to give counsel that was written by one of our great scholars Sidi Ahmed Zarruq who died in 1492 he was a great scholar from Morocco and he died in Masarata in Libya and one of the things that he said is that the fragrance of his teaching would disseminate in the world or diffuse in the world long after his bones were laid to rest and so it's it's one of his really karamat or or uh, saintly miracles that his teaching is still affecting us and influencing us he said radiallahu ta'ala anhum no, may Allah give you and us success and rectify our worldly and other worldly lives and grant us adherence to the way of the truth in our journeys and in our sojourns that repentance is a key and taqwa is vast and uprightness is the source of rectification furthermore a servant is never free of either blunders or shortcomings or lassitude therefore never be neglectful of tawbah repentance and never turn away from the act of returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never neglect acts that bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed every time one of these three occurs repent and return every time that you make a mistake listen and obey any time you display shortcomings or show lack of enthusiasm don't desist in your efforts let your main concern be to remove from your outer state anything that is displeasing and then maintain its outward state through continuous counsel continue doing this until you find that you're fleeing from anything outwardly displeasing with second nature and that your avoidance of the boundaries of prohibited things is as if it, it is, acts like a protective net that is placed before you at this point it is time to turn inward toward your heart's presence and to its reality with both reflection and remembrance. Don't hasten the end result before you have completed the beginning, but likewise, don't begin without looking toward the end result. This is so because the one who seeks the outset at the end loses providential care, and the one who seeks the end at the outset loses pro providential guidance. Act in accordance with principles and the appropriate legal rulings, and not in accordance with stories and fantasies. Don't even consider stories of how things went with others, except as a tonic to strengthen your resolve. Certainly not as a reference based upon their outward forms or what they seem to be telling us. In all of this, depend upon a clear path you can refer to and a foundation that you can depend upon in all of your states. The best of these is the path of Ibn Atayullah, given that in it is a clear direction to Allah. Do not take care, do not take from other, others' words unless it is in accordance with your own path, but submit to their implications if you desire realization. Avoid all forms of vain and foul speech to your absolute utmost. Put aside anything that you cannot discern its benefit immediately. Beware of being extremely hard on yourself before you have obtained a mastery over it, but also beware of being too lax with it in anything that concerns sacred rulings. This is because it is constantly fleeing from moderation in everything, and it, it inclines towards ex extremism in both matters of deviance and guidance. To repeat, this is so because it is constantly fleeing from moderation in everything and it inclines towards extremism in both matters of deviance and guidance so just to stop and look this is extremely important because what the sheikh is telling us is that the nature of the self is extremism and he's telling us to be aware of this in both good deeds and in foul deeds in both obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he's telling us beware of being extremely hard on yourself before you have obtained a mastery over it, but also beware of being too lax with it in anything that concerns sacred rulings. He continues, Seek out a companion to help you out in your affairs, and take his counsel concerning matters that occur from both your inward states and your outward affairs. If you do indeed take his companionship, then treat him in a manner commensurate with his state, and give him of your counsel based upon his inabilities and abilities, because the perfected friend is no longer to be found.
Indeed, in these times, even a suitable companion who is agreeable rarely lasts. And beware of the majority of people in matters that concern your religious and your worldly states, unless you have ascertained he has some sound relationship with his Lord based upon a knowledge that is free of his caprice or love of leadership, and a sound intellect free of the pitfalls of hidden agendas. Do not be heedless of the machinations of others or their hidden states. Consider these two from both their origins and their actions. A person of character and family distinction rarely affects you with other than good. And yet a person of low origins roots usually cause him to disregard you when times get tough. Be extremely vigilant of the dominant qualities of a given people in any given land and don't be heedless of the divine wisdom in the creation and notice gatheredness and separation. Some of this we have already covered in our book al Qawaid, so take a look at it there. Organize our time in a matter appropriate to the time's specific needs using gentleness and toleration and be very wary of either harshness or laxity. This is so because too much laxity concerning permissible matters pulls the heart backward in its journey until even a man of resolve ends up looking like a foolish boy. Work for this world as if you li- will live forever, but work for your next, next life as if you die tomorrow. Thus, do not neglect the externals of your worldly needs. In the meantime, do not be heedless of your end and final resting place. Be extremely vigilant about avoiding positions of leadership. But should you be tried with such matters, at least know your own limitations. Be absolutely sincere to Allah with the sincerity of one who knows full well who is placing demands upon him. Surrender completely to his decree with the submission of one who knows he can never overcome him. Have a firm foundation for all of your affairs and you will be safe from their pitfalls. Organize your devotional practices and you will find your time is extended due to the barakah or blessings in it. Never be fanatical about anything, whether it is the truth or whether it is false, for your heart will then remain in a state of soundness towards others. Never claim anything you are entitled to, not to mention what you are not entitled to, and you will be safe from tricks and treachery. This is so because anyone who claims some rank above his own will fall in humiliation, whereas those who claim a rank they warrant will have it stripped from them, while those who claim a station less than their true rank will be elevated to even higher levels than they actually deserve. Never give your companion anything of your state other than what his own state warrants. This is so because if you go down to his level, he will show you contempt, whereas if you attempt to raise him up to your level, he will abandon you. Never demand a right from anyone, whether an intimate or a stranger. The reason for this is a stranger in reality owes you nothing, and someone close to you is too precious to direct your blame to him. Never assume that anyone in this world can really understand your circumstances other than from the perspective of of his own circumstances. This is so because in reality, everyone only sees things in accordance with their frames of reference and their personal path. However, when aims, purposes, and aspirations are similar, people tend to work together toward a common goal. Never belittle any talk that involves absent people, even if there is no harm in it, due to the possibility of harm entering into it. Guard your secrets even if you feel safe with someone, because the one you divulge your secret to is not a safer place than your own heart from whence it emanated. Never leave an atom's weight of your regular devotional practice. Never be lenient with yourself in either lax times or times of high resolve. Indeed, should you miss some of your practice in a given time, redress it in another time. If you are not able to do your usual practice, at least occupy yourself with something else similar. Never obey your ego, even for a moment nor believe any of its claims, no matter what it tells you. Be vigilant about your resolve in all of your affairs to your utmost. In fact, should you resolve to do something, then do it immediately before the resolve wanes. Examine your soul constantly in matters that you are obliged to do or are needed to be done. Anything you are in no need of doing, leave it, even if it is something that is recommended. That means not involving yourself in anything other than absolutely necessary things and real discernible needs. Treat others just as you would want to be treated and fulfill to them what what is due to them. All of this is really epitomized in the words of the poet when he said, If you desire to live such that your religion is safe and your portion is full and your honor is sound, guard your tongue and never mention another's faults, remembering you yourself has faults and others have tongues. Watch your eye. Should it ever reveal to you the faults of others, say to it, O my eye, 
other people have eyes to. Live treating others well and avoid aggression. And should others aggress against you, leave them, but in the best way. The source of these words is in fact nothing other than the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, Be vigilant of Allah wherever you are and follow a misdeed with a good deed and it will remove it. And treat others with the most excellent of character. In another he said, Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Every child of Adam makes mistakes and the best of those who make mistakes are those who seek to redress them. Again, the Holy Spirit inspired my heart's core that no soul will die until it fulfills its decreed portion of this world and its appointed time here. So be conscious of Allah and make your request with dignity. In summation, repentance, awareness of Allah, and uprightness are the foundations of all that is beneficial. The truth is clear and its details are weighty and significant. The affair belongs only to Allah. Success is, his, is in His hands. Assalamu alaikum. Peace.